And it reeks of a movie that nobody knew this was going to... Two, two grown men in, at 11 o'clock at night on a Monday <laughs> are going to be calling each other between two states to discuss this instead of, you know, being productive members of society. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first episode of Go Ape, where we're taking a look at all five of the original Planet of the Apes movies. Coincidentally, um, my guest here uh, happened to be watching the five original movies. Joining me uh, is my good friend, Oliver the Ricketts. He's been a guest on our show, Fat Man, Little Boy. Uh, Oliver, introduce yourself, Mango. Hey, Oliver the Ricketts here, internet menace, uh, societal sweetheart, um, and I, I love monkeys i my wife wants to <laughs> divorce me <laughs> because all through the month of april when we were getting kong kong x godzilla mm -hmm. and monkey man and the kingdom of the planet of the apes the whole month i'm like it is a great primate time and she's like you gotta stop talking about <laughs> monkey movies what i was doing was i was reaching out to to the normal a and p people being like hey you want to stream we can stream it we can have a movie night on discord we can watch all the old classic planet of the apes movies and none of them wanted to do it and i'm like god damn it I, I i'm gonna be forever alone with my love of the five original planet of the apes movies one showed interest in it but he said i didn't like any of the sequels and i'm like did you watch any of the sequels <laughs> did you intelligently watch any of these sequels as an adult <laughs> yeah kingdom of the planet of the apes i uh, got me into watching the i watched the original apes five what would you call that a quintrilogy yeah i guess uh, I, I don't really know i watched them in high school i don't re really remember them because it mm -hmm. was really in that era of like oh i like movies now let me watch as many movies as i can you know and they fell into that uh but kingdom like when you watch the andy circus ones it's almost like a different thing it you is. know it is in like, a good way though in a Absolutely. Good way. But even like, and I'm not even just talking about the special effects. It's just like kind of the tone and the way that those movies are separate kind of thing. Kingdom has all of that flavor, at least to me, of the Planet of the Apes sequels, like the original ones. I think that's the most interesting thing about the movie is that it, it, you could take that script and say this was uh, an original Planet of the Apes movie. The way how I, I've actually done with an old friend of mine, Bill, who did a huge three-hour chat talking about the all five of the original movies before even Rise came out. Because right. we were fans of these movies before even Rise sure, had come sure. out. And I want to say we did that chat because Rise was in the process of coming out. And I was psyched for Rise, and I still love Rise. I got into them when they turned 30 years old. They were celebrating the 30th anniversary, and AMC just would play played 24 hour marathon of all five movies on loop for 24 hours. And when I watched them, I was just old enough that I was able to comprehend that hey, these movies are saying something about us. I I fell in love with them, and I just can't get enough of them and then when it turned 40 years old which was back in 2008 i bought this amazing box set of all five of the original films and it came with this big book about the making of each movie and it came oh, that's with so cool lots of pictures of behind the scenes stills and stuff like that and like some of the test makeups on the first film were really interesting i went ape what can i say and and i was invested in it I watched the show, I watched the animated show, I watched all of it. They were the Star Wars before Star Wars. Like, in terms of the United States, these movies were fucking huge. They weren't just huge in the United States, they were huge all over the planet. My audience loves Godzilla. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, the aliens are apes because of the Planet of the Apes movies. They... What a pitch. <laughs> Franchises weren't a thing back then, really. I mean, you had your serials, but those weren't big. Those stopped being a thing in, like, the early 50s. I think you hit it on the head in two areas. One, with Star Wars, a lot of what we talk about on my channel is not just, like, movies, but, like, I love merchandise. Right. Like, I'm I'm very into, like, advertising, marketing, and, and like, weird merch that gets made. My fascination with cereal 
for mm-hmm. instance. I love shit like that. Planet of the Apes was such a huge thing for toys. Oh, Cereal yeah. box time. toys, action figures, uh, the box top things, coloring books, the masks. It had all of the things that made Star Wars such a financially viable thing. Planet of the Apes was already doing. Well, you know? that's that's interesting because they were both released by 20th 20th Century Fox. Mm-hmm. I a part of me genuinely thinks that someone at 20th Century Fox looked at what Planet of the Apes did, saw what right. Star Wars was doing and said, "We have an opportunity here." Right. We we have a science fiction thing. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of over the top characters that people also people know the names of the characters. Mm-hmm. I mean, that even in and of itself is a big deal. It wasn't like, like when you look at Star Wars, you don't go, oh, I got the Mark Hamill action figure. Luke Skywalker. That's like right. a, such a key piece to like building out a franchise. Like people know Dr. Zayas. There's, uh, there's a couple of interesting people that I don't realize are in these movies that are in these movies because they're behind all that ape max, uh, the ape makeup. One is James Whitmore. James Whitmore, if you don't know who he is, plays Brooks on the Shawshank Redemption. Oh. <laughs> and he plays the head judge on that tribunal. <laughs> How many random people from Hollywood history like show up in these movies? Because there's also... um. John Goodman's character in Argo being one of the instrumental forces and in even this thing mm-hmm. existing. Mm-hmm. There's so much history that you can go back in and just like kind of like poke at it and be like, who is he and how did he wind up here? Without Planet of the Apes, we wouldn't have the Academy Award for Best Makeup. Sure. The, the Academy Award for Best Makeup was made because of this film completely 100% deserved. Yeah, it's dated. You can tell that they're, they're, they're a little too stiff Mm-hmm. And it's it's clearly rubber, but back in the day, holy shit! Because this came out the same year as two thousand one, A Space Odyssey, and those are men in ape suits too at the opening of right. of that film. And everyone praises the apes because they say that they don't look like apes. And I say, or they praise the apes in two thousand one because they look good and they do look fantastic. But where I think the John Chambers apes ape makeup for the Planet of the mm-hmm. Apes movies way outdoes what Stanley Kubrick was doing was that these guys had to talk. They had to act. Yeah. They had to emote. They had to do everything. They had to look and articulate themselves. The filmmakers always knew that you needed to have a good, competent actor behind that makeup. What happens, particularly with Roddy McDowell, because he becomes kind of the face, quote unquote, of the ape series right. as it goes along. You got these actors that as you're watching them act, you forget that they're men in ape suits. So that was going to be my my biggest point about going back to these mm-hmm. this time is because I'll watch a bad movie like and get all of the joy in the world out of it. I shouldn't say a bad movie, a dated movie. So to me, when you hear like men in ape suits, I go, oh, I'll have a fucking blast with that. As you're watching it, you're not watching these movies like you would watch a B movie of this era. Like the second that you let yourself forget that it's a movie, you know, 10 minutes ish in. Right. It's not apparent that those are rubber masks. Like it is in my practical brain, but how willing I am to let that go. And a lot of it is because of the way that the actors are emoting with their eyes. Yes. You're yes. looking at a, a human esque face still. And I think that that really helps in this case. It's actually a really big tour de force for acting, acting through all that makeup, mm-hmm. But also for a makeup artist to be able to complement the actor's like facial strengths like that. Well, what th- th- what they had to do, according to Kim Hunter, who played Zira, what they would have to do behind the makeup to make it shine through the makeup, because they've got pounds of makeup on them, mm-hmm. is they would have to constantly over-exaggerate their facial movements all the time. Yeah. So, so they would always, like if they smiled, they couldn't just do like a little grin like that. They'd have to like really draw their facial expression to make it look normal with the makeup itself and something that the actors also discovered is that if they stay still for too long it really looks like a rubber a rubber mask so they would suddenly create these little ticks or like little excuses to like blink 
or or kind of scrunch their nose or something like that. Like I love how in in the first film, Roddy McDowell's character Cornelius, he does this nose scrunching thing whenever he's perplexed about something, <laughs> and that was because it tries he he worked with the character, he worked with what he had, realized that this is something good to make it feel more lifelike. I also think like watching it in today's lens, something that we are missing terribly in the mm-hmm. movie landscape right now is people who can actually do physic not just physical comedy but like physical acting i have a few examples but the only actor in a non-comedic role that i can think like can manipulate their body like that is joaquin phoenix uh, where like gonna... in in no. bo is afraid Mm-hmm. there's this scene where like his mother is dressing him down and you know like consciously I'm looking at a at a 50 something man but the way he's standing and he moves his body is like no that's a child you probably couldn't do this with today's crop of actors because even in the Andy Serkis movies where like Andy <laughs> Serkis is certainly a great physical act as Caesar I personally think he should have gotten at least a nomination the surrounding cast, like, if we didn't have that CGI enhancement, I don't think anything about those performances make them, like, feel like they're a monkey. Right. And in these movies, they are contorting and moving. If you look at a monkey at the zoo, it doesn't sit still. These movies, to, to kind of go on, because right now we're just kind of talking about them broadly. These movies, to me, is what sci-fi should be. It's everything sure. science fiction should be. It's a fun adventure movie that stands on its own two feet first and foremost as a as a movie about talking monkeys but it's also a very clever reflection of who we are as human beings all good science fiction has one of two things uh which is either it had and this has both this could you know plausibly this could happen You know, like maybe not with monkeys, but there could be something that comes along where we wipe ourselves out because of hubris and something else takes over the planet. I think that's the ultimate fear with evolution, right? Mm -hmm. There's also this thing in science fiction where a lot of really great science fiction goes, okay, one outlandish step, one thing that, you know, is, is a stretch for your mind. But please take that leap with me because everything else that we do is going to be very logical after that, where if this happened, this, this, and this. So for apes, the one giant step is, hey, the monkeys take over. But everything after that, it's like, yeah, that's exactly how that would play out. I'm very happy that you enjoyed these movies too, because I've always felt kind of alone when it comes to, when it came to, not so much the first film, which I can say is objectively right. the best one. But I've always felt alone because I genuinely adore the next four movies, and particularly the next three. And, and I watch them and I go, no, I think these are good movies. But everyone's like, no, they're just cheapy sequels, which they are. They're cheapy sequels done to the highest possible caliber where people gave a fuck about the movie that they were making, despite all the limitations. And I love and that's them. sometimes where you get the best creativity too. This is like a huge lesson in filmmaking, though. Cheap and good are not mutually exclusive. Yes, it's something that Hollywood really needs to relearn right now. Yes, expensive and good are most certainly not mutually exclusive. Godzilla minus one kind of really exposed to everybody the problem with Hollywood. It was the quick one-two punch because what did we have before Godzilla minus one was a summer of 250 million to $300 million blockbusters, all of which tank. But when you take it to apes and not to like expand out of the first movie, but, but you think about this is a franchise that like takes creative turns like happily with every single movie. Well, every film had big budgetary restrictions. The first one had the largest budget of them all, by Mm. far. Had, like, leaps and bounds the highest budget, which makes sense. It was the first movie was going to be the only one. Uh, Mm. But some some of the decisions that they made for, like, the first movie were completely budgetary. Like, if you read Pierre Boulle's book, Le Planet de Siege, The Mm. Ape Planet. Monkey Planet, I believe. Yeah, The Monkey Planet, yeah. If you read his book, the ape civilization is rather advanced. It's even more advanced than we are. 
but f- from budgetary for budgetary reasons they decided to make the ape civilization kind of like they're from the bronze age and i think that was a genius decision visually because it sure. makes them look more alien and i'm like that's just one one example of all these well, it's budgetary... also monkey on a horse with a gun i mean how could you get i know better than how that? can how can you get better than that you can't <laughs> without going into any spoilers what Oliver, are your overall impressions of this film? This one I've seen a few times. I watched it. I, I have a bigger TV than I've ever owned in my life right now. I mm-hmm. have my sound system is like finally where like I kind of want it to be. I have my LED lights going. And it was one of those like I actually turned my phone off watching this movie. It was just like I'm just going to live as if it is the 60s. And I'm going to watch <laughs> this movie as if it's the only thing that I have. And you know what? Despite having seen it multiple times in my life, perhaps I'm in the clearest headspace that I've ever been in right now. Do you know that this movie still has twists in it? Even if you know the big one that happens at the end? And another big thing that I like about it is that this movie is so mean. <laughs> It's it, it's it, like all of them are mean, but yeah. <laughs> the, well, even before we get to the monkey planet, let's conceptually talk about that spaceship. How many women are in that spaceship? One. One? Mm-hmm. What's the goal? Repopulate with one woman? What is that? An evolutionary contest? Is that what it's supposed to be? Yeah. Yeah. And and we keep going and it's like this movie is barbaric, like with with the hunting of the humans, the cages, the dissecting the people. And you think about it, it's like today this would be categorized if you did it in today's lens. This would be pretty advanced horror, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, And I love that about it. This is such a cool movie. I love really nasty fantasy science fiction. Bold claim, the 60s class 1963. The 1963 classic Planet of the Apes is, in fact, a good movie. I'll be the one to say it. 1968, sorry. 1968. Uh, 1968. The messaging behind the movie, like the message of the film and some of the themes mm-hmm. within it, I think are dated. Like the whole nuclear sure. war thing, even though now it's coming back. But uh, the, the nuclear war thing is definitely a very 60s, early 70s mentality. The whole McCarthy McCarthy trials and McCarthyism that really screwed over a lot of people in Hollywood, in the United States in general, blacklisted tons of people. That stuff is kind of, I think, goes over a lot of people's heads today because they don't really know anything about it. But back then, it was huge. It was a big, right. it was a big deal. People would have picked up on it. Uh, that, sure, but that's why, again, why I think this movie works. You don't need to know any of that. From beginning to end, it's a wonderful adventure. And you're constantly wanting to know what's going to happen next. Even if you know the twist ending, you're still going to enjoy these characters. You're still going to enjoy Taylor trying to get out of this horrible situation. And I think a lot of that comes down to the acting. The The writing is very simple. Uh, this is written by... Uh, the first few drafts of this was written by uh, by Rod Serling, and it shows... Uh, and oh, so that was going to be my other point is how how Twilight Zone this feels. Yes. And especially I was doing a little research myself on how late in the game that ending came in in the creative process. And can you picture the movie without that? Rod Serling came up with the ending. He came up with the twist. However, his script, which has now been turned into a graphic novel, and it's a fascinating read. A very different movie, but it still kind of feels the same because it has the same basic structure, but followed the book a little bit closer in terms of it was an advanced ape civilization. What happened was Rod Serling had to move on because this movie was kind of in production hell. So they brought out another writer named Michael Wilson. And Michael Wilson is the one that added the social commentary, more of the social commentary into the movie outside of the nuclear holocaust and the twist. Michael Wilson is the one that said, no, we're going to talk about McCarthyism. We're going to talk about the, uh, the racial and class systems that are going on and the, the class struggle. Very liberal 
class struggle mm. struggles that are going on there you know the differences between the apes the orangutans and the chimps how they're they're clearly different classes within this within this uh, one of my favorite lines taylor goes some apes are created more equal than others uh, it's one of my favorite lines of the of the entire franchise michael wilson and the reason why that happened and why he added this into this movie was because he was blacklisted because of the M mccarthy era he couldn't make movies because he refused to name names on the McCarthy trials because they were trying to find communists. And if right. you refused to say somebody's name, they just labeled you as a communist and suddenly you couldn't work anymore because nobody wanted to hire a communist in fear of being thrown on a McCarthy uh, into, into a McCarthy trial and becoming blacklisted themselves. And so well, doesn't that make this... A, a great example of like social change in and of itself that this guy yes. even gets this job because Michael Wilson wrote, also worked on, I believe the movie version of bridge on the river Kwai. He won an Academy award for the screenplay of that movie, but he couldn't win the award because wow. he had to use a pseudonym for the movie. In fact, if you watch the film, the only person to get credit in terms of the writing on Bridge on the River Kwai is Pierre Boulle. And Pierre Boulle had nothing to do with the movie. This film feels like he took Rod Serling's basic structure and then put his frustrations into the movie. Because you can't talk about any of this stuff if we're using real life. Suddenly make it science fiction instead of it being us, you know, you know what? Make it an alien, or in this take case, all make the it an savage ape. things, all the savage things that we do. Let's make them monkeys. Let's yes. see how we do with that. Let's see how we do it, and, and and it's so brilliantly done because even the fact that they chose monkeys is in of itself a racial aspect of the movie that really comes up later in Conquest. Well, that's something we can talk and, about in Conquest, for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. It holds a mirror to ourselves and asks us, "All right, how are we better?" The whole McCarthyism thing and stuff like that. Kim Hunter, the the woman who plays Zira, um, she was blacklisted too, and she picked up on what the script was doing, and you can tell it was personal for her because sure. it, you just see it in her performance. Her green, those bright green eyes that she has, is is perfect, and and the way how she touches Taylor's hand at one time, you know, after after he's been told that he can't talk at his own fucking trial. You know, and 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 the little tiny moments of 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 uh, affection throughout this throughout what would otherwise be an unbelievably cold, dark movie. One reason why Charlton Heston was so attracted to the movie was one he it one it he got to wear nothing but a loincloth and kind of show off <laughs> because he was the big leading man. Uh, and he's jacked as hell. Yeah, I mean he's he's got a dad bod. Don't get me wrong, but like it's a solid dad bod. Nah, dude, <laughs> you know? That's a good looking guy. He. It had a personal stake in that because he was one of the bit one of the guys that marched rather vocally with literally marched with him Martin Luther King Jr. He was one of the guys that marched with wow. him, and so he picked up on a lot of that stuff and and he also brought star power to it because Charlton Heston is so mesmerizing in this and in my opinion this is the best damn performance is he gives in his career is in this movie because of all he has to do and, and the range that he has to get. It, it is funny to think about Heston too, because th this is what movie is Charlton Heston in? Most people say apes. Yes. Like off the, off yes. the bat apes. And yeah. the guy's in so many damn movies, but yeah. <laughs> this is, this is the fun one. Yeah. Everybody, everybody can talk. Snobs will talk to you about the 10 commandments, Ben Hur and, and touch of bah. evil with Orson Welles and stuff like that, but everybody knows Charlton Heston because of the apes. Now, and that being said, I do love Ben-Hur, but... I do too. I do too. I love Ben-Hur. The last thing that I want to comment on before we get into spoilers is I actually want to compliment the unbelievably atmospheric score by Jerry Goldsmith in this Yes! Because it is a weird score. It is a weird score. And if you listen to it on its own, it's one of the most weirdest experiences you can have listening to to a score. But in the context of the movie, it works beautifully at selling that this is an alien planet. Because it's a I, little bit off-putting. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was using like pots and pans for a lot of the soundtrack and stuff like that. He used a lot of polyrhythms and stuff like that just to make you off-set. Franklin J. Schaffner... Uh, he was an up-and-coming director, had worked with Charlton Heston 
once before in a movie called The Warlord, which is a very good movie. And uh, Franklin J. Schaffner, who directed this film, would go on to direct uh, Patton, uh, Papillon with Steve oh, McQueen. Oh, this is your guy then. He also directed uh, uh, Nicholas and Alexandra, which is about the fall of the Romanovs. He also directed uh, a movie with Gregory Peck called The Boys from Brazil, which is about a guy trying to clone Hitler. Uh, which it was, it, it, it sounds stupid. It's, I'm, it, it, I'm adding it that sounds, to the list. It sounds stupid, Oliver, but I'm telling you, it's a really good movie. <laughs> Very competent director. He had a good action eye when it came to this movie. It also was shot by a guy named Leon Shamroy. Leon Shamroy was like a huge 20th Century Fox cinematographer, shot Cleopatra. Uh, he, he shot the original The King and I. Uh, he shot The Robe. He shot all of these big, giant A-list movies, mm. and he also made Planet of the Apes, and that's where I knew him for was Planet of the Apes. And uh, it's it's like it, it's not like they didn't have talent behind this, you know. It, it's definitely out of all all of the Planet of the Apes movies, the first one is definitely the one where they put the most effort into in terms of well, talent and and money. It also shows like how in in the business of movie making like you don't know what's the one that's going to stick well you know? well th that's very important because in at the time 20th century fox was in bad financial shape and they right. needed a hit that's why the fan the franchise became what it was was because fi because financially 20th century fox was in really r rough shape suddenly they they make this movie and it's a huge gargantuan win hit listen to all these people who've done all these you know incredible movies amazing things but it doesn't change that we know Heston from Apes. From Apes, it, yeah. You know, it, it's... How could you in a million years be like, yeah, the one about the monkeys taking over the planet, that's the movie. That's the one. There's mm -hmm. no way to predict that. And it's so funny, like, how often you hear people in Hollywood um, talk about, like, well, I didn't know this was going to be iconic when I was doing it. And it reeks of a movie that nobody knew this was going to two two grown men in at eleven o'clock at night on a Monday mm -hmm. <laughs> are gonna be calling each other between two states to discuss this instead of, you know, being productive members of society. That's actually the most accurate description of what we are and what we do right there. <laughs> um I say spoilers going ahead. I haven't read the book, but I, I have it now, and I'm I plan on reading the book cool word um, monkey planet which by but, the way is my favorite title of any intelligent piece of so literature good. out there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i love the concept that the author going back to like you never know which one's gonna hit it's a joke isn't it like it, this yes. was not written to be a, a classic he wrote this as a yeah this one this is he, an american fiction kind of situation well, uh, when he wrote the book because he was getting very sick of how apathetic people were and he was, and he, it was kind of a joke in that sense, where it's like humans became so apathetic, the apes were able to conquer us, uh, and that was kind of the joke of the of the book. But it was kind of like an off the cuff book. It's not like it. His big thing was Bridge on the River Kwai. I mean, this guy was a World right. War Two veteran. I mean, he he just wrote the science fiction book that somebody Arthur P. Jacobs read, loved, and said this would make a good movie. In the book and in Rod Serling's original script, as we mentioned before, they are an advanced civilization. Budgetary reasons made them more like they're from the Bronze Age, which I, I have not read Rod Serling's graphic novel of his script either. And I really want to because it looks really fascinating. But as we mentioned earlier, and we're going to get into it a little bit more here, this feels like a long extended episode of The Twilight Zone, but not boring. The episode of The Twilight Zone that feels an awful lot like the planet of the apes film is i shot an arrow into the air and it's it fits right into the planet of the apes mold but minus the apes and that is a a spaceship is launched into space uh they think they land on an alien planet they then try to they start killing each other because of they're getting very paranoid and for survival and stuff like that only for the lone survivor who was the nastiest of them all to discover hey they were on earth the entire time they never left that's that episode and i'm like that is planet of the apes the first act of this movie which i think goes up to the hunt and reveal of the apes feels like a completely different movie 
than the next two acts and insanity that followed. It's so slow. It's so oh, yeah. meandering. Very purposefully f- so. On my religious experience watch, that's exactly kind of how I felt. Because the first beginning, you're just... It's not like I'm dozing off, but it is kind of like, all right, I'm kind of like watching water boil right now. Something's going to happen. You know, the bubbles are going to come and I'm going to be very into the bubbles. Uh, but right now, we're just waiting, you know? Yes. And in that way, I almost think that it helps that today we know the end of this movie before we go in. Knowing what is coming... I'm already looking for this being Earth off the Mm get-go. And that, in a way, on rewatch has made it more entertaining for me, at the very least, that there are things of like, let me see if I can piece together that little twist at the end there. And Apes is interesting, too, because even though I know the twist going in, you don't know who knows that information, that man owned the planet first. And that creates a lot of very interesting turns of events and things not being the way that they seem even knowing that earth well is earth. i think i think the scene that the scene when they're in the cave at towards the end of the movie and they find the human doll and nova's playing with the doll and suddenly the doll goes mama i get chills watching that yeah. i get chills watching that it's just so effective of 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 selling that we were here. Man was here first and he was better than you was what Charlton Heston says or Taylor Taylor says the fact that, you know, Heston gets shot in the throat so he can't talk. And, and his first line, take your stinking paws off me. You're damn dirty ape, a total classic in every way, shape and form. But in the context of the movie, it's fantastic. And you see the reaction of the apes. Cause this is the first time they've heard a man talk. Men aren't supposed to, humans aren't supposed to talk. And it completely rocks the foundation of ape society. And I love that because after that moment, after that moment, it is literally Dr. Zayas and the others trying to pick up the pieces and just trying to keep a crumbling society from completely crumbling apart because of what just happened. And Zayas specifically, because that turn of events that, that Zayas was aware that man, man talks, this guy's not from outer space. Yeah. I knew this was going to happen eventually. I mean, you're guessing what Zayas is up to the entire time and what what's the deal. But the revelation of, no, he, he is silencing the truth makes this an incredible movie. Zayas, and again, yeah. f- feeds into all of the themes of communism and blackballing and blacklisting. You know, we're, we're silencing the truth to, to keep our narrative going and our way of life happening. You know. Well, the minister of faith is also the minister of science kind of thing. I really want to talk about Charlton Heston as Taylor because mm-hmm. Taylor is a horrible human being. He is a an un- In every he's, way. he is a prick. He is an asshole. He is unbelievably selfish. And I love the fact that we are forced to root for him because he is the only person left kind of deal. He is exactly the kind of guy that would go on a spaceship that would take you away from your planet to never return. Well, I love how he, twice about that. he just berates the other astronaut there, Landon. Just berates him because Landon has all these glorified, you know, visions of the future and he's very idealistic. Well, Trouton Heston is not. He says he says a wonderful line in the movie where he says, uh, Oh yeah, there was lots of love there was Lots of love. There was lots of love making, but there was no love. And and he's just so bitter through for humanity. And and the opening monologue sets his entire character up. I'm out here because I have to believe that somewhere out there is something better than man. Right. And what happens? <laughs> Just more of the same shit, but with monkeys. And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, God. And so now he becomes the spokesperson of humanity, the spokesperson of what humanity can be or and stuff like that. And I'm like, I love that. I love that. This completely embittered man has to now be the face and voice of humanity. I In love a way, that. he must be the biggest optimist <laughs> in the history of time 
his survival and the survival of his kind literally depends on it. Yes. He finds Landon and I'm like, nothing's good going to come from this. But he finds Landon and he just turns him around. He's got the cut on his head. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, God. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. It's so good. It, this upside. How did this upside down civilization get started? Is what is what he says. Well, the scene where he finds Landon like is still such a little jump. Like even knowing like because watching it through, like yeah, Taylor's the only guy like that that lives. So like something happens to Landon here. The shock of seeing what happens to Landon is just as effective now in 2024 as it was in 68. There is a book, uh, by the way. There is the there is a plan of the Apes book that goes over Landon's side of the story, mm -hmm. um, because Doctor Zayas knows all about Landon. He's probably had the same conversation with Landon that he's had with Charlton Heston. Almost and, certainly, yeah. If they did an operation on the guy. Yeah, and and I'm like, that's horrifying in of itself. I love all the implications that 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 one shot has for the remainder part, the remaining part of the movie. Because it's, it's instantly, this is even more sinister than just nature taking its course. There is some some advantage to the apes is afoot here. Right. More than you believe at that point. I love how Zayas is constantly dehumanizing, for lack of a better term, de dehumanizing uh, Taylor, except for that one scene where the two of them just talk alone. Mm. And he calls Taylor, Taylor. And that was a mistake. After that, Zayas is constantly having to backtrack. And I just love that part where, where Charlton Hesse goes, thank you for calling me Taylor. Right. Because it's like he hasn't heard his name for so long. Because Zira calls him Bright Eyes and I think continues he's to call him. He's an animal. Yeah, he's an he's not. Yeah, he's not one of us. He's an animal. You know, he it, we treat them. And that's some of the horror of it is that we treat him like we treat. And Which, like I, that whole the whole idea that he that. And, she, and and what I love about this, and it kind of goes into Zira a little bit, is that Zira is not meaning to be creepy or or scary at all. Mm -hmm. But when she gives Charlton Heston a mate to breed with, yeah, Nova, and she's not being, it's it's no different than like what we do with dogs. What what she in was doing her mind, with Heston. it's an animal. And this is what we do with animals. We research mm -hmm. them. We we study their behavior. Zira is simultaneously one of the scariest characters in the movie and the sweetest character in the movie. Well, I think she's scary in the fact that we know what she does. Which she, she's she's a... scary as a product of what this society is and can be and what does a good person look like in this society. Well, she doesn't do, she doesn't do anything that we don't, you know, she doesn't do sure. anything like a lot of scientists do. We do tests on rats and stuff like that for the, re for one very specific, one very specific reason. So it doesn't hurt us. She's definitely one of the good guys because I love the moment where where uh, Taylor writes down on the paper, right? She scares, she, he scares her half to death by grabbing her mm. because no one's listening to him. And he writes down quickly on the note, my name is Taylor. And the moment she sees that, and I love her, re her facial expression, the moment she sees that and looks up at him, give me a collar and leash. I'm taking this one with me something's off and and yep. she's because she becomes fascinating and the moment that taylor starts being able to write and they actually start communicating she stops looking at him like an animal and she puts when when charlton heston is getting really angry at cornelius because cornelius thinks it's all just a stunt it's just an act i mean rightfully so she all of a sudden she just reaches out and touches taylor's hand and it's such a minor thing but it's enough to kind of calm taylor down and i'm like oh right. God, this is good. This is good. <laughs> Can we also talk about a, a difference in how, if you made this same movie today, I don't think that that plays as well because it wouldn't be allowed to be quiet. No. It's, there's something <laughs> in the silence of that scene where it's like, oh, that works. You know? But it's also like, that's just kind of how movies used to be paced. Now, God forbid you should have a scene in a science fiction movie that doesn't have music blaring over it in some way. Well, that would have a slow piano on it 100% right now. There's, and it yes. would lose a lot of what it is. 
there's there's such a great part too. Like Zira looks up at Taylor and she says, "You wouldn't hurt me, would you, Taylor?" And she says his name. Yeah. And he smiles, and I'm like, "Oh, so good." And there's what I. The Planet of the Apes movies, the original five, have a lot of moments where there's no music at all. It's just mm. the ambience of what's happening, and that adds to the atmosphere of the whole thing. But the first one has a, a lot, and that that scene is one of them. I think I'm gonna i I don't have anything on Nova written down because I think what happens in the next movie is it, we need to talk about Nova a lot more. But I just love those scenes where Charlton Heston is just talking to her. And uh, there's right. something so human about that, that it's like she doesn't understand a word he's saying. Well, but, and, but, but he sees the resemblance of a human being in there. Well, you she understands. I mean? She's sees... empathetic. She she under, she, I, she doesn't understand what Charlton Heston is saying, but she understands the emotion. Right. And that's what I love about it, the empathy, which is something that is very important in, in, in these movies is the lack of it. I love the fact that after they get split up, right, and she gets thrown into another another uh, cage, when he's getting dragged away, suddenly she grabs the bars and starts shaking them, like almost like she's trying to, she wants to know where they're taking him. Because now she she may not understand what's going on, but she understands that he's not going to hurt her. And I love all I love that. You see, that's what like the remake is completely lacking. It's is is stuff like that. And the remake is lacking the the whole idea of like primitive humans yes. period at, yeah. at this stage, which is a very important part of what made this world work. Because you want to see the self insert, you want to see where we are at. I mean, the thing with Nova too, it's like presumably that is how cavemen communicated with each other, just kind of off vibes. You know what I mean? Right. And, well, language you developed had to know, from that. Yeah. Right. Survival dictated, that guy's not going to hurt me because I feel the same things that that thing feels. And I feel in the same patterns that that thing feels. So it's very interesting, actually, to have a post-civilization human talking to what is basically a caveman. I do think it would go like that. Well, it's not, it, you could take that one step further because and this kind of gets into our sort of transition over to Zaius. The world of the apes is unbelievably fascinating in terms of ape city, the, the, the dynamics within ape city of itself. You know, you have the chimps that are middle class and they are the scientists. They are the doctors and stuff like that. They are the most relatable of all of the, they're the most human, quote unquote, out of all the apes. Then you have the orangutans, mm -hmm. who is the bureaucracy and hierarchy. Uh, and then you have the gorillas, which are the lower class, and they are the workers, they are the army. They are the grunts, which is ironic that they're, that they're portrayed as the least human out of all of them, because ironically, gorillas are the most gentle of the great apes, and chimps are the most violent, which ironically, the Japanese knock off a planet of the apes time of the apes actually gets that right the chimps are the army uh, in in that <laughs> the japanese version of planet of the apes is called what time of the apes oh time i thought you said town of the apes i'm like no. oh they really shrunk it they downsized them <laughs> it's fascinating because there's one line that just gets thrown out there and Apparently, relatively recently within this universe, we or within within Ape City, they had abolished quote abolished the old class system, but clearly they haven't. And that alone is just one line of dialogue that just sets the tone for everything. And there's a lot of that in this in 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 these movies. It's just they'll just drop one line, and it'll be like, oh, this kind of sets up what this society society kind of looks at and and like one one character that zero talks to really early on has a really funny line um you promised me you would speak to dr zayas for me and then zero goes well you know how much they look down on chimpanzees when it comes to people right we all kind of like to group together with our own kind anyways it, to me it's just sure. human nature that white people like would probably accumulate more towards other white people uh, right. you, you, that kind of deal. Well, it's an unfortunate the movie, part of, of our nature well, that the is interesting, then reflected in them. The interesting thing, Oliver, is that ironically, it kind of got proven correct in the making of this movie. Apparently, during like lunch 
every day and stuff like that. It just sort of naturally happened that people wearing the orangutan makeup would hang out with the other orangutans. Oh, people that who were is wearing, fascinating. That is fascinating. People who were wearing gorilla makeup would hang out with other gorillas. The humans would all hang out. And the people who were wearing chimp makeup all hang out. They just all accumulated together. And I'm like, we're literally seeing one of the elements of this movie playing out in real life right here. It's it real recognizes real, man. Well, it all that is be... fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And and <laughs> according to the director, it kind of freaked him out because they didn't they didn't they didn't do anything. They didn't have any signs up saying that you had to be kind of segregated in terms of that. We just kind of naturally segregated ourselves. But all of that kind of plays into Dr. Zayas and what Dr. Zayas is. Because Dr. Zayas, in many ways, first off, one of the greatest villains ever written, ever. Absolutely. He's Absolutely. so evil, and yet he you understand him. That's I, what I love about a good villain, is a good villain does horrible shit, and you understand why he's doing horrible shit, because and, he's and not completely brain, wrong. They're justified. Right. You know, at least in his own opinion of himself. He's justified because he knows the secrets to the apes. He knows that the apes secretly learned everything, including their language by mimicking humans. If we continue to mimic humans, we might go down the same path as humanity. So here's the cutoff bronze age. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's stifling technology, stifling innovation, I mean, uh, Cornelius, he was an archaeologist. He was the one that discovered that cave. And the moment he discovered that cave, suddenly everything was revoked and he couldn't go back out there. Anytime Zira tries to do something, it is Zayas who shuts him down. And Zira and, is a person of science, too. Yes, and of progress yes. and pushing them forward. And Zayas is actively inhibiting that from happening. Well, Zayas has a, has a, a wonderful line where, where he's confronting Zira. There is no difference between faith and science. Real science, that is. In other words, his science. The truth The truth absolutely doesn't matter. And it's clearly him pulling all the strings. It makes me wonder what the actual government of the apes is actually like and how it's structured. <laughs> because he's clearly a bureaucrat, right? You know, he's not, oh, like, a, sure. a, he's not like a general. He's just no. A he's a he's a political figure in in Monkey World, right? And and uh, played wonderfully by Maurice Evans, uh, and he truly is terrifying. And you don't realize how terrifying he is until the scene with Landon. That's immediately where you realize that things are are not only not only do the apes have the upper hand and have run of the world, but the apes are sinister. Like, they, they will go out of their way to impede the truth from coming out. Well, at least um, at least this group of people will, or these, these group of apes will. And correct. I love Charlton Heston. After he gets dragged back into the, the, the courtroom, he says, you did that to him, damn you. You cut out his brain, you cut out his identity, and that's what you want to do to me. First off, Charlton Heston, amazing performance there. The way how angry yeah. he is and scared that uh, uh, in all in one. So the the Charlton Heston performance in that scene specifically, it like it does make me a little sad about like the state of science fiction and genre films now. And a lot of it is the product that's being put out there, but there is a notion right now because so much of blockbuster cinema is that stuff. That being in a Marvel movie or a Star Wars thing, and I agree to an extent, it's like jury duty for actors, right? Right. And we're we're almost going backwards in this idea that, like, for a minute it was very cool to be in genre fair, and now we've moved away from that again, where yeah. it's almost a little embarrassing for a lot of people. And Heston is in the original phase of, like, it is embarrassing to be in a science fiction fantasy thing. But he's full sending it here. Well, he and wanted to be in this movie. He he did. He actively wanted to be in this movie, and it shows. It's the next film he did not want to be in, and... which, which is another thing all, entirely. Yes, but it's it's so cool to see him at that time, full sending it to be in something that that could have been silly. You know what well, I mean? Well, it's it's so interesting too because again, Charlton Heston, such a sex symbol of the day. He said this was his first nude scene was in this film was in that scene in the in the trial scene 
And the fact that here's the sex symbol, this larger than life guy reduced to being like this animal. His rags give off a stench and they, they strip him. And I love how he just sort of meekly, he looks so defenseless because he is in, right. in that. And, and it's so effective. And I love I love Zaius in all of those sequences too, because Zaius is he knows exactly what the hell's going on. He's putting up a front, and right from the get go, you can tell he's suspicious of Taylor. And we you discover he is suspicious of Taylor because of Landon. You know you know the scene where Taylor is is writing, um he writes on the ground right. He's in that giant cage, and he writes mm -hmm. my name is Taylor on the ground, or I can talk. Yep on the ground and Zaius crosses it out. But the reason why <laughs> Zaius is there is because he, you, you, you can infer. He's he just already been talked, through this with Taylor. He, yeah. He, or he's with done it with Landon, Landon. Excuse me. Yeah. He's yep. going through the same exact thing with Landon. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is genius. <laughs> and that's something you don't pick up immediately. That's something you start seeing with multiple viewings and in, in, in how this movie holds up so well with multiple viewings as well. That final monologue he has with Taylor, that discussion he has with Taylor after uh, Zayas is tied up, right? And tied to a post and everything. Yes, I've always known about man. Beware the beast man, for he is the devil's pawn. Uh, he, and then it concludes with, he will make a desert of his home and yours and you discover that that's quite literally what happened and and what is the famous shot of the statue of liberty it's buried in the desert yes in dust and sand like even if you know the twist i'm like that shit is so as martin scorsese would say that is that is pure cinema, cinema. Um. <laughs> it's something that's like permeated pop culture so much that ending that like i think sometimes we forget how powerful of an image that is but yeah. i think the coolest like little reminder out there like that's in pop culture is there's an episode of mad men where don draper takes his son to the movies but the kid is you don't see what movie they're watching but the kid just goes so they were on earth and he's like yes but they traveled back in time or like he, he says but they traveled forward in time right and the kid is like they have it in the show. The kid is digesting this information in 1968. And it's just like, it kind of pans in on the kid and he goes, wow, how cool that must've been to take that for the first time, not knowing what was coming and how profound it is even still because well, while apparently we forget, well, to, to watching, a, according to the premiere, people who made the premiere, who who were you know the test audiences and everything, the audience very visibly gasped during yeah. the during the ending, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it is it is unbelievable and haunting too. The fact that that is the last image too. Well, well, you have Zayas right, who is very cold, very calculating, very evil in our mind but good in his mind which makes it for a good villain in my humble opinion mm. uh and it's not like he hates zira and cornelius either that's what, another thing that i like about this as well it's right. just he's thinking about what what am i going to do to preserve my culture and everything along those lines which again goes into mccarthyism that's zayas whole mentality he is mccarthyism actually because the whole thing with mccarthyism is that communists are going to infiltrate infiltrate the united states and destroy our way of life and our faith as we know it that's zayas the antithesis to zayas is cornelius and zira they Who are, are people of progress in, in science right I think one one thing that immediately sets them apart right from the get go is I love how they are husband and wife. The chemistry between Rodney McDowell and Kim Hunter is fantastic. And the fact that you can get that chemistry underneath literally pounds of makeup <laughs> covering their face. Well, it's it's fantastic <laughs> enough that it actually carries this franchise beyond its star. Well, I love know? I love the um it it totally does. You're right. But I love this little moment to show just how much they understood their characters. The first scene where you meet Cornelius is she's all excited. She runs up to Cornelius, shouting him over and says, you've got to see Bright Eyes, uh, Taylor. Mm -hmm. And she's like pulling him along. And all of a sudden he pulls her back towards him. 
And she knows what he's going to do. They both just kind of like look around to make sure nobody's looking. And then they kiss. And then they keep going. It's and unbelievably like, sweet. It's so sweet and human. And I'm like, oh, this is this is good. It makes you care about them. It Absolutely. really makes you give a shit about them. And there's tons of little moments like that. Like after uh, the, the, the big, the trial scene, they get charged with heresy. They just sit there in stunned silence. And Cornelius is just looks devastated. What I love about that is that you don't know what that entails. You just know it's really bad. It's, it's not good. And then Zira just looks at him. And what she, just like what she did with Taylor... She puts her hand on his and then he grabs it and they just look at each other. And I love that shit. It's it's actual something that we don't see in a lot of movies, mm-hmm. I, in my opinion, ever is real intimacy that that feels yes. not sexy. It feels intimate. It's just so simple because they are like the only apes throughout the movie that right. actually feel they have empathy they have they are sympathetic they aren't just holding up the status quo well they aren't government stooges either and i love the little bit of of how how cornelius is is scared a little bit scared for his career which is a very relatable thing mm-hmm. because of his expeditions out into the forbidden zone i just love the fact that he is so concerned for his career we're both going to be in trouble. We're, it's going to affect both our careers. Do you want me to get my head chopped off? Is one of his lines. I love the fact that he stays with Zira throughout all of this. He doesn't need to be there during the trial. No. He doesn't need to be there at all. Zira does. He's a good husband. Yes. He loves her. And she clearly loves him. Intimacy on screen, the level of... And I actually just talked about this point in a, in a video that I did for Designing Hollywood mm. um, where we were talking about the birdcage and um, Nathan Lane and Robin Williams. And Robin in that Williams. Movie and how uh, fucking real they feel. Yes. And it, it's exactly what I was talking about there where it's like, this is not flashy or showy. And even though these characters are like, they're larger in life and they're, they're talking monkeys, but... If you've been with a person in any capacity that was meaningful, and I'm not even talking about romantically, you had a really good friend, you've felt these emotions about somebody, you know, and I, for whatever reason, that seems to be very hard for a lot of directors and writers to get right on screen, especially in genre fair. So they're a really, really special example of like what a character can actually be if you flesh them out to feel real. The movie lives and dies, and we've said it over and over at this point, but like it it lives and dies with those eight performances. Yes. If those were bad, this is suddenly a very silly movie. Yes. Well, that that was 20th Century Fox's whole concern. And uh, Charlton Heston, in an interview with Charlton Heston, they said, because he was there, Charlton Heston was on this movie really early on, like Mm -hmm. even before pre-production really took off, because he was one of the selling points of the movie, We've Got a Star. He remembered being in a meeting with the heads of 20th Century Fox, and they're like, yeah, we like the idea, but uh, what if people laugh at the makeup? (laughs) And apparently that conversation is what really kickstarted everything everything right with this movie and really sort of cemented to arthur p jacobs and i'm not sure franklin schaffner was on at that point but they did a they did a test makeup thing where they shot a scene from rod serling's original script where where um, edward g robinson actually plays dr zayas he was going to play dr zayas you can see the beginnings of it it's not quite there yet but you can see the beginnings of where this is need to go but from the get-go they need they realize it needs to be actual actors behind the ape makeup it can't just be some stuntman it needs right they they need to be able to emote you think more actors would like love to have a job like that well that that is what is so confusing about like how this attitude about genre cinema comes up well it's not just that a lot of people were afraid to they were they were afraid to play in the apes movies particularly early on despite the fact they knew that they were huge money Mm. like orson welles was going to play ursus he was going to play General right. Ursus in the next movie. And he refused to do it because no one would see his face. Yeah, which is... And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. And 
a part it, of me it's goes ego and fear yeah. uh, uh, that this because while genre cinema can be really powerful like we've been saying this whole time, it can also get silly. So I guess it is a gamble to say, I'm going to be in the apes movie, you yeah. know? Well, especially with the first and one. Yeah. A hundred percent for the sequels. You're seeing a diminishing budget. I mean, that can't be a ringing endorsement <laughs> no. either. No, that's not a, no, but you've got a really compelling story. Absolutely. You've got really good characters and you've got a theme behind it to sort of give you an extra punch and moreover you have one of the most uh, like i know we keep saying the ending but you have one of the most profound images in all of cinema it's like, a haunting in this movie. It's, it's so haunting i mean it still affects you you know Absolutely. like just just seeing charlton heston on the ground screaming in anger and sorrow it's so funny to think about that scene in particular. They did not want, I don't know if they didn't want the audio of him doing the, uh, damn you all to hell, but they did not want him to say, damn you all to hell. Uh, and they actually had to make like an actual appeal for the movie to be rated G where he was saying, no, he's literally asking for the action of damning these people. Um, but that was going to be cut out of the movie. I, I don't think the scene plays the same without no. that anguish in the voice and without that desperation. If he says anything else there, it works significantly less. Because, yeah, well, he slams his fist into the dirt, and after he says, damn you all to hell that last time, he's crying. Yeah. And I'm like, and oh. And it's, it's a guy who was not connected to his species, his race, humanity, uh -huh. at all at the beginning of this film until yeah. it is taken away and lost. It's so good. I'm a big fan it's of this so movie. It's so good. It's, this movie is easily in my top 10 favorite films of all time. I'm not quite sure where it is in that top 10, but it's in the top 10. No, it's, it's definitely a top 20 for me. Anybody who says this is the best movie of all time, I don't I know that it. I agree necessarily, but I'm not going to argue with you. I get it. You know, it's, it's one of those cases. It's kind of like it, people might think I'm being over-exaggerated here, but I'm, I, I really don't feel like I am. People say Citizen Kane is the greatest movie movie of all mm -hmm. time. It's not my favorite movie of all time. It's a very good movie, but right. it's not my favorite. Not even on my top twenty, probably favorite sure. movies of all time. But I get it. I get why people love it. I, it's the I same understand with, the appeal. It's just not my thing. I you see. To me, that's like me with Planet of the Apes, where I'm like, no, nah, like I, I when somebody comes up to me and it's happened a few times, where they're like, no, Planet of the Apes is my favorite movie, and I'm like, fuck yeah, I completely get it. It's in my top yeah, 10. It, hell it's, yeah. It deserves every bit of praise it gets. And it's so much more than just a movie about <laughs> talking monkeys. It, so much could have gone wrong with this movie, Oliver. Like, so much could have just turned this into B-movie fair. Well, you even think about, like, how much restraint the movie has. Um, in multiple iterations of Planet of the Apes, when it gets revisited... There is a big demand for Taylor to have a romance with, if not Zira, one of these apes. Um, and thank God that is not something that happens. Mark yes. Wahlberg, they actually did film it, um, and it's not in there. But there is a, there's a sex scene of Mark Wahlberg, Taylor, and uh, 2002 Zira out there. It's, but I, I guess the point I'm making is this movie does not feel exploitive. You know what I mean? No. It there's doesn't the one, do things to be over the top. There's the one kiss between that when when Taylor goes, I want to kiss Zira goodbye. And he mm. just gives her a little kiss. A lot of people think that's a really strange, 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 strange thing. To me, I'm like, no, it makes perfect sense. She was the only one, the only one who believed Who has shown Taylor. you any ounce of humanity in the yeah. last, in the most traumatic part of your whole life. And, and But I also like how she kind of, she looks so sheepish during that yeah. scene too. And I love how she goes, all right, but you're just so damned ugly. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, that's, that's, it's cute. It's funny. I think it fits with what's going on. And I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I've never had a problem with that scene. I bring it up just to, to hammer in. It is even the things that could so easily become exploitive over the top in the movie for the hell of it. They aren't that. 
Taylor and Nova could yeah. have been a lot more exploitative than it was. One hundred percent. There's one scene that I really love when they're freed, right? And he mm. he says, "She's coming with me, whether you like it or not." I love it how when they they go to that cornfield, and she desperately wants to go back there because that was her home, and Taylor knows otherwise that if you go back right. there, they're just going to round you up and probably kill you. And but she doesn't know. And I love how he grabs her and just says her name, Nova, 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 calm down, Nova, until he finally gets her to look him in the eye and she calms down immediately. Because I love how she realizes that Heston isn't going to hurt her. There's inherent instinctual trust. Yes. That's just a relationship that could have been so exploitative. And it's not. They don't even kiss in the movie. (laughs) Yeah. They just they just hold each other in a few in a few sequences and it works because of that. A good movie and like, a joy to discuss at any time. I think about this one experience whenever I see a movie like this. Jeremy, who I make stuff on my channel with all the time, mm-hmm. we were working on something a long time ago. It was one of those things like you work on something creatively and you just like you can't crack it, you know. Mm-hmm. And we took a break and we went and we saw three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. And we're walking out of the movie. And I said to Jeremy, I'm like, oh, that's what we have to do. And he goes, what? I'm like, we got to make a good thing. We have to make it good, you know? Um, And now anytime that I see a movie that is just profoundly good, I'm like, oh, yeah, just make good stuff. And that's what this is. And that's my deep uh, college level analysis of this film. Just make good stuff. Well, Oliver, this is going to conclude the first episode of Go Ape. Next time, we're going to be talking about the first ape sequel beneath the planet of the apes. My personal favorite one. Oh, really? Okay, so this is going to be this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Then, Oliver, if you can pimp out your social media, pimp yourself out here. Now's the time to do it. Hey, find me, uh, other productions and media on YouTube, or if you look up Oliver the Ricketts, I'm on there all the time talking about strange curiosities. My documentary series, American Genius, lives there. Um, And soon, I'll be crushing a watermelon between my thighs. I already did that. But now we're getting an hour long documentary about the process. So or if you want to see me talk about movies, I am over on the Designing Hollywood YouTube channel. Um, and right now we're just we're just diving into some of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, we actually did Rise of the Planet of the Apes. So check out all that stuff. And I'm I'm everywhere. Like I said, Internet Menace, Oliver the Ricketts. Uh, if you're curious, I'll have a link to to I guess now both of his YouTube channels now in, in mm-hmm. the description below. All of my social media is down there as well. Do subscribe for for more content like this. Even though I mainly make history videos now. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time take care if you were to pause the movie right before it with a person who had never seen it and say guess what happens (laughs) guess what happens next (laughs) (laughs) they never say the right thing never in a million fucking years never in a million years would they guess what the fuck happens in this movie and I love that about it hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to episode 2 of Go Ape. Today we're going to be talking about the first of the ape sequel, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, starring James Franciscus, Charlton Heston, Kim Hunter, James Gregory, and a bunch of other people we don't really care about. Joining me is the guest from the first Go Apes episode, Oliver. Welcome back. Adam. Hello. Thank you. I'm so excited. This is my favorite ape sequel, and because you- of that... You have got to be the only person on a planet that thinks that. I I could I could very well be, but you know what? I'm a man of conviction. I love this movie. I, I there's a lot of people who don't like this movie at all. There's mm-hmm. in fact there's a lot of hatred for this movie, and I get it. Particularly, oh, I get with it the, too. Let's just kind of dive into this. No spoilers at the beginning, but I kind of want to give some backdrop to this movie because I think if you know the backdrop of this movie, it makes a fuck ton more sense why the movie is the way it is. This movie's the definition of a quickie sequel. Some history with 20th Century Fox. In 1970, they had released three big, giant box office bombs. Uh, Two of them were musicals uh, made by the people that made The Sound of Music. And then one of them was one of my favorite films of all time, 
Torah, 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 about the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. So they were in desperate needs of money. Planet of the Apes movies were still doing really good. The first one was still doing unbelievably well. I mean, it had a budget of $5.5 million and made $33 million back in 1968. I mean, that's a, that's, and that's just in the United States. People were going ape all over the world. So they realized that, yeah, we need a sequel. And so originally they had uh, planned on giving this movie a budget of a, a little under Planet of the Apes, but still in the $5 million range. All of a sudden, overnight, it got cut just before filmmaking, before they began shooting, it got cut to, it literally got cut in half to $2.5 million. And that explains a lot to me. Another thing, too, that this film does is it brings on writer Paul Dane, and Paul Dane would write the next, this movie and the next two sequels, and then he would pen the outline for battle. And Paul Dane is, I think, that unifying force behind the scenes that makes this movie what it is, the film that it is. Because you can even say, like, Arthur P. Jacobs, who was the main producer of this movie, of these movies, all the eighth movies, um, he, I can't even say it was him, because Planet of the Apes was actually his B movie. He was just mm. kind of doing that on the side. His big movie was a movie called Dr. Doolittle, which was a big musical. And guess what? The movie bombed. Well, Doctor Doolittle, not Doctor Doolittle, like, like the dogs and the and the animals and the yes, I like when Actually, Robert Downey Jr. fists the elephant. A anybody fist an elephant in that original? Nobody fists, but there were, nobody fisted an elephant, but they did ride a giant <laughs> snail. It was really Paul Dane because, like, if you even look at the production crew of this movie, it was entirely different. A lot of them were from TV, uh, namely the director. Franklin J. Schaffner was offered to come back on this film to be the director, and he showed interest because, hey, it was a big success. Why not? And why not? I helmed the, the first one. I can helm the second one. But he was balls deep in making a little movie called Patton. They decided to go with a director by the name of Ted Post, and Ted Post was a big TV director. He was known for being not overly artistic, known for getting things done on time and on budget and on schedule, a competent director. A Tim you know, story of the day. They couldn't quite figure out what to do with this movie because the original idea by was, was that Planet of the Men, which was Charlton Heston does start breeding a, a new race of humans to combat the apes. And the ending of that film would have been brilliant, admittedly. I don't think the movie would have worked well as a whole mm -hmm. but the ending of planet of the men was they were at a zoo and a bunch of these these humans were laughing at all these apes that now they can't talk and they're all naked and they've been reduced to being back in cages mm. and they come to one orangutan and they're like say your name say your name and he goes my name is dr zaius and that That's was the brilliant. ending of the film. That was the ending of the film. And I'm like, and I'm like, so all the fears of what Dr. Zayas was saying came true. Uh, and it, it certainly would have been an interesting movie. I, I would love to see kind of like what they did with Rod, Rod Serling's original script for Planet of the Apes, if they made this into a graphic novel, uh, because it would have been very interesting. But eventually they came up with the script that we got. A lot of that had to do with the fact that Charlton Heston did not want to be in this movie. That was right. huge. Like, that was bad. And on top of that, the original producer, the, or the financier, I should say, of the original Planet of the Apes movies, Richard Zanuck, uh, was getting fired by his own father at 20th Century Fox. So nobody wants to make this movie. Charlton Heston doesn't want to, be, want to make this movie. Richard Zanuck had to personally beg Charlton Heston to, to be in the film. And Charlton Heston said, I will only be in this movie if you kill me off in the first scene that I'm in. They come up with a compromise. You appear in one scene in the beginning of the movie, and then you come back at the end. And Charlton Heston said, okay, sure. So then they had to come up with a new character. Who's, who's the story going to tell? Bring in discount Charlton Heston. Yep. James Franciscus. James Franciscus, who is an underrated actor, in my opinion. He was not so much known for his movies, even though he stars in one of my favorite Ray Harryhausen films, The Valley of Guanji. Uh, which is about cowboys and dinosaurs, and it's awesome. He played in a lot of television. In fact, the reason why he agreed to be in this movie is, one, he could show off his physique. He was a rather strong, 
handsome man. And he wanted to show that off. And two, this is a it was, common thread for yes. for these apes movies. These dudes yes, want to get naked. Yes. And then on top of that, he said, and I quote, it would be a nice relieving break from my normal television fare. James Franciscus and, and, and Ted Puzz knew exactly what kind of movie they were making. And they hated Brent. They hated him. Mm. And so apparently they spent a week together and took Paul Dane's script and wrote about 50 pages worth of notes to give back to Paul Dane to make changes for who uh, Brent is as a character. And so then Paul Dane incorporated that and that ended up wound up becoming the final version of the movie, the final script for the movie that we got. And a lot of the stuff with, with Brent underground in particular is mm-hmm. stuff from James, James Franciscus and, and Ted Post. Charlton Heston said, if only he knew what was coming, he would have been, he wouldn't have been so much of a, like of a, a dick about not wanting to be in this movie. Uh, but hindsight is always twenty twenty because back then franchises weren't a thing, right? Right, franchises. Well, that weren't a that thing. is interesting because that is the building block of the genre that this movie is in. Is that these mm-hmm. movies like this get franchised out? In fact, Apes itself is one of the first big science fiction franchises, like we talked about last time. The especially only... when it comes to merchandising. That's what I was going to say. The only thing that I think even remotely predates Planet of the Apes is Godzilla. Literally. Yeah. I think that's it. I think that's that's literally it. that's because the Japanese love toys. (laughs) But this is even before that. Go Apes, that campaign, and why the show is called Go Apes, it's an homage to that, wasn't a thing until Conquest. That's when suddenly they started exploding with toys and exploding with this, that, and a whole shit and caboodle. Uh, lunch boxes, thermoses, everything. Everything had apes on it now. But there wasn't th- that wasn't there yet. Everybody fucking knew that this was just a quickie sequel that was there to make a quick buck for 20th Century Fox. Some brand recognition. I think the fact that the movie is as good as it is is a miracle in of itself. Way more of a miracle than the original. You like you look at Ted Post, and I I like Ted Post. I really like one of his movies, Hang 'Em High, with Clint Eastwood. I think it's a genuinely a, a I good movie. I love Hang 'Em High. Yeah, that's Ted Post, and I think that's a pretty damn good movie. Uh, he then he went on to direct this. I'll say it. I I think the direction in this movie is a lot. It's a lot kind of like sloppier. I, mm-hmm. I think than it's than it's not as yep. polished as what Schaffner was as a director. But or or even Don Taylor who directed Escapes or especially J. Lee Thompson with Conquest. But I will give him this: this movie's got a lot of movement in it. I I, I can't say he's a bad director at all. I I think he get pulls out some really good performances, particularly with 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 Zaius and Ursus. And there's several people in this movie, including Brent, where I think if you read the script, they're one-dimensional characters and they're almost cardboard cutout characters. But because of the performance that is given, it elevated the characters. And I have that with Brent and Ursus. Jerry Goldsmith couldn't come back. Jerry Goldsmith couldn't mm. come to, back to do the music on this as well because guess what? He was working on Patton uh, and Tora, Tora, Tora. He was a busy man in 1970. Always the way it goes. Without going into any spoilers, your overall thoughts of what I guess is your favorite Apes movie. Anybody who knows me knows that I love a stupid, schlocky, bad movie. It's my favorite thing in the world. And I'm not saying this is a bad movie. This is like Evil Dead 2. This is like Army of Darkness. This is like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's good, dumb, B-movie science fiction. And I, I don't know what your definition of spoilers is, so I'm not going to jump into it but some of the characters that show up here belong in superman 4 (laughs) some of the things happening here are because i think ideas like these are what this genre is built on because we start with the bad the silly the whatever and then we build on that and we say okay how do you legitimize that i'm not saying beneath the planet of the apes is as smart as planet of the apes I'm not saying it's as gut-wrenching as Escape from Planet of the Apes. 
I'm just saying you can't tell what the hell's going to happen next. And I <laughs> fucking love this movie. For I, that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oliver, exactly the same, same reason. I love the sharp right turn this movie takes about halfway through the film. When that happens, I no longer know what's going to happen if for the rest of the movie. To, and I love that. If you were to pause the movie right before it with a person who had never seen it and say, Guess what happens? <laughs> Guess what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> they never they say the right thing. Never they in would, a million fucking years. Never in a million years would they guess what the fuck happens in this movie. And I love that about it. I, I truly do. My overall thoughts is that the first half of this movie is, it's exactly what everyone feared it was going to be. And that is a quick oh, yeah. sequel. The first and half, I'll say it, it, it mm, a yep. little boring, a little boring, a little yeah. slow. Well, well, I, I, I disagree. I think it's boring. Let me, let me say this. I think the first half actually feels rushed. It's a rushed mm. mess of trying to get from point A to point B, action scene, action scene, action scene, point A to point B, and it doesn't bother to, with the exception of Cornelius and Zira, mm -hmm. it doesn't really let us digest what's happening. Right. And because of that, I. A uh, part of me genuinely says I want at least ten more minutes in Ape City of Brent trying to hide or go into what the fuck happened because Ursus is a is a thing because of Taylor in the previous movie. We're introduced to the Gorilla General Ursus, who is fucking awesome. I don't care what anyone says, and uh, James Gregory gives such a good performance that he's a one note, one dimensional bad guy. But James Gregory makes him so he, charismatic. You love him. He's your Bond beat him up guy. He's yes. you know the big muscle man that comes to punch Indiana Jones. He's he's that guy. But you know what? He's a damn good version of that guy. Plus, the makeup on him is really good too. Like the gorilla makeup on him. Oh yeah, it's really good. I just wanted to know what's going because there's a few lines that get said. We'll get into this in spoilers where it's like they hint at something really good. And something really interesting that's going on in Ape City. Mm -hmm. But because they're trying to do a rehash with a less interesting Taylor, Brent, right. it doesn't come off. It doesn't, it doesn't go there. But then that second half happens, and Oliver, I'm not going to lie, I think the second half of this movie is a masterpiece. Absolutely I mean it. it is. 100%. It is, it is a masterpiece. And I love how it's shot. I love the crazy editing. I think it's acted extremely well. I love some of the dialogue that happens mm -hmm. in that final in that final in that final half. And it's just so fucking weird. It is such a great example of how making things and it's it's why I advocate for this kind of thing in cinema now. I love a silly movie. I love something that's like, yeah, that's over the top, but I haven't seen that before. And that's really cool. When something gets that over the top and that silly and that weird and those creative juices are flowing, they do wind up at a really profound place at the end of this movie. And it's cool. Mm -hmm. Again, no spoilers, but it's not an ending that people know is coming. In Apes, I know where we're going to wind up, right? Be and that's just societal. Mm -hmm. That's how that is. I'm not saying it's a bad twist, but it's a good enough twist that we all know what's going to happen now. Mm -hmm. Um... So you watch that movie different. You're watching it to see, look for hints. You're watching Beneath and you're going, what the hell is going on here? You know? Acid. I think that, I think you feel like you're watching an, you're on an acid trip. But that gets you to this place that, A, it is logical that this world would go this way. And B, <laughs> it, it is, a, it's a stunning ending that you wouldn't have got if you didn't let these people just run wild in there. So I guess you're saying yay on the ending because that, that was Big my next yay. question. Because I was going to say, are you yay or nay on it? And a lot of people are nay, and I get it. But I'm, a, I'm, I'm very big yay. <laughs> on the I am actually, the I don't want to spoil, but I have several current day movies uh, that, that I'm going to be talking about soon that I wish would take some freaking notes from this and end the same way. <laughs> Well, this movie subverted everybody's expectations before subverting expectations was a thing. I remember the first time my mind was blown. This the the second half of this movie when watching this for the first time as a kid, and I was sitting there. My parents were with my my great aunt Ree. Uh, they were playing poker in in the kitchen, 
right? And I was sitting in my recliner with my blankie. You know, it wasn't when I was fucking old enough that it was my blanket. Mm. And, and I, right. I, you know, I was just watching this. And for I watched this for the first time in her living room. And this movie fucking blew my mind. <laughs> it blew my fucking mind, Oliver. It's insane. <laughs> Even with the historical context in my head of, like, what early 70s science fiction was like, which was very different than what it was post-Star right. Wars. Uh, it's um, a beloved era for me. Yeah. Even with that in mind, it's still, to me, the ending of Beneath impacted me more as a viewer than the original did. And 100%. I do think part of that, for me at least, is because you know what the end of the original is going to be when you watch okay. it in our lifetime, right? Right. It's not just that we don't know how this movie ends. It's it's that they don't make movies that end like this anymore. <laughs> no, they certainly Where do not. <laughs> the only other experience I've ever had watching a movie like and being this surprised by like a sharp turn is the end of The Departed, where, spoilers for a movie that came out in 2007, when DiCaprio gets shot in the face in the elevator. One of the greatest little twists in cinema history is that. And you're sitting there watching it, and you go, you can do that? Yeah. You can, and that's what this is. You can do that? <laughs> I mean, you kind of get a little taste of it coming at the very mm -hmm. beginning with Charlton Heston's character, but you're still like, what? And there's a couple of lines from The Apes, too that kind of foreshadow that something weird is happening out there in the forbidden zone. It's, it's fair to say too, that Heston is an action hero, right? Mm -hmm. If you go from, from one to two and Heston being in this movie is marketing. This is our hero. This is our action hero. And if you're a movie with an action hero in it, it stands to reason that the audience believes the hero is going to save the day at the end. And so you are conditioned to believe Oh, no matter what they say and what they threaten, that's what we're afraid of. It's not going to happen because good conquers evil and, and the hero wins. That's what Hollywood has taught us. Um, if there's anything 70s science fiction has taught me, the good guy that. never wins. Yeah, it's not that. <laughs> never wins. This is one of the bleakest movies I've ever seen. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it is. Uh... Again, no spoilers yet. But oh my and it, god! It's not just it's not just bleak, but I I love it because it it's so effective, it's so great. It's also the kind of ending that a second grader could come up with in the best <laughs> possible way. I th I think Ted Post gets a bad rep. Uh, he's not as good as Franklin J. Schaffner, and I, I think out of all the directors that come from the Planet of the Apes, the original five film, he is the the weakest of the bunch. Well, when you say but, he's known as kind of a rough and tumble, he can get the job done. What comes yeah. to my mind now is a Tim Story or a Sean Levy. The studios like these guys, so they get work. Yep. They come in under budget. There's nothing particularly spectacular about their direction as far as style goes. Um, but they're they're effective. Uh Effective is That's, a good word to describe Ted Post. Like, yeah. like he gets the job done, and it's usually done pretty damn competently. Uh, as far as actors selling it, and we'll move off him because we've already talked about him a good amount, but mm -hmm. the fact that Heston did not want to be here, you know? Heston gives a good performance in this movie. He does. That's what I'm saying. And I yeah. believe that speaks to Ted Post being a, a good director because... It takes a good director and a good captain of the ship, first of all, to mold the material to where an actor can be their best in the in the role. So you have a guy mm -hmm. who doesn't want to be there. You mold the story around that. That's being a good director. That's the same as James Gunn saying, oh, Dave Batista can't really emote at this stage in his career. Let's make him let's make that the character. Charlton Heston is one of the most talented to ever do it. I'm not saying he wouldn't have. Couldn't have given a good performance in his sleep. But the movie also uses a weakness to its strength. And I think that that's really cool. From what everybody said, including the, the girl that played Nova, um, Charlton Heston was pretty vocal about not wanting to be in this movie. But he always showed up on set, on time, and ready to go. And he knew his lines. Mm -hmm. He was a consummate professional. Not and a Brando. I think that, yeah, not a Brando. <laughs> Band-Aids off. 
Spoilers ahoy. Oh. The monkeys and the people can't get along and they blow up the world, they Adam. They blow up the fucking planet. <laughs> <laughs> the last line of this movie is Charlton Heston holding his heart as it's bleeding out, and he <laughs> says, you bloody bastards. And he blows up the fucking planet. Not just detonates a nuke, he blows up and incinerates the entire the Earth. Earth is and it gone. Ends, it ends in the, uh, uh, the ending narration. He, the, the narrator says, in the countless billions of stars... <laughs> In our galaxy lies a medium-sized star, and orbiting that star, a green and insignificant planet is now dead. Fades to black, <laughs> silent end credits. That is you the blew end it up of you, your movie. You blew it up and you never even mattered in the first place. Oh my god. God, <laughs> and it's the best is that it's so profound, especially to where the world was at the time. So it's, it's a message of of the dangers of our own hubris in where we're yeah. headed. And I I even believe that you know they, there's something to be taken away from that now. Well, the, um, the Alpha and Omega bomb was a genuinely big fear in oh, that yeah. era that we were going to develop a bomb so powerful it will actually incinerate the Earth. And what's even yeah. better is as sophisticated of a fear as it is for a movie that, you know, ultimately a lot of the success boils down to toys. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when you see a kid playing with action figures. What happens at the end? They destroy the world. Every character you knew and loved, they're dead. Like fucking Nova gets blown away. Uh, and, and freaking James Brent. After all the shit that he's been through, he's then shot through the head and then riddled with bullets. He turns into Swiss cheese when the apes start shooting him. Oh, it's and glorious. It's awesome. It's so insane. Zayas has such a clear choice. Taylor is like, er, just help me, Zayas. Th this is the end of the world. Help me. And instead of helping him, Zayas doubles the fuck down and says man is evil, capable of nothing but destruction, intercut to F James Francisca shooting a bunch of apes and the apes destroying everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, this sucks. <laughs> there is a, a real beauty to that this is not ape cinematic universe phase one. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Th this is not teaser for another movie in any way, shape, or form. They did not just want like, any more sequels. Just like the first one is not that. Every ape movie, and I'll even argue, and we'll get there, escape. I'll even mm -hmm. argue that, because I know people say that's open-ended, but I, I disagree, actually. I think that that still functions as the end. Every apes movie, the end is supposed to be the end of the franchise. Because we're not focused on the next thing. And I think that that allowed for such a cool ending to even exist. You could not do this now because the no. bean counters are sitting there saying, yeah, but what if you make a billion dollars? Don't you want to make two billion dollars? Crank yes. out another one. I got to tell you, I wasn't expecting to see a bunch of telepathic mutants, nor was I expecting to see that those telepathic mutants pray to a nuclear bomb. The the telepathic uh, mutants is such a them. turn for this fucking thing. They're I so fucking cool. love them. They are Silver Age DC type characters that you mm -hmm. would see in like old Superman serials. I incredible. And, and and some the of their dialogue is fantastic too. There's one scene. He's credited in the end credits as Negro, so I guess he doesn't have a, a name. Yeah. But he's he's the guy that gets Brent and Charlton Heston to fight each other. He has this amazing line that is, he delivers it perfectly because of how clinical and cold he says it. Mm -hmm. He says, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Brent, we are a peaceful people. We do not kill our enemies. We get our enemies to kill each other. And I'm like, that gave me chills. It's cold. I actually was going yeah. to bring up, I love the idea that these people who pray to a bomb, they are militant people. They believe that they are peaceful. They yes. fully 
are are committed to that. We don't hurt people. You hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, what what a great concept because that brings up all of these amazing concepts about mind control and what does your body do and who is telling it to do it and what does free will even mean? And again, these are these themes that can only be achieved when you just let the creative team go fucking nuts. It's the head priest, uh, mm-hmm. who I guess his name is Mandez, who's terrifying. I, I, I don't... All of them are terrifying, but Mandez... Uh, there's something about how, like, somber he looks all the time and how calmly he speaks with that deep, rich voice that he has that makes me go, oh, God. I love the sermon that he gives. The ending of the sermon after they reveal that they're mutants, which is an awesome scene. Yes. It's so effective because that was everyone agreed in the production that that scene was the scene that was going to shock people like the original ending was. Mm. It was going to be that scene. And I think it works. I I genuinely think it works. And I also like that the makeup uh, isn't over the top grotesque. It's just us with our epidermis gone. And I'm like, that almost makes it even that's even even ickier or grody. Yeah. But he says the ending of his sermon goes like this. It says, may the blessing of the bomb almighty and the fellowship of the holy fallout descend on us all this day and forevermore. Amen. And there's something about the fact that if you look at the the doors to their church, you see an upside, you see two upside down crosses. That's Mm -hmm. fine. And then when you see the bomb for the first time, you realize it looks like an upside down cross. And yeah. I'm like, this is awesome. They are the antithesis to the apes as well. Is that the, these are men worshiping a tech. Tech. This mm-hmm. is a bomb. They're worshiping and tech. The, and the apes fear tech actively. And I like how the ape uniforms are all really dark. It also helps that the gorillas are the army. So dark. And then you have all of the mutants who are wearing these bright robes, these white clean clinical robes which i think contrasts with the nature of radiation and all that Mm -hmm. i absolutely love the contrast even though it is still disturbing watching the apes charge into that underground city and literally massacre everyone (laughs) they come across uh it's it's a flat-out genocide you have zayas screaming this is obscene and beating statues heads in with the butt of a rifle uh it is magnificent. It is a fun twist that after the apes are the the across the board villain for the entire first movie, barring yeah. Cornelius and, and Zira, um, and, and you are afraid of them in this movie, uh, but when they descend on the fucking mutants, it is like a fuck yeah. Here come the damn monkeys. Oh, I don't, you see, here's the thing. I didn't get a fuck yeah moment. I was terrified because I think, I think the entire last act is full of some amazing tension. Sure. Uh, and I think that tension stays there to when, from when the, the mutants make, they, they don't just make, this part is genuinely disturbing. They don't just try to control Brent to the point where he tries to physically harm Nova. They mm-hmm. try to make him rape her. Right. And I'm like, oh, remember this is G? This is rated G. Yeah. And it is one of the dark, uh, not darkest G rated movies. It's one of the darkest movies. Yeah. Like they, they, they do that. And on top of that, so you've got these two armies going up against each other. You have the mutants who are going to blow up the earth. You have the gorillas that they have no idea what the fuck they're doing. And they're just killing everybody and everything because that's what they do. And then you have our heroes who are trying to stop the bomb from exploding and they're just getting killed. It suddenly goes from being a retelling of the first movie to its own fucking thing. And it's, it's, I, ah, I I just love it. I, I, I I, adore that second I think you hit on maybe what, what sells it to me so hard is that it does start as a retelling of the first movie. But it's almost like a lull you into a false sense of security. Could it be an example of playing with that trope very early on? You know, maybe could we, could that know. be intentional? Because that is part of what works about it for me is that it's not just that it's weird at the end. Any movie can be weird all the way through. 
Uh, recently, I saw I saw the TV glow, and I thought that was a movie that really would have benefited from getting weird in the mm-hmm. last thirty minutes rather than being weird the whole time. This movie is. You know, it plays it straight for a long time. And then when it starts to get fucking bizarre, it, it's such a turning point in it. And, but I don't think it would work if it was just bizarre from the beginning. I think it almost would be like, well, this isn't really an ape sequel. It kind of shows the mentality how the apes are, they're fucked up. The mutants are fucked up. Ursus's idea when he sees the bomb is to shoot it <laughs> with a machine gun. <laughs> And then when Zaius says, this weapon is made by man, you cannot just shoot it down with a clip of bullets. Ursa says, well, if we can't shoot it down, we'll pull it down. And I think that sort of sums up the the whole dichotomy of everything in general. Right. That it's right. nothing but a continuous cycle of destruction. Right. That's, that's all this is. And the cycle is just going to continue and continue and continue, and ultimately the only thing that's going to break that cycle of destruction and hatred is to blow up the is fucking death. planet. Yep. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, that is your theme. So this is a, this is a real hopeful movie. Woof. <laughs> it's a real feel-good, it's a real feel-good, feel-good summer blockbuster right here, yeah. But it's, it's, uh... Fucking nuts. I mean, I mean, I love that interrogation scene with the mutants, too, where the mutants are all up on that arch. Yep. And, or the council of mutants. I don't know what they're called, but they're all up on that arch. And the woman, by the way, in that scene, uh, her name is Natalie Trundy. That was the actress's mm-hmm. name, the woman in that council, would go on to play the female doctor on Escape. And then right. she would also play Lisa on Conquest of the Planet of the Apes and Beneath the Planet of the Apes, Caesar's wife. Right, right, right. So she's oh, the only cool. other actor to appear in uh, in in four of the five Planet of the Apes movies. But I love that scene because the way how James Franciscus plays it, he'll answer the questions, but yet he won't kind of say what they're asking. So we're kind of trying to piece it together as well. And that little chime that you hear whenever they yep. are talking to him telepathically. And the moment he mentions the apes, I love how they all start bombarding him at once. <laughs> and, he ch- and he just can't handle it, and he's screaming. Well, you and think about like, how oh. terrifying that would be. I can't listen to two songs at the same time, guy. <laughs> I... <laughs> right, right. If, if two people speak to me at the same time, I'm going to have a conniption. Imagine that many people in their main line in your brain. You yeah. know, this is and, body and horror. They're not just they're not just in in your brain. It's such a psychological terror too, because they're like the visual, which they then make him think he's seeing flames in front of himself, mm-hmm. and then the psychological, in which they like blast a supersonic sound in his head that essentially tries to kill him. It's perceived death, is what right. it is. It's none of it's real. It's all an image, and it, I love how it's foreshadowed in the beginning with Charlton Heston because I love how suddenly he sees that wall, that cliff. And he's like, "That wasn't there." Yeah. And then he looks to Nova, and she she's looking around too. I love how he goes, "No, you see it too." So I'm not going crazy. <laughs> and I love the logic behind that. Right. Uh, I love. I love the. It's not just that they they rape her and. Or they have him rape her, and they make them fight, and all of these, you know, terrible, heinous things. It's the insistence that they are a peaceful, evolved species. That, to me, is what is so terrifying about it. And it's it goes beyond the actions of them doing it. It's the person watching, very matter-of-factly, this is what we do, this is life. So everything good in which we've talked about with this movie thus far, um, I need to really emphasize is in the second half of the movie. The first half of the movie is where just about all of my problems arise. It feels like when you hit a season of a television show where the whole cast knows that the show should have been over, 
and you're in that first premiere episode and you're like, uh, like when you go from the office season five to the office season six, <laughs> you go, Oh, this is not going to be that good. <laughs> right. Right. I, I, I suppose so. And, and, be, and the, the biggest letdown with the first half of the movie though, to me is that they don't bother to kind of expand upon ape city. They kind of have some inklings to it, uh, but they don't mm-hmm. go along with it. And that's why I'm saying I really wish we had like at least 10 more minutes in Ape City to kind of flesh out right. the politics of what's happened because we have the rise of General Ursus and the rise of General Ursus is so clearly a reaction to Taylor mm-hmm. that it scared Ape City shitless. And they've called upon a leader and that leader is Ursus, and he's now going to lead an army into the Forbidden Zone. But he says a couple of lines with Zaius that are unbelievably interesting, and I, I wish they played into this more. Because there's a severe hint that Ape City is about to be hit with a bad famine, and that's actually really why Ursus is going into the Forbidden Zone, because Ursus looks at Zaius and goes, what's worse than famine, Doctor? <laughs> and the Doctor says, the unknown. Uh, despite the fact that those ape suits are terrible, uh, why they had yep. to do that in a sauna is beyond me. I, they could have just had it, or they just could have had it in Zaius's office and it would have worked just as well. You also see a lot of the, in the crowd scene where he's working, where Ursus is working the crowd, a lot of that reduced budget shows itself there because you see a lot of just pull over ape masks that contrast so blatantly with the full makeup. Yep. yep. I like the, the implications of that. If Ape City is going to be in a famine, we need to expand. Where Mm -hmm. to? Because if the humans are prospering out there, then that means we can prosper there too. And that's the whole Possibly better than them. We're more evolved. Right. If there are more people like Taylor, which is what Zaius is all about. He's afraid of. Yeah. We need to kill him. Right. In the name of God. In the name of <laughs> this is, is this is a holy war, which is it is, which is so funny because you have the mutants who say this is a holy war, and then you have the apes that think this is a holy war. In fact, there's a beautiful cross cut too, where the sermon with the bomb happens, revealing that they're the mutants. The next scene, it's another sermon, but with the apes, and that priest so blessing funny. the apes yeah. about to go off to war. And I'm like, oh Jesus, <laughs> the war yeah. of faith. We're getting uh, heavy. I love the fact that apparently Zaius is so desperate to keep things in order in Ape City that he decides to go to Cornelius and Zira saying, hey, you guys are now the ministers of science. Keep things in order, please, while I'm gone. And that whole dichotomy I find interesting that I just wish the movie played on a little bit more. Right, it's all there. Yeah. And and it's just it's just kind of breezed over. Zaius is awesome in this movie. I think he's awesome from beginning to end in this film. In fact, I think I think he's a better character in this movie than he is in the previous one. Because in the I agree. previous in the previous film, he's pretty one dimensional. Effectively yep. so. I'm not effectively right. so. Right. He's he, a compelling he works villain. Beautifully. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in this film, he's shockingly nuanced in several sequences where I, I, the, the, this mentality of, I don't like what the gorillas are doing, but it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And because it's inevitable, I might as well join them and try to keep things in order as best as I can. The scene where all the apes are hanging upside down, they're bleeding, it's the vision. You see the lawgiver, lawgiver statue start bleeding. Mm. Again, a G-rated movie. Uh, <laughs> I love Ursus charging. Uh, Ursus, Zaius charging. He says, and I quote, The spirit of the lawgiver is with us. We are still God's chosen. This is a vision and it is a lie. I love how much uh, religious stuff there is in these movies and yeah. how much there is saying God made the ape in his image. Because what struck me is I love how their church services use the same logic that ours do, where we Mm -hmm. say God made man in his image, you know, but but to them it would be different. And I think there's something interesting about how they've bastardized, like, because they've obviously learned religion by 
lack of a better term, aping humans, right? Like right. that's the, the earliest ones, but they've bastardized it to be about them, which means someone back somewhere knows that it's a load of bullshit. Oh, well, the, well they do. Uh, Zayas is, is the right. He's the one that blatantly goes, yeah, the lawgiver. It's all bullshit. Mm. It's all right. bullshit. And we kind of learn a little bit more about that in the next film. But, and What's scary to me is that the mutants seem to believe what they're doing. Mm. Because to me, it, what's scarier than somebody doing evil things and gaining power and not believing what he's doing? It's somebody who's doing all of that and actually believes in what he's doing. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and that's what's so cool about the mutants. They think they're yeah. peaceful. They think that they're driven by being just. And that's what's so interesting about them. They have they have the main component of a good villain, which is truly in their head. I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. Yeah. Well, that's that's Zayas too, to to an extent. But it's like his whole thing is that he just doubles down. He has hints that he's going to come around, mm -hmm. and then instead he chooses. to But double he can't. Down. He can't let it go. Yeah, he can't let it go. Nova steals the show in this movie. A hundred percent. Uh, for a character that is somewhat two dimensional in the first one, mm -hmm. um, it, it, because she's a primitive savage, that's that's by design, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, this movie, that character is so much more complex, um, just in, in what she has to do, and we're we're seeing her as a a human. We see her progression. She can't talk yet, but she's starting to understand. She's like a dog. I hate to say that, right? But it's almost well, like. I'm starting to understand this. Taylor, that scene in the beginning where she where she's sitting with Taylor on the ground and he's you Nova, me Taylor. He's training you know. her dog tricks. Yes. Speak. And she starts understanding because she she goes when when Heston disappears, he goes, Find Zira. If something happens to me, find Zira. And it's almost like she recognized the syllables of that. Yep. And that's what she does. She goes back. She backtracks, and she go, She's and I'm like, oh, I, I love that. At the beginning of the movie, Charlton Heston is teaching her to say his name, Taylor, and she's starting to grasp that his name is Taylor. My name is Nova. What is the only word she mutters in the entire? What's her one and only word? It's Taylor. Yeah, and I love that. Even though it comes off as really hoarse and kind of broken and slurred, I'm like, that's perfect for her first word ever. Well, that's also this... her connection to humanity in what, what she could potentially mm -hmm. be, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I love um, the actress, too. The actress, when, when she's seeing Brent and Taylor trying to eviscerate each other, the look on her face is... She recognizes Taylor. She hears Brent say Taylor, and she runs towards that direction, sees Taylor and Brent trying to beat each other up, and she looks so terrified, so frightened like a little girl, and in horror, and she just yells Taylor, and that is enough yep. to break the spell a little bit and get Taylor and Brent to act and kill that mutant, and I love that. And I love the fact that that's her only line. What's kind of cool is this recurring motif of certain characters who should not be talking, talking just one time. That okay. has been in all of these eight movies. Uh, first one, of course, being um, Heston speaking mm -hmm. for the first time. This one, it's Nova speaking. And then Escape, I won't go into for the next video, but it's at the end. Um and even what is the thing that we know about current apes is uh, when they flip it on its head and Caesar talks one time for the right. first time. It's a very cool little recurring thing because you, know, I you never, get the shock out of the audience before. every time. I never noticed that before, Oliver. That's a really yeah. good observation. I never, I never really saw it that way before. That's a really good observation. I like that. And then Nova dies. Yep. Yeah. And but so do all of them. You know? Also, that's the only scene where Taylor actually is seen having any other emotion other than grunting and getting angry and everything. <laughs> is, is, that, is his scenes with Taylor, uh, is his scenes with, with Nova. Nova. Yep. 
And I love how he's so genuinely defeated when she's dead. And like, I love how he just goes, we should just let them kill each other. We should just end it all. Well, just like, in a Ugh. way, it must be a, a realization this is never going to turn around because that was one of the only good things that came for him in the first film. It was sounds that he like he genuinely his connected life. to her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, again, going back to this is a guy who was more than willing to leave his entire life on, on yeah. Earth. Yeah. For little reason other than I'm, I'm kind of bored, man. Uh, so, yeah, probably nothing good has ever happened to him. He's, he's alienated by humanity is why he, he has only ever connected with a primitive human. Yeah. And two monkeys. And that's it. That goes into the biggest, and I mean the biggest issue with the film. This film is so clearly supposed to be Taylor's story. It needed to be Taylor's story. And there's definitely drafts of this script that are. Yes. It does make you wonder, could you have aged Taylor up and recast? No. No. You think think not? It needed to be Charlton Heston. Um, I see. It's him that blows up the world, not Brent. He's the hero. We get this really visceral fight between Brent and Taylor in that scene, too, with Nova screaming Taylor. That fight is, oh my god. Like, they literally look like they're going at it. They look like they're going, like, really going at it. Like, he's, like, freaking uh, Brent. He's swinging that goddamn (laughs) axe around. And like he's actually taking chunks out of the wall and everything. I'm like, oh my god! And like one of uh, James Francisco's gets his like back cut, and now he's bleeding mm-hmm. all over the floor. And like they're grunting and they're groaning, and it's not and it's shot so uncinematically too. It's just kind of a handheld camera, just kind of following the action. And it's not like they're doing over the top punches. There's not even really over the top sound. It's effects. a very, it's a very matter of fact, real life kind of fight. They're fighting, and I love how animalistic it is too. It's two yeah. animals fighting in a cage. Yeah, it's a great movie, man. It's a no notes A plus. No, some notes, some but notes. I don't care. It's an A plus, dog. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the last thing that I just want to talk about is 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 Brent himself because I think. Like, I love how his relationship with Nova is so radically mm-hmm. different than Taylor's relationship with Nova. I do think that is one thing they do in the first half that well, I, I genuinely think is good. A, and that is smart, because this character, we already called him Dollar Store Taylor. Yeah. If this was every beat the same, I think this is a much worse received movie well, I than like how that's he, already there. He doesn't care about Nova. He just sees right. her as a means to finding Taylor because that's the whole reason why he's there. He's there to supposedly find and rescue Taylor. But he perhaps also doesn't understand the total lack and loss of humanity like Taylor did when yes. he met Nova. I, I, so I think that that's she what means a different at. thing to him. Because, you know, that captain of the ship, mm-hmm. right, that goes blind and then he ends up dying yep. in the beginning. It's quite clear Brent cares about him. Right. And that's not Taylor. Taylor Taylor did not give two shits about Landon or the other guy or even that girl. Nope. nope. Not until it was foreshadowing what was going to happen to him. Yes. But I like, I like how the only scene where he really genuinely cares about it is that he's shocked. And I think that goes into his humanity, too. He can't believe he just tried to rape her. Right. And like, I love that scene. And she can't even look at him because of it. His reaction to discovering that this is Earth is also different than Taylor's. Well, Taylor's was, he exploded with anger and sadness. What I like about Brent's is Brent is very quiet about it. He almost starts hyperventilating as he starts really piecing it together. And you see him shaking. And he never yells, particularly in It's just not Heston. It's just not Heston. Yeah, it needed to be Heston. Right. Story-wise... It's not right. Right. And you didn't get a powerhouse. You Maybe you could save it by getting, which was real world was not going to happen because the budget was cut. You possibly could save this by not having Heston, but you get a bigger star in there. That's the only pie in the sky thing that you could do. And then the script is written around that person and that person is Taylor. Yes. And then you do a Bond thing with it and you just... 
it's a recast, dog. What do you, you know, you cannot recast Heston with a lesser famous, lesser talented actor. So it has to be a different character. And then you have to have Heston in the movie, but he doesn't want to do it. He's only going to be in the end. But also that has a connotation over the movie right off the bat. I think that perhaps could sour an audience is that, oh, the guy that I'm here to see is gone. And I even think we're going through a similar thing now. It's just that we've gone from Andy Serkis to Kevin Durant being the star of Apes. And I do think you miss Andy Serkis in the same way that you miss Heston, for what it's worth. Um, Although I do think different situation, Kingdom is still a very competent movie all the way through. Um, But it is interesting how history repeats. Uh, I wish I could have talked about Ursus more just because that freaking the only good human is a dead human will always I mean that's that's a classic man that is um, that is a classic (laughs) and you know what's funny too a lot of stuff that you see when you type up go ape or planet of the apes I love how yeah a lot of what you see is not from the first movie it's from this movie it's uh yeah like Ursus comes up a lot some, well, this some movie of the... is very full of like images that that will stick with you, and, and I think part of the problem that the first movie has with that is not that it doesn't have images that stick with you; it's actually the opposite. It's that there's one image in that movie that sticks with you more than everything else. Yes, and so I think yeah. people overlook things like the doll and the writing on the floor. And thank you for calling me Taylor because they only remember the Statue of Liberty. This movie, if you remember it, you remember a bunch of things. Oh, I remember a bunch of things. All right. Um, (laughs) Oh, I remember. I love it. You know, as all the shit that I'm bitching about within the first first half of this movie and some of the blaring glaring flaws, the second half is so batshit insane. It's worth the wait. A hundred percent. Yeah, I may be exaggerating with my A plus, but I don't think it's lower than an I don't think it's lower than an A minus at all. Um I, I can't yeah. I love this movie. I well on a technical level, maybe not the best apes movie. It is my favorite one. And you know what? I just I love crazy shit, man. I love crazy movies, and this is one of them. My friend Sean was like, I really did not like Beneath. I hated Beneath. And I'm like, Beneath is bonkers. I love Be- how bonkers Beneath is the is. one, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Oliver, thank you so much for joining. Uh, why don't you pimp yourself out? Uh, where, where can people find yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, other productions and media on YouTube. Uh, check out my documentary series, Oliver the Ricketts, American Genius, where we talk about everything from fast food to a uh, little everyday curiosities uh recently i went on a bike ride and tried every zippy cooler which is a cocktail exclusive to long island at every long island beach bar including gilgo beach which gets a nice little spotlight in there also if you like me talking about movies i am doing a lot of that over on the designing hollywood youtube channel uh where we even talked about one apes film uh rise of the planet of the apes so all that stuff tiktok uh instagram follow me i'm around and uh, I appreciate you. The links for them are, are in the description. All of my social media is in the description below. And make sure to tune in next week for episode three of Go Ape, where we talk about the sequel that could. But we'll see you there, ladies and gentlemen, and take care. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it hard cuts <laughs> to her covered in bubbles with just her head sticking out of the tub. And she goes, soothing. This Very is, wet. This is some of this is some of that progress that Zaius was so scared of. <laughs>well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode three of Go Ape, where we discuss all five of the original Planet of the Apes movies. Well, and today we're going to be talking about Escape from the Planet of the Apes, uh, one that is either beloved by fans or totally reviled joining me once again is my guest oliver the ricketts oliver it's monkey business let's go i just want to start by saying the fact that this movie exists is insane arthur p jacobs got a notice from the heads of 20th century fox after richard zanuck was fired and after this movie was released 
or after Beneath the Planet of the Apes was released, because that had a budget of $2.5 million and made $19 million back. So still a huge hit. He got a notice in the mail that said, and I quote, this is all it said, Apes Live Sequel Required. <laughs> And so he gave was the that task... cut out from magazines? What? I, I I don't know, but that was the telegram he got. And so Arthur P. Jacobs uh, went once again to Paul Dane, the writer of the previous movie. Paul Dane came up with the idea that the apes find Taylor's spaceship, happen to fix it up just before the Earth is destroyed from the previous movie, and that flings them back in time. Naturally, to where. Naturally, of course. So now they're here in 1973 Los Angeles. Uh, I personally think the movie should have taken place in New York, but whatever. I feel like every movie, though, where it's like, oh, they're going back in time and fish out of water thing, always New York City. Well, to, so, me, it makes, to me, it makes more sense why it should have been New York is just because the first movie takes place. Oh, well, yeah, the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty by New York. That's, yep, that's why yep. I, I thought that, but. You already said that you, you enjoyed the movie, but do you think this convoluted plan managed to work? I think this is actually a really inspired turn for this franchise, personally. Mm -hmm. Every beat in this movie does not work. Uh, there There's certainly some things that I would change. Uh, but, but I actually think you get a lot of really cool human drama in this movie from just like, we know where this is going. And we also know how human beings are. Um, so even the concept of Zira and Cornelius being in our time is a little concerning. Uh, and, and they've picked two characters who we've talked about already. We love these characters because yes. these performances are so strong. And I think the movie really, again, it lives or dies with that. They, the performances are as good as ever. And it does the Planet of the Apes thing where a silly, silly concept mm -hmm. becomes very serious and, like, real to you while you're living in this movie. I must say I, I, I agree with you. I, I remember when I was a child watching this movie for the first time uh, and finding out, oh, the apes are just with humans now. Oh, that's going to be boring. It's funny that you say as a child, I've seen this movie before, but like I said in high school, and I just think I'm in a different spot now. I don't really recall a lot about it from before watching this. So as an adult, I'm like, oh, now we're going to the real world. And, you know, my my initial expectation was, am I going to be bored by this? Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't, man. Yes. That is that is the thing where, where I, I asked you at the very beginning, do you think this worked and this convoluted idea worked? And I say 100% yes, it did. Uh, because I, even as a kid, I remember being like, oh, oh, this is funny. Oh, this is cute. Oh, that took a turn. It does get to be all these different flavors that the other two apes movies before this can't. You know what I mean? Because well, there is society that we know set up. There is fish out of water stuff set up. Because you have Zira and Cornelius as the main characters, you also, funny enough, uh, have some romance here. Well, I think that works much to the, to the film's benefit. And uh, that actually is a good segue into one reason why I think this movie works so well. And that is because it was directed by a man by the name Don Taylor who was an actor. He and Paul Dane came together and were sitting down and they quickly realized what this movie is. Don Taylor said, this movie is a romance. It is a love story and love stories are tragic because he didn't really like the idea of directing an apes movie. But once he grasped that, he suddenly decided, I'm going to treat this and give this my all. And I think his direction is what makes the movie work so well in terms of getting all these crazy pieces to kind of work together. Because you're right, this movie is multiple different flavors. It's a comedy at times. It's it's tragedy. Uh, it's a political drama at times. Mm -hmm. It's it's a really it's a hodgepodge of different things. And ironically, I think uh, the the Paul Dane got inspired actually by Pierre Boulle's novel again, just inverted it. You know what's very cool, um, just before we get off the, the topic of it, it being the hodgepodge that it is, 
is that not only do all those themes work together to make something coherent, which, I mean, making a good movie is incredibly difficult. Like, that mm-hmm. that's number one. Making right. a good movie for the third time in a franchise and your budget's been cut twice, that's even more difficult. And we're taking the concept and changing it this much. It's even more incredible that in this hodgepodge, we still have all of the themes that made people like Planet of the Apes. The religious yes. thing is still there. The man versus ape thing is still there. The fear of progress is ever present here. And you know what? Uh, even in through all of that, I don't think it ever loses sight of what we care about as an uh, as an audience, and that is Cornelius and Zira. Right. And it turns into such a good character-driven story. Uh, you literally... I say more so in this movie than any of the other apes movies. You really forget that they're wearing the ape makeup. 100%. And it's funny because when I was watching this back, like on the first movie, I'm like, why don't I recognize these masks more like in my brain? You know what I mean? Right. And the conclusion that I came to in the first movie is, well, it's consistent. It's around all these other things. But I think it works even better when they are not surrounded by other apes and they're surrounded by people. And I'm not sure why that is. I think what really sells me is that one, Kim Hunter and the return of Roddy McDowell as Cornelius, these two just knew how to work that makeup. And right. Unbelievably expressive eyes. Unbelievably and now they're the leads. Eyes. Yes. And they carry the movie. They do an excellent job. To show you just how like into their characters they were, um... There's one scene, the hearing scene, you know, only when she lets me, uh, that, that scene, um, which is such a sweet, like funny I love human thing to say. And I love, I love the concept of the scene being that like, they're more human than we think they are. And as you're watching it, you're like, oh, they're more human than we think they are. Well, you know? I, I, I love that. But during, during that sequence, um, they had shot all of the stuff with them. Right. So mm-hmm. the director said, OK, you guys can start getting out of makeup and they start getting out of makeup. But they were still supposed to be there on the scene so that way they, they could read their lines back to the other actors that are now being filmed, right. the reverse shots, essentially. And they got about halfway through taking off their makeup when suddenly. Both. Kim Hunter and and Roddy McDowell looked at each other and said, stop taking off the makeup. We're still acting. And somehow, without the makeup, I don't feel like my character anymore. That's that- funny, too, when we're talking also about... In the first episode, we talked about how the monkeys and the apes and the chimps all separated because they, they like, went with their tribes in real life when they were making the film. Yes, yeah. It's yeah. wild how into these characters these actors got. Like, how being in that makeup was, like, second skin to them. It became second skin to them, and it's really impressive. It is. I, I think it's no easy feat being in that much makeup and trying to emote, let alone have dialogue and all that crap. And these two just, they make it look easy. Immensely enjoyable movie. I think this is the sequel that could. It shouldn't, but it could. <laughs> uh, it, this movie should not work at all, but it does. You know what's kind of cool is I watched these movies on Hulu this time around. Mm -hmm. Um, and Hulu, once you watch two of the same thing, they catch on like, oh, this guy likes Planet of the Apes. Um, and so when you go to the Hulu homepage, it goes like, here's a movie for comedy fans. Here's one for drama fans. Here's one for sci-fi fans. And every Apes movie is in a different category. Like this one is the drama. Then like one of them is like the comedy. I think it's probably battle. I I think it kind of speaks to all the different flavors that you get within this whole franchise and i think that's one of the coolest things about this movie that i wish franchises today could figure out how to do which is here's a logical continuation of what we've done but we're trying something different here when i talk about spider-man on the channel i talk all the time about how like i I wish they could figure out not every spider-man movie needs to be the same especially the villain movies and they can be different genres, and that's still consistent with what we're doing. That takes a special kind of script, and it's very cool that this movie could do that. 
And I know, like, that's mainly the point that I've brought up, but it's not the only thing that I like about this movie, because this is just a legitimately good movie that you don't need knowledge of the other films to enjoy, in my opinion. It is a good standalone movie. It works on its own. This I mean, could they just make... be a movie about monkeys landing in in present day, and you space don't need monkeys. to know where they're from. Yeah. Yep, space monkeys. I mean, they make offhanded references to Taylor. Mm-hmm. And all of that, but it still works. Well, in in a standalone movie, the monkeys would still have background people from their yeah. life that they would know. It just so happens to be that that's from Planet of the Apes and Beneath the Planet of the Apes. We we talked so much about how crazy that ending of Beneath is. This is equally as crazy as that. Like to to even try this is equally as fucking nuts. You know what I mean? Oh, it's you mean just like the, the movie? The movie itself? The fact yeah that to be like. It? <laughs> yeah, we're going to bring two of the monkeys to 1973 and a lot of the movie is just going to be them in court and them going around town. Who's looking at that and saying, yeah, that'll work. Like all other Planet of the Apes movies, it seems about halfway through this film, it There's takes a, a pretty turn. sharp. Yeah, it takes a pretty sharp right turn. Yep. And it doesn't feel forced either. You know, it's no. it's it's it's, it's uh, the previous film it's jarring how fucking bizarre it gets all of a sudden yeah yeah this which film, admittedly no, is feels... part of the fun i agree i agree this film it's very natural it's very natural because there's already that suspicion beforehand particularly from a character right. named dr hasline which mm. is in itself a twist because if you've been following the plan of the apes movies as it is dr hasline is the guy that sent up the original crew and sent out the rescue mission, so you think he'd be a good guy. He's a scientist, and it turns out he's not. <laughs> he's a piece of shit. Played amazingly by uh, who played him? Uh, he, he always plays a bad guy or a not, uh, and usually a Nazi. Um, Eric Braden. Okay, word. I love Cornelius and Zira. Yeah, and they needed to be good for this film to work, and they're not just good; they're excellent. And right from the get go. I love the sort of the nuanced performances that that they give because those two vets mm-hmm. first come in, Dr. Dixon and Steve something. Because um, she always calls him I like Stevie. the idea that Steve doesn't have a last name. <laughs> but I love it how when they're kind of interrogating her because they don't know that she can speak yet. I love how if you watch in the background, you see Zira approach kind of curiously the two vets. And if you look in the background, if you see what Cornelius does, you see Cornelius get up and he just casually sits closer to her. (laughs) And I'm like, this is brilliant direction because the camera's not focused on that at all, right? It's focused on Zira kind of approaching the two vets. And then you just sort of see it in the background. And I just love the fact that instead of staying back, like a a lesser director would have just had her, had Cornelius sort of sit back, but instead he makes... He made the because you have to know that he had to have direction to do this. Roddy McDowell or Cornelius gets up and just sits closer to Zira, so that way, if something happens to her, he's right there. You talk about recurring themes, like we've talked in this series already about how not romantic and sexy they feel intimate, the two of them. Right. That feels like something that a real married couple would do. I'm married if I see my wife about to get into a situation that I think might get hairy in public. I would do the same thing. It's almost yeah. instinctual, and it's just something that develops when you're in a relationship for that long. Even people who are not in a relationship, I'm sure there are people who feel that about a lot of their friends and loved ones. Right. Uh, it, it's something that's very human nature natural, and maybe that's part of why these characters don't feel like people in rubber masks yes i agree i agree they don't feel like people in rubber masks because of shit like this you've got some amazing comedic timing robert uh ronnie mcdowell has some really good comedic timing i love the the the, you have the army guy right Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they're like what do chimps eat well i heard they like oranges they like fruit and so he starts handing them the fruit and he hands cornelius two And then Cornelius just sort of sits there and keeps watching. And without moving at all, suddenly he just holds his hand out one more time. 
<laughs> like there's three of us. <laughs> and I, I love it. And then it just pans over and suddenly they're setting up plates and knives and everything and just eating them like people. And I'm like, this is funny. Okay, this is funny. Yeah. This movie's gonna be gonna have a little bit more comedy in it than the other two, because fucking A, the last movie certainly had, 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 had a many little of grim. And and the intelligence test sequence. I love it. I love So the- that <laughs> that may be one of my favorite scenes in any apes movie. Well, I love the fact that Zira immediately picks up what they're doing because she's done the same damn thing to humans. She knows immediately what to do. She's totally toying with them. Like, I love it how Dr. Dixon says a line where he goes, well, they can't be morons. And the moment she hears him say that, she looks back and she winks at Cornelius and then (laughs) (laughs) goes back. And I'm like, this is, and I love how Cornelius, it comes to this reverse shot of Cornelius. He just kind of sinks down into his chair and goes, oh no, oh no, (laughs) what is she going to do? One thing that I did mention in, in, in the first one with Cornelius and Zira, and I mention it here again because you just talked about it, the little tiny things where it's mm. not necessarily sexy romantic. It's just you've right. been with somebody a long time. Cornelius and Zira are always touching each other. Yep. They're always touching. From beginning to end, They have they are touching each other in some way. That's a note that I also think current day modern films, not just the apes films, but just blockbusters in general, they need to take notes from things like this. Every major movie that you see right now is completely sexless. And I'm not saying, oh, nobody's fucking. I'm saying (laughs) these people, these people are not interested in human connection based around your sexuality. There's none of that. You I had look that at a Marvel movie. I have that with Star nothing. Wars. Nothing. All those people are friends. Oh, Star Wars, big time. It's so sexless and not in a sexy way. It's just, it's just everyone feels so cold and clinical all the time. Well, yeah, human affection yeah. and like your your desire to be with people right. and be affectionate to people. That's part of what makes us human. So of course, a movie that is so dependent on us buying into that these apes are the next iteration of human, of course they get that right, because that's part of what makes a real-life human being. Right. And I just, blockbusters I just, now got to do that, in, including the new apes movies. I agree. I, I, I agree. And, and what really sold me in terms of they're always touching, if you watch that trial scene that we kind of talked a little bit about earlier, but if you watch them walk in and sit down, they're holding hands. Yeah. Like the like the entire time they they they're reaching out and they're holding hands despite the fact that they are handcuffed and it really sells that these aren't just people playing like they love each other they, they are a married couple they are married right some of the writing in this movie the dialogue is superb it's and it's a very sharp movie the one scene that i I knew I fell in love with this movie during this scene. The president is played by a guy named William Wyndham, who mm-hmm. I know because he played uh, Captain Decker, or Commodore Decker, in uh, an episode of Star Trek, the original series called The Doomsday Machine, which is my favorite episode of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. And he's having this conversation with Dr. Hasline, and literally the concept of this conversation is Hasline is terrified that now that we know that Zira is pregnant, that that's going to breed a whole new race of apes that are going to end up dominating us, which his fears are not unfounded. No, in fact, it's true. It is true. and But I love the dialogue in this scene because it it could have easily have made the president just a one-dimensional character and Hasline a one-dimensional character for that matter. 100%. I love the fact that the president says... A couple of lines. He goes, so you tell me you would be for us sending somebody back in time to kill Hitler? And Hasslein goes, yes. And then the president goes, ah, but would you be okay with killing him while he was still a child and didn't? Is this the first instance of this hypothetical appearing on film, I wonder? It's got to be very close to the beginning because that is the one of the quintessential moral questions, I guess, is one of the most evil human beings to ever live 
but could you kill a child? Yes. Um, and, and, and they're talking about abortion is what they're doing. They're, they want to sure. abort Zira's child, which for a 70s film, holy fuck. Because that was a huge thing at that time. Abortion was really becoming a really hot topic issue the in the big country topic. around this time. Because feminism mm. is kind of a theme in this film. Uh, you know, the previous one was like nuclear war and right. wars that don't need to happen. This one's kind of a kind of feminism because Zira takes front stage on this. The fact that they're forcing her to get an abortion. And I love how the president says something really interesting. So you want me to destroy this baby in the womb so it doesn't destroy us later. And he says my favorite line in the film. He says, Herod tried that and Christ <laughs> survived. And I'm like, God damn, the dialogue in this movie is so good. It's There's so There's also that, good. that theme of religious manipulation mm -hmm. coming into play again. Yes. Um, but now we're seeing it more direct on what how we use it. And you're right. All of this dialogue is very sharp. This movie is much more of a thinker than you would expect from a movie about Three apes getting out of a spaceship after they travel back in time, and now they're in 1976 Los Angeles, even though they're from yeah. several several centuries before, several or, or later. There's one part too, I believe, where Hasline, the president, asks Hasline, "You know, what are you going to do?" And I think Hasline genuinely says, "I don't know." And he yeah. just sits there and thinks. And I'm like, "Ah, oh, this is this is good. No right to be that good." <laughs> uh, that was exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> that scene is preceded by a news anchor getting on and going, monkeys from space, yeah. they're here. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a spaceship manned by monkeys. The humor can come into play and know that the movie is over the top. And then you can have scenes like that, which are, and I keep saying this word, but they're profound. What I love about this is that unlike the previous two films where almost everyone is really one dimensional, just the level of nuance with a lot of these characters, particularly Hasline. Hasline is the villain. He is the villain. Right. No ifs, ands, or buts, but he's got a lot of nuance. And one of them that I like right from the get go in terms of how serious he's taking all of this is that during that trial, during that hearing, everyone's laughing. Everyone's chuckling at some of the answers. The, the, the main judge goes, does the other one talk? And then Cornelius stands up and says, only when she lets me. Only when she lets me. And everyone starts laughing. And Hasline is instead completely floored. And because I love that. Because not only can they talk, they're, they're intelligent. Like they're us. very intelligent. And what I love about that, too, is that for the rest of that hearing, while everyone's kind of laughing and kind of confused, he is the only, he even says the line, too. Uh the judge goes, uh, he's not really a judge, he's the chairman. The chairman goes, oh, that doesn't make any sense. And Hasline goes, it's the only thing that does. There is something that Cornelius says that I find interesting. Cornelius goes, chimps are pacifists. And that's certainly how the movie has played, the, the, the series has played chimps thus far. Especially but them. Yes. When in reality, it would have been the gorillas. The gorillas would have been the pacifists, and the chimps would have been like, "No, we're gonna chimps kill are everybody." Very violent animals, yeah. I love how I love how racist Zira is too. She's like, "It was the gorillas' war, bubbling buffoon gorillas." Not ours, <laughs> not ours. <laughs> I love that Zira takes a turn to become uh, a Long Island mom with her with her grape juice plus. Oh and my her god, racism and her. Well, they don't know what alcohol is, too. That's what I find fascinating, is that the yeah. it's, it's inference here that the apes don't know what alcohol is drink. at all. And so because of that, Hasline knows that and totally gets it's just, It's kind of disturbing how he just he says one line and you laughed at it. You you sent me a message and you're like any movie where a doctor says, hey, it's really good for the drinking is really good for the baby, too. <laughs> He's really good uh, for the baby. <laughs> See, I love that because when you're watching it now in this time, you are thinking, because is it before pregnant women stop drinking and we, we get wise to that? <laughs> or is it like, because uh, not knowing the moral character of Hasline until this scene and knowing that things got a little crazy with pregnant women back then. Oh, uh, yes. You could rip it, rip a heater and have a glass of wine just fine. That's the first scene where we actually get an inkling that Dr. Hasline 
is going he's to be at the, the very true least villain. manipulative he's going to be yeah. the villain is that particular scene because when he finds out she's pregnant he wants to get to the bottom of it and he blatantly lies to her and i love the confrontation that eventually happens with cornelius zira the interrogators and Hasline. and you have cornelius that anger in cornelius begins to show too that that anger bites him in the ass later in the movie just as Zira, Zira's own vices, uh, she tends to be hot-headed, and she'll say stuff. Hence, I loathe bananas, because yep. I loathe yep. bananas. That's the whole thing that kicked all this off. It ends up biting her in the ass later, too. And th- I love how that's all set up. But I love, there's one, Rodney McDowell gives a really good performance. And he slams his fist on the table, and he goes, Man destroys man. Apes do not destroy apes. And that's the difference between your kind and mine. That scene also reveals a huge plot hole within the continuity. Uh huh. How did Cornelius and Zira learn of the secrets learn of the secret scrolls of the sacred scrolls of the apes past? The story of Aldo, which is a great scene. Yeah. It's a great performance. Aldo said no. I love that. It's great. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But that contradicts everything that, that we know we... about about this. <laughs> about about yep. ape society from the past. And that made me go, huh. In the same era, Marvel is publishing uh The Incredible Hulk, and Stan Lee is writing he used to do Stan Soapbox. You would write into the editor right. and he'd write back. And some weeks the Incredible Hulk's name would be Bruce Banner. And some weeks it would be Peter Banner and people would write in and go, I thought his name was Bruce and he'd legitimately write back. And it's crazy to think about now because comic books are all about continuity. Now he'd go, yeah, we forgot. Didn't check. We, we forgot. I think it's Sorry, a lot we'll of, we'll get it next time. I think it's, it's a lot of, we just didn't care because that stuff didn't exist yet. Or like to the level right. of how well, much we, we, also... we scrutinize it. Because remember television, which is the closest thing we can get to this in terms of movies is television mm-hmm. all episodic because people were tuning in right. whenever it had to always reset at the very ending. And you, and you mentioned this in, in, in one of the previous episodes of go ape, you said each movie kind of has it is, it works as its own thing. It kind of works definitive as a definitive ending. ending. And this is no different. And I think yep. that's what, uh, where a lot of that comes from. So personally, I don't have a problem with that because, I mean, look at the freaking Godzilla, the Showa Godzilla movies. They're supposedly all take place in continuity with each other. How? How? But voila, here we go. But it, it, I just don't think they cared. And I think the writer just said this is really good. And it is really good. The dialogue yeah. is great. And Roddy McDowell gives an amazing performance. Ultimately, forget continuity if you have strong material. You know, sure. Why? Yeah. Why should something like the facts? Uh, a little little saying I just picked up in Ireland. Uh, never let the truth get in the way of a good one. The way how they drag Cornelius out of there, and how he's pleading, "Don't take me away from her," and he's crying her name as they shut the door behind him, and I'm like, oh, oh, that's gut wrenching, heartbreaking. It is. It's Terrible. completely heart. It's completely and, heartbreaking. And it's one of those situations that you can see yourself in. You feel the peril because that's most of our greatest fears is not to be dead or to be killed by a gorilla on a horse with a gun. It's being separated from our loved ones in a way that is out of our control. People are so in a completely alien environment. Of control. Yeah. Completely alien environment, and to the extreme in this case. And I love how Zira is is terrified, but I also love how Dr. Lewis is the one that gives her the injection, and that mm. even when she, he is standing beside her, she's a little less scared with him. Yeah. And I love how she goes, I know exactly what this is, because I've done, I've it. done it. Yep. Yes. And I love that. I love that so much. In fact, that entire scene I really like. Oh, she the just... plot device of her being a scientist herself and mm-hmm. having basically done the same thing to the equivalent species in her time uh, really moves along a lot of the tension in this, I-, I find. Because it's not the kind of horror that comes from, like, I don't know what this doctor's doing to me. 
It's the kind of horror that comes from, I know exactly what this is, and I know what will happen to me, and I can't stop it. Right. It turns Dr. Lewis into a better character, too. It gives him a lot of nuance, because after he gives her the drug, he hates what he just did. Mm -hmm. Absolutely hates the fact that he did it, because he's come to care for these two. He could leave. In fact, they say, leave. Right. And he says, no. I'm going to stay. I know I'm saying that a lot, that I love that. But I genuinely no, think that's such a good a good character moment without there being too much character there. It's just him. It's And it's so nuanced, too. And it's not, like, flashy. It's not like it's a huge moment for his character. He just says, no, I am staying. Thank you. I'm here. What's cool is that these have gone from big spectacle blockbuster movies for the time to being little character-driven pieces mm -hmm. at this well, point. Well, 100%. Um, and that's because we're budgeting down, but it is the creativity that comes from being limited. Uh, right. Where you get all of these wonderful moments from these actors and these characters that you wouldn't have in a bigger movie. Speaking of, of the character-driven stuff, did you notice what snaps Zira out of her drugged state? She thinks of Cornelius. She says his name, and that snaps her out. And suddenly she she gives this most pitiful sound. Like, she, she says it yeah. the most pitiful way ever. She just says Cornelius. And I, I'm getting, like, chills thinking about it. I'm like, oh, it's so painful. She's so scared. You you completely forget these are people in eight makeup. It's It's the kind of performance given through this heavy makeup that we don't see actors giving now as themselves. Right. And then it's it's even better because it sort of accumulates in this one scene. That's the escape scene, you know, mm -hmm. um, where they're in. Cornelius realizes what they just did to her. Right. And he slams his fist down on a table and he's and he's fuming. He's livid. And Zira is trying to kind of calm him down as she's laying there. And this is the first time you really see how pregnant she is, too. Mm -hmm. He sits down next to her. After being so angry and so pissed at their situation, at how they treated her, suddenly he looks at her, he picks up her hand, and, and he puts it to his face. And he says very quietly, they treated you like dirt. And what is also cool is that we have not seen Cornelius be very shaken at all. Yeah. Um, throughout this entire franchise. He's pretty level-headed. Out of the two of them, he's the more level-headed one. He's calm, cool, and collected. So we've found something that is a trigger for him, um, and now we know so much more about this character. And mm -hmm. we are sold even further on... These are two people who are in love. This is a love story. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, he doesn't mean to kill that guy either. I think that's a good a good distinction there too. He doesn't, he doesn't, it's like, he doesn't know his own strength. He made a mistake. Yeah. He made, he a, made mistake a mistake and it's even more powerful because we are not accustomed to seeing Cornelius make a lot of mistakes. Right. Right. Well, they make several mistakes and, and it's kind of a theme throughout this almost that they make these little tiny mistakes that add up, but not rage filled mistakes like that. No, not rage. Well, again, it's getting more towards the end mm. is that scene. Right. And right. The first mistake they make is they talk. The second mistake is when Zira almost says, I dissected many humans. Yeah. And she quickly adjusts it. That's what triggers Hasline. That's the one that really comes back to bite them. Because mm -hmm. that's the one that, that gets one. on the tape. And then the last one that really fucks them over is Zira, in order to better hold her child, quote unquote, drops her handbag and leaves it there. And that's how the police and the National Guard and everybody discovers they're somewhere around here. Yeah. And it's all these little things, with the exception of that one big one, that add up and do them in. That ending is so tragic, partially oh because it's, it's not filmed very cinematically at all. And it, I, th I, think, I think that's what makes it work absolutely because it's similar to the the fight that we were talking about between um taylor and um brent what's his name and brent 
it's just savvy. It's Mm -hmm. animal. It's matter of fact. It's this is the cruel nature of this world. This is what happens to people in it. And this is what happens to them. And it's perhaps the saddest death because these two characters are not only at this point characters that we love, but they're kind of a window in to someone with human emotions watching how this world works. They are the most human feeling characters in the entire franchise. I would agree in the entire franchise as well. It's Cornelius. Yeah. Zero. And they are shot down like dogs. They, um, not just them. The baby is too thrown in the water. Well, the Hasline know. shoots the baby three times. Right. Before and, that. And, 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 and unceremoniously murdered. Yes. And also, I, I love how when, when Cornelius shoots Hasline, he's got a mm. squib, right? And there's, yep. there's blood. And it's not a ridiculous amount of blood, but there's enough there that it literally, and I don't know, I think his scream also adds to it too. But when Dr. Hasline is shot, that scream he gives before he falls into the water, it's gut yep. punching. It feels real. There's some of the blood hits the lens of the camera. It was a total accident, but it, like, oh, it hit the lens stuff of the like camera. Oh, I that, man. Oh, it's so good. It's, it was so good. And it really packs a punch. And, and you know what's fucking crazy about the whole thing is you really want to hate Hasline, but he's not fucking wrong. He's not wrong. He's not the... fucking wrong. And he has this speech that he gives that I just love. And it sums up why I think he, his, why he's so dead set on this idea and he goes later is what i'm worried about later we'll do something about per- about pollution later we'll later do something we'll do something about global warming we'll do something about population explosion later we'll do something about nuclear war we act like we have all the time in the world how much time does the world got someone has got to uh, someone has got to somebody has got to start to care and i it's love chilling. that yeah, i love it's that chilling because that cuts to the core of what this movie even is. Sometimes you need to make a hard choice and be proactive about what's happening. And that's kind of like, I guess, what Apes is about, period, is how our hubris and our advancement eventually doomed us. But can you really afford to be afraid of progress? Yeah. I don't know. You know. Well, well, that's the genius of this. Is I love how the movie doesn't answer anything. No. It just, it leads you to think about it. Ultimately, it, it kills Dr. Hasline. His obsession with this to try to, to do the, what he thinks is the right thing, it ultimately kills him That's the end, as well. the end of him. Yeah. Because it is, it is a, a brutal ending, which is really funny, because as gut-punching as the ending is in the previous movie, yeah. this one is so emotional. Absolutely. And so personal. Because there, there's something about... Zira throws the baby overboard so it could drown. Mm. Absolutely sealing the deal. Yep. And we later learn to also hide the fact that she swapped the babies with Armando. That's not hers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it also... It's, it's double protecting her, her, her child, which I think is brilliant. What is her last act? It's to her... crawl to the dead to a dead Cornelius and hold him. And I'm like, God damn it. These <laughs> poor monkeys. Because it, it's a bigger gut punch than the last movie, because the last movie A has the, the crazy factor going for it. it where it's it's, I yeah. I can't believe you did that. And so in some ways, the, the seriousness of that ending is a little lost in that this is so nuts, I have to digest that. There's no humor to be found in this. It's so and sad. And this, the last one is like, well, this is just the course of events. If this happened, this would happen, and then this would happen. Uh, this one is heartbreaking. You're, you're sad. You're, you're desolate, broken over losing these characters. You really are, because now we've also had three movies with them. They've been the only constant. I just wanted to mention Armando, played by Ricardo Montalban, another Star Trek uh, guy. He's so much fun. He is just A-OK with hiding fugitive apes. (laughs) 
<laughs> in, in his circus. He and, and the line is not, so you want not just me, okay with it. He's excited about it. He's excited it. about it. And I love how he's like, so you mean to tell me that you want to hide these fugitive apes with me? Well, I'm here to tell you 1,000% yes. I say less. You son of a bitch, I'm in. You also mentioned the religious factor, too. Armando has a, has a religious thing, too. He gives his necklace to uh, Milo, is what they decide mm -hmm. to name the child, after, after the ape that was with them in the beginning who gets killed. Mm -hmm. By a gorilla in a horrible, horrible, like the worst ape costume I've ever fucking seen. He was the, it was like the emblem of like St. George or something like that. And he was like, he was the saint of to all animals. And the fact that Zira is giving birth to Milo. Gorilla in, Jesus. Well, yeah. And the fact that it's being done, chimpanzee Jesus, and it's being mm -hmm. done in a zoo it's being done almost like a barn you could say yep yeah some some might observe that uh, yeah and i'm like okay this this is okay i like this and it's just it's subtle it's just enough subtle enough that it doesn't hit you in the head yeah also what's cool about the ending here is that i've been talking this whole time about definitive endings and this ending is perhaps the most open-ended we could do a sequel that they did, which is, it's... of course, the baby ape speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but it also totally works as the last thing because essentially this movie is a time loop, right? Yeah. That's the last piece of the time loop. Uh, from here, we know that time marches on and the apes get smart and they take over and this is how it happens. So this is still following that trend of this is the definitive ending of this franchise. This could have been the last frame that ape talking. I'm glad it wasn't because I love conquest, but it easily could have been the last thing. Yeah. And work just fine. Yeah. You know, it would have, it would have been a very definitive ending and worked just fine. And I would have been very happy and content. But at the same it, time, it doesn't close the door in quite the same way that the last one did. Yeah, Paul Dane specifically, I remember this, Paul Dane specifically wrote the ending this way because he knew they were going to call for another sequel if this movie was successful. And sure enough, it was. This movie had a $2 million budget, which is cheaper than the previous film. And mm -hmm. it had it made $12.5 million, million dollars back. So that is still a huge profit. Yeah, especially uh, then. So guess what? We're making more ape movies. Here comes Conquest. It's it's around this time where people started going ape. Like, really going ape. Like, yep. people really are like, these movies, this is a phenomena. Marketing and, bonanza, uh, baby. I would actually, on a technical scale, I do think this is a better movie than Beneath the Planet of the Apes. It's just not my favorite. Beneath is my favorite. But on a technical <laughs> level... This is this is the A if Beneath is an is an A minus, but a, on an enjoyment level, Beneath is the A plus, and this is the A minus. Okay, I I just I understand why people kind of don't like this movie. I I understand because the two the two previous movies are so dark and so dead serious, and that's part of what makes it work. Suddenly you got this movie, and you have ape it's wearing nineteen seventies clothing. You have a Sex in the City montage where they discover this, the town of Los Angeles. I love the fucking scene where Cornelius comes out wearing a suit and tie. And Zira yep. just sort of looks at him googly-eyed. And then all of a sudden, he's sitting in the limo waiting for her to get her thing. And when she comes out, suddenly she throws off her robe, revealing that dress that she's wearing. And I love how you see Cornelius put his hands to his mouth and then open his <laughs> arms. And I'm just like, that is, this is because so corny. right here, corny. <laughs> Cornelius has finally learned the universal truth of the universe, which is women be shopping. Women be shopping. Right. I also love the bubble bath. Yeah. They clearly don't, they don't do that apparently in, in, in ape city because he goes, how is that? The society it, strikes me as a little too harsh for a bubble bath. And all of a sudden, it hard cuts to her, covered in bubbles, with just her head sticking out of the tub. And she goes, soothing. 
this very is, wet. This is some of this is some of that progress that Zayus was so scared of. <laughs> I fucking love what this film. movie. I fucking what love this film. movie. I think I think objectively this is a but this is a much better movie than Beneath. Um, it's very cool that they made this uh, today. This type of movie is never happening. You know no, what I mean? No, it's never happening. It, the, well, I suppose it, I suppose it could, but it would. It just wouldn't pack that level of nuance that we see within it. And it, it certainly it would, would not be a hit. Well, it could be if you make it with a small enough budget. I think that's the key. Yeah, you'd have to a twenty four it. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or Blumhouse it. But yep. it's this is the sequel that could. It shouldn't exist. But here it is. And, yet and here it's it great. Is and largely forgotten, but if if you haven't, you should watch it. Yeah. This is, by the way, the second most popular of the original five films. For this, sure. This movie. Yeah. Yeah. And and I can see why, because it, it's also like a palette change. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like I, I could see apes and beneath kind of blending together but here's a definitive nope this is different yeah well the first two definitely work as a continuation of the other yeah uh warts and all um and this movie definitely it's the beginning of a new chapter and and i like that yeah yeah i like it so (sighs) my god we've only got two more to do oliver only two more only two more, and next we're going to be doing Conquest for the Planet of the Apes, which you have not seen the unrated cut to that movie. No, I have not. I have you... not. Oh. I have to get on it. Um... Shit. I guess if you want to pimp yourself out, because pimp yourself out, now's the time to do it. Let's do it up. Oliver the Ricketts, uh, other productions and media on YouTube. Uh, Oliver the Ricketts on TikTok and Instagram and everywhere else. Uh, find me talking about little interesting curiosities from throughout my daily life including extensive coverage on fruit brute and his monster cereal friends among other topics uh and if you're looking to hear me talk about movies i do a lot of that over on the designing hollywood youtube channel uh subscribe like comment all those things i'm around um i'm a menace well uh, links to where you can subscribe to him and check him out uh, are in the description below along with all of my social media all my social media is indeed in the description below uh, and all I can say is stay tuned for next week where we dive into I would argue overall the darkest ape movie I I don't even think it's an argument I think 100% the darkest most relevant to our time apes film and the most controversial Two, a hundred of the eight movies, and why I fucking adore it. All right, we'll t- talk to you guys. See you next week. We'll go ape once again. Take so care, long, kids. Yeah, this is the only apes film that did not have the same spread of toys. Many of the characters did not get their own figure. <laughs> no coloring books for this one. <laughs> Yeah, I want I want the conquest of the planet of the apes coloring book. Is what yeah, I, I really want. I want that apes head splattering. I want to be able to color the blood well- blue. Well, howdy there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode four of Go Ape, a podcast where we talk about the five original Planet of the Apes films. Today we are talking about conquest for the planet of the apes. Joining me. As per usual, is my good friend Oliver Ricketts. Oliver, say hello. Introduce yourself to the world. Adam, hello. Uh, Go ape, more like let's go deep, because how could you not with this movie? I'm fueling up with uh, a rousing mug of Cha-Cha Tree Frog Rainforest Cafe coffee, because we are uh, talking about animal supremacy here, folks, and... (laughs) What's what's more animal and supreme than coffee made at the Rainforest Cafe? Conquest for the Planet of the Apes is a weird film. I, as I explained earlier, is truly one of my favorite films of all time. Like, of all time. It is, in my humble opinion, a masterpiece. I, don't, I, do, I truly do not understand the criticism that this movie gets that it's just garbage. It's just another ape sequel. How anybody could look at this movie and think of it even even thinking of it on the plane of like this is a sequel to Planet of the Apes feels weird to me because 
it's a departure from Planet of the Apes in a big way because of how angry it feels. Mm -hmm. And it has so much to say that watching it now, it is still just as topical as it was back then. Um, and mm -hmm. while some of the imagery maybe hasn't aged great considering some social things that have developed since then, uh, you can't deny that this this is a really relevant and, and profound movie. This is in definitely... the same way that the first one is. I, I would I would completely agree. The thing though that a lot of people draw a lot of criticism for this movie with, and and I get it because I agree with it to an extent, is that mm -hmm. a lot of the careful veiling of social commentary, like that, like how we geniusly saw it in the first film. It, there is no getting around what this movie is trying to say. And even the events that it's trying to do, trying to depict. I mean, this movie came out in, in this, in 1972, uh, was made in 1971. And this was a very difficult time in the United States. Like a lot of people complain about, you know, what's going on now here in, here in the States and how absolutely divided we are and everything like that. And I'm like, you look at what was going on in the late sixties and early seventies. And it was, bad it was it would be it was a lot more violent i would argue than than even today you had all of these race riots that were going on because because uh, i can't believe it but like the freaking civil rights act only happened in, in 63 64 i mean that's right. insane to me you had the democratic national convention in 1968 which would have been extremely fresh in everyone's mind come come this movie's release and that got bloody there were riots and they, the, the National Guard had to be called in. It was nasty. We all saw it on television, too. And I think that was a part of it was that a lot of that was now the Vietnam War. All of it was now mm -hmm. being put on on television. And it was like this weird mix mash, uh, mix and mesh of like you'd see all of these horrible images on TV. But yet you would listen to what was being played on the radio and you were listening to the Bee Gees. <laughs> you know and and it was it was such a weird time in american history in the 1970s and what was interesting is that this this is in my humble opinion paul dane's masterpiece and it's so interesting because he's british and how he looked at what was going on in america and and wrote this apes movie he realized he had to continue the story from the very ending of escape right that the, the mm -hmm. whole idea that now there's this new ape which and that film's name was Milo, um, and now it's Caesar. This film thus far had the smallest budget of the Planet of the Apes movies, which is insane to me that this movie has a smaller budget than Escape. It is perhaps in a lot of ways, like looking at it, like I, from a practical like filmmaking standpoint, I can look at this and say like this was probably a little cheaper to make. It is the most complete and expensive looking one. And maybe that's technology coming along. Maybe that's because we're like Escape. We're existing in, you know, a modern landscape. So a modern landscape. It takes place in the to build sets. It takes place in the 1990s. The majority of the outdoor scenes were shot in around the University of California, the Irvine campus, mm -hmm. um, which was brand spanking new. So the architecture within the film was very modern, sleek looking. And I think Honestly, gives the film a very unique look. Having them be in buildings, period, yeah, uh, rather than in the jungle and in the desert, does make it look like a more expensive piece. Because even when we talk about battle, and we've moved mm -hmm. somewhat away from that, and I mean, battle has the school bus, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> this looks more expensive. I think a lot of that, though, comes down to the brilliant direction of J. Lee Thompson. J. Lee Thompson is one of the best directors too. Was one of the best directors out there. He was actually slated to direct the original, uh, and he would have done a great job. I don't think it would have mm -hmm. been that radically different of a movie had he been the director behind it. But since it was in production hell, he moved on and was directing other things. He directed one of my favorite westerns of all time, and ironically, one of my favorite giant monster movies of all time, White Buffalo, with Charles Bronson. It's a great film. He also directed his probably his most famous film is uh, Guns of Navarone. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he directed that. What was another film that he made? Directed the original Cape Fear, the one that Martin Scorsese remade. He's a, he was very, a very competent director, very skilled director, and had a really great visual eye for captioning, uh, for capturing action. 
because he went on in his later part of his career he sort of got roped into canon films and made a lot of the death wish movies and right. you know stuff like that which as as ridiculous as those movies are you can't deny that the action in them isn't good and fun uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know the use of lighting in the film i think is is unbelievably expertly done the ape costumes the way how they sort of blend the apes have the color while the while the mm -hmm. humans don't they're all black and gray very fascistic looking very deliberately mm -hmm. so uh the weird lights on the on the computer panels and everything like that which were all stolen from other productions like everything in this sure. movie from the uniforms the uniforms in this film were actually taken from Irwin Allen's his TV show uh Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea which is I love that is the... something that is so cool about Planet of the Apes is how many of the how many things in these films are just them saying well what do we have yes you know yeah. we we like, need to make important sci-fi what is here for us to use? All the chairs, uh, you know, when they're doing the auction scene, all of those mm -hmm. chairs were chairs taken from the spaceship from the first Planet of the Apes movie. <laughs> all of the uh, insignias of the ape control uniforms are insignias taken from uh, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and uh, the time tunnel. Uh, all the equipment and, go and the and ape control that that set with all the computers and everything is all all of that stuff is just stuff taken from uh erwin allen's the time tunnel so well to me that's like that's filmmaking at its finest because I love filmmaking it. is about solving problems and you talk about what's the successor to planet of the apes it's star wars right mm -hmm. i don't think star wars has ever functioned on that level of like brain power uh, especially now because they have infinite money to do whatever yes. they want to whatever do. Whatever they want. You don't. Yes. <laughs> you don't see creative problem solving like that anymore. Well, I did and an that... entire video about this, Oliver. I when I was doing that short-lived show, Stupefied Film History, I did an entire mm -hmm. episode devoted to Conquest for the Planet of the Apes and the production of it. As a filmmaker, as somebody in that world, that is what this is about. That's what we're doing here. We're solving problem and that that's all that directing is that's all that being a member of the crew is and this is a key example of like don't forget this is still a merchandising giant this is still a really important si piece of like film history and it is made on that shoestring budget of people grabbing we have some chairs we have some jumpsuits we can make something here uh, the location i think helps a lot too I, and i also think For the sure. decision if you if you look at the the revolution sequence there's a lot of handheld camera work in that which mm -hmm. back in the back in the late 60s and early 70s was like revolutionary it, it's very deliberately like if you look at like some of the footage of like the the 1968 Democratic National Convention, some of those race riots that were that were going on, Malcolm X and all that and all that crap, the Black Panther movement, almost like shot for shot, they mimic that to to create is, this look. It is interesting because it's not how current day you would choose to film a riot, mm -hmm. but it makes it makes a lot of sense, especially in an era where you were getting just basically raw footage of this stuff beamed into your home on television this is how people of the time are used to seeing a riot mm -hmm. you know if mm -hmm. you were to watch footage of a, a riot in real life it looks like this it doesn't look like a movie it's what it's one of my favorite riot scenes actually is is in this yeah. film i just i just love how it's so simple but yet it's not it's so it, it, that that shaky cam the especially in the unrated cut which we'll get into later it's some of the gore that you see in it and i'm like it just feels so raw and so visceral and that's one reason why i love violence in in movies particularly from the late 60s through about 1975 it's so mm -hmm. raw and so gritty and and in my humble opinion despite the fact that hey this actually technically not as much blood on screen or you know people getting their arms chopped off and things like that it feels worse uh, my I my favorite example feel... of that is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, well, there's a there's a classic. I mean, I I do feel that as technology has moved on and as we've gotten better at things like blood squibs and then CGI blood, mm -hmm. violence in movies has actually gotten a lot worse. Like, and not like oh visceral. The right. quality of violence that you see in movies mm -hmm. is worse because in the '60s and early '70s you had to try for it. There was right. and, and it. 
it feels raw, I guess, by nature of like how much is happening in camera <laughs> and and like how much you're trying to achieve this without the technology to back you. And like you look at the shaky cam too, it's like now we would use probably like an image stabilizer to kind of smooth it out just a little bit. Not completely get rid of the shake, but you know, just to kind of sure. make it a little smoother. Back then they didn't have any of that shit. And because of that, there's some shots in this where the camera is literally going all over the place and you can almost not tell what's on screen. And mm. it's cut so quickly with other shots that you lose track of what's happening in this orgy of violence. And it's very deliberately done. And I think a very deliberate decision by J. Lee Thompson, hey, we don't have this budget to make an epic. This has to be an right. epic but we don't have the budget to make an epic. So what am I going to do? We're going to move the camera in. We're going to make it very uptight, up close, personal. And that's going to make up for our lack of hundreds Funny of Funny enough, thinking about Planet of the Apes, he also did what Matt Reeves does years later when he's directing Cloverfield. In some um, ways, yeah. This isn't a found you know, footage movie, that... but... Yeah. Sure, but Cloverfield is a found footage movie because the budget isn't there. Right. You know? And it, and it is that, like, close shake. This is going to be off-putting to you because your brain is going to try to, to handle this. I discovered one reason why this movie had such a radically kind of, like, different visual feel to the other Planet of the Apes movies, even the one that came after this. And that's because this was shot, one of, like, two movies I can name, that was shot with a process called Todd AO35. Now, Todd AO was a film processing company uh, they made cameras and stuff like that that specialized in 70 millimeter film cleopatra was shot in this tons of movies was shot in todd ao and what was great about todd ao is that it was a widescreen process where you didn't have to use anamorphic lenses you just could use a regular mm -hmm. spherical lens and you had a national uh, a natural aspect ratio of roughly two to zero to one well come the late 60s and through the 70s 70 millimeter was kind of going out the window and Panavision was really taking over the scene in terms of processing and, and, and Technicolor and Deluxe and all of them. So to kind of compete with that, Todd A.O. made this 35 millimeter process and they said, let's use it on this film as an experiment. It is an unbelievably rich movie. It looks fantastic. In fact, this is my favorite looking out of all the Planet of the Apes movies. And I think it was I think it was just because it was it's the only one of the Apes films shot in this process in a different process outside of Panavision regular 35 millimeter film. It was this one. Sure. What it has going for it too is if you're not somebody who is interested in films because of how it's made, but you are a really big science fiction person. Mm -hmm. Um this is deep sci-fi. This is the social message this is five seconds in the future. Um, you know, it, you can't get more thought provoking science fiction than something like this because all of the motives are so human. Unfortunately, these are things that we see in history over and over again with human beings. And it's actually not that much of a stretch to have a movie like this where this happens. Right. Um, it just wouldn't be monkeys. Yeah, it just wouldn't be. Exactly. Which is all a part of the theme of this, is a, a repeat and cycle of violence, which seems to be a continuing sort of theme throughout the Planet of the Apes movies, is because of escape. The, time, the, the timeline has now changed. Aldo isn't going to be a thing. It is now Caesar. Caesar mm -hmm. is going to lead this, and it happens now. They had to... Caesar is now leading the apes. The apes have now started a revolution. Humanity is still going to blow themselves up. And it's just yep. going to be another loop. What's so cool about Planet of the Apes is like, no matter what, we mm -hmm. always go back. And even the new films, we go back to that ultimate certainty. That bomb is going off in Beneath. Yeah. No matter what, across the yep. board. And Every it's not the apes. It's, it's people who made the bomb. Yes. Well, that's what's, that's what's fascinating about that. And that's one of the, the elements of the film as well. Would the apes do any better? And the film at least one cut of the film blatantly says, no, it's just going to be the same horse shit over again. The film is dark to reflect that. Now this whole thing though, the whole idea that, okay, now Caesar is going to this 18 year old chimp is now going to lead this revolution uh, to overthrow humanity, essentially not overthrow humanity, just overthrow the city to begin mm. a bigger picture. 
Well, it's it's reminiscent of of say a Che Guevara, uh, a a teenage time. rebellion leader. Big time. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And and uh, a lot of people complain about this movie, including me. Is that the premise of this movie is absolutely ridiculous? How did the apes evolve this rapidly in twenty years? You know, right? Uh, they explained that um, just like in the other timeline, one of our ships that went to outer space came back, brought a virus that wiped out all, basically all the dogs and cats in the world are dead. Mm. Uh, which in of itself is ridiculous, but whatever. That's some good science fiction pulp. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, you're right. It's just ridiculous. And so we wanted companions. So we started talking with apes. And then suddenly <laughs> we realized that the apes were smarter also, than dogs and cats. That is such a strange thing just because a monkey can rip you to shreds. Yes. A, a dog, maybe a dog, but depending on the size... A dog or a cat, you know, what happened to rats? Let's get a pet rat. I know, How about right? a lizard, man? A ferret, you know? Yeah. Not an ape? Uh, I've, I've been told uh, by my landlord that ferrets are the new dog. Bold claim. Um, seems like they would have been a good substitute. We discover as we go along that what has happened is that we figured out pretty quickly that these guys are a lot smarter than dogs and cats, and we can treat we can not just teach them tricks. We can teach them how to do things. And so rapidly they become slaves, essentially. And we start seeing the same class structure we saw within the first Planet of the Apes movie. So gorillas do a lot of the heavy lifting. They do a lot of the grunt work. The chimps tend to do more. You see them work in a, in a barber shop. You see them working in restaurants you kind of see them they are precise workers yes and then we see the orangutans which ironically there's only like five orangutans in this entire movie it's mainly chimps and gorillas in the film but you see the orangutans what are they doing they're working in libraries they're 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 working they're doing the bureaucratic grunt work (laughs) this is the thing about science fiction though and i said this in our in our first recap but a lot of good science fiction is just, okay, we're going to stretch the envelope a little bit. Please get on board with me so I can show you what would happen if we did this. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is ultimately what, what this is. Can you buy that this happened in 20 years? Probably not. But if you do, then let me tell you what would really happen if this were the case. No, it's not. It's not just that, and I think that's that's the thing that makes this movie so good, in my opinion, is how quickly I forget that giant logic leap. I think it speaks to the actors, the directing, and the writing that you. I I forgot about it within the first ten minutes of this movie. I was on board. I I was I forgot on board about with it this until journey. just now. Roddy McDowell comes back as Caesar. Mm-hmm. Here's a 40-something-year-old man playing an 18-year-old chimpanzee, and it works. I argue, and I've gotten laughed, I've gotten laughed at for saying this, and, but I mean it. I think this is Roddy McDowell's greatest performance in anything he's ever done. Anything he's ever done. He's been in a lot of movies. Well, He's given a lot of good is... performances in movies, but his performance in this film, it, he has to go through every emotion under the sun. In one scene, he goes through every emotion under the sun rapidly, and then, and then, it's an unbelievably physically demanding film. Caesar's jumping around, running all over the mm-hmm. place in this movie, and it's so interesting how he gets to play his own offspring. You know, how he played Cornelius right. in the previous right. films. How he was able to take some of what Cornelius was, put it into this film, and yet make a totally new character just using Cornelius as kind of like a backdrop to his own, to, to Caesar. I do think that they play with the Cornelius thing quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, because, because there are multiple times when you could look at Caesar and say, like, in, undisputably villain by the end. Which which is would be detrimental to to the film because you do want us to understand why we're having a rebellion and that these people have been mistreated. We love uh, Cornelius and Zira. That if you're a fan of this franchise, you love them. 
Mm-hmm. And there are moments, even when Caesar is at his most violent, and especially at the end when he gives the speech, he looks at the camera for a second. You're looking at Cornelius, you know, a, a, the same way that you would a real life person's son. Right. And I think often they also pair him with an ape that looks like Zira because they know about that fondness that we have for them, bringing that back to humanity. Every everything is connected to something else. It's a loop. It's a very interesting, cool fucking thing. It is. Um, and thinking about, you know, th- this being one of the great performances I think where we are in cinema now, and I'm including the later Apes films, Caesar is one of the most important characters in science fiction. And yes, a big part of that is thanks to Andy Serkis and his take on the same character. Which is an awesome take, by the way. Incredible. Yeah. That, to me, like, that character feels real. But do we even get that if this is not the movie that they go back to to remake for rise of the planet of the apes, which is, Uh, which is true. You brought something up there. That's really important. Rise of the planet of the apes is, is a spiritual remake of this movie. Correct. Every performance in this movie is good. Even, even the bad guy, uh, governor Breck, he gives some really chilling performances in this. You also have, um, Culp who is the head of ape security, I believe. And just mm-hmm. how cold he says everything. Every line that that man says in this film is is cold. And arguably, I think he's the best part of the next movie, too. But every every line he says is so cold, so calculated, very Nazi, dare I say. Yeah. Because, because what, was, what was so scary about the Nazis is how they did all of these horrible atrocities, all these horrible things, and did it with such a cold, bureaucratic, calculated ruthlessness. Almost scientific. Yeah. Like I love I love the part where where Caesar, you know, hides with the orangutans in that cage so that way they can, you know, bring him in and bring him into the system so he can sort of hide amongst his own kind. The the best way to hide yourself is to hide right out in the open kind of deal. And mm-hmm. I love how they realize so we've discovered a problem uh with our records. Uh, we had a shipment from Borneo come in where they had three, uh, three or four male orangutans and one male chimpanzee. Yeah, what's the problem? There are no chimpanzees in Borneo. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. Let's break down what actually happens in this film. So we jump 20 years in the future, roughly 20 years, because I believe Caesar mm-hmm. is either he's either 18 or 21 years old when this movie. In, in in terms of the film itself. We have Armando play, played by Ricardo Montalban. He gives a fantastic performance in this too. Right? He's sort of he's sort of like that last bit of humanity in Caesar is right. with is with Armando. And what they end up having to do with Armando in the end. How Armando dies is awful <laughs> well in a lot of ways it does remind me of a, a pa kent to a superman right mm-hmm. where those the superman was an alien with all this great power and he lands and he happens to be picked up by a kind compassionate person mm-hmm. and a lot of the alternative takes on superman say a homelander or a bright burn explore the idea of like well what if you didn't have that human concept to instill a good person in you right um but better yet this is almost asking what if that humanity got snatched away violently you know Mm -hmm. how does that shape the person that you are and how you use your power but the only reason why they go to the city is because armando wants to promote the circus which apparently is a dying thing it just died, which in itself is dangerous. And then all of the stuff happens because Caesar, being the young teenager he is, mm-hmm. lets a bit of emotion out. And he screams during, the, during that scene where this poor chimpanzee, exhausted, is sitting down on a curb with all these books and everything in his arms. And the ape control is like, you have to go. You have to move. And he can't move. And so he ends up kind of lashing out a little bit. They, they tase him. And then they eject him with something. 
we don't know what it is, but they inject him with it and then wrap him up in, in chains. And Caesar shouts, you lousy human bastards, which is such a corny line to say out loud, but in context with the movie, it works brilliantly. Uh, it is chilling because there's, and we even see Armando have a hard time. It's phrased in a way that you cannot walk it back. Yes. Why would a human being say that? Armando puts up a good fight on it. I do I do like it because it, it is plausible that Armando would shout something like that. Sure. Um knowing knowing his character and everything like that, but what he does for Caesar, he loves Caesar. He loves him. That as Caesar has grown up, Armando almost looks at Caesar, dare I say, like a son. Of course. And I love that. I love that because clearly Caesar Caesar doesn't know who his dad is. He he knows of the story, but he doesn't mm. know who his dad is. He doesn't know who his mom is. He just has Armando. And Armando has made Caesar who he is thus far. That is violently ripped away from him. I love how terrified Caesar is during during those entire scenes. I love the fact that you see Caesar crying mm-hmm. and and groveling and and desperately clinging to Armando during those sequences. It's a great performance. You, uh, If somebody told me that that actor was 40 years old, I never would have been convinced. He's acting like a kid that age would. And that's part of what makes this performance so incredible. Um, I mean, and also I find grief and loss are not emotions that I think a lot of actors can accurately portray. Mm-hmm. It is very easy to go either way too over the top or to understate it too much. Um, but this feels real. Oh my god. The scene the scene where he Caesar hears just hears oh, he overhears which is a whole huge layer of this is that he can hear and understand everyone and everything but he can't say a word. I have no mouth but I must scream. Caesar just happens to overhear that that crazy monkey man jumped out of a window and Caesar quickly realizes that oh my god, it's Armando. And you have Lisa, who is the the, fe- the love interest in this movie. Um, she just puts a hand, again, kind of a parallel back to Zira, a slight hand over his, and he just pets it. A very Cornelius thing. He just pets it and then goes mm-hmm. off. And he looks at one of the signs that he puts up. And I swear to God, I teared up in this scene. The performance that Roddy McDowell gives is so powerful so good you see him just cry he's got tears streaming down his face and you see him like shaking and then as it goes on it suddenly changes to it slowly morphs itself into pure unadulterated rage and you see it slowly change and he screams to the top of his lungs in anger and then quickly he has to bite down on his hand because that's a human thing. Apes don't do that. Mm-hmm. And he has to remember that. He has to ring himself back in. And then he runs off. And from that point forward, that's the, that's the point of no return for Caesar right there. He's seen all of these atrocities and everything like the, uh, the ape control sequence where they're doing the training training yep. of the apes that's rough yep. i mean it's it's hard you're shooting flamethrowers at the gorillas oh it, God's it's, sake. it's actually incredibly difficult to watch and you hear them shouting no over that's a consistent thing throughout this thing is is humans no. shouting no yeah uh which is well, huge. Per, perhaps the most important words in this entire franchise yeah you know what i think you're right no that is what yeah, kickstarted no. all of it. Yeah. It it is for sure what kickstarted all of it and it is a recurring thread even as the franchise goes on now. Mhm. Well th- that whole ape control sequence is genius because it establishes several things that come up later within the movie. It establishes central control, right? This is mm-hmm. this is where the seat of power is. This is where all the apes are. This is where the training happens. Uh, it also establishes that machine that they use to torture apes. And then it also establishes just how horrific and clinical like the, the, the breeding is of this. You know, it's, it be, and it's interesting because we look at these are animals. We do this to animals in our society. We still do. We breed dogs. We breed cats. We breed cows. We breed everything, right? For sure. It, but, but suddenly we're seeing this through the point of view of Caesar, 
well, suddenly you have an, an intelligent, cognizant thing mm-hmm. undergoing what we do every day to animals. Yes, yes. And and there's that part where Caesar gets thrown into into that cage, essentially, with I think it was three or four other male chimps. And he gets handed a single banana. Instead, and this is the genius of it, instead of everyone fighting over this banana, which I think is what the humans were expecting, Caesar splits it into four chunks so they all have something. And Mm -hmm. and I said this to you off camera, but it is those chimps in that cage with him that because of this act become like his lieutenants when the revolution (laughs) begins. They are the ones that sort of lead the other sections of this riot. Mm-hmm. And because it can't just be Caesar. So so you see like some of them will attack around the flank or start attacking the the riot the, the riot control and the flank and stuff like that. Those those are led by these chimps. And I'm like, that's something I did not notice until this most recent viewing of the film. And I'm like, that's awesome. It's one of those things, it's always incredible when a movie is layered enough that you get a detail like that mm-hmm. that much later on. But it, but I suppose that is like studying a, a real life event in many ways. Yeah. Because what is history is just breaking down the details of like, well, why did this happen? And who are these people? And how is this connected to that? Right. Um, and so a realistic retelling of, of a riot or a big social change would have elements like that. Although my favorite sequel is Beneath, I think this is the most emotionally dense one. Um, yes. And the most layered, especially with the real world context. Um, but also just in, in a performance of like taking a character from one point to another. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is, this is it. I have the note right here. The first ape to be shot by the army is the ape that burned down the restaurant. Yeah, and another one was was with Caesar in ape control. That was it. Oh. That was it. Because you have that ape that works in a restaurant that was like stealing knives. And yep. it, that he would just steal a knife here and there and then bring it to Caesar and stuff like that. He was the first ape to be shot in this whole thing. And Caesar sees that, and that's what gets him angry. Because he knows those guys. Yes, he knows these guys, yeah. It's just, uh, it's it's so... What I think is one of the most brilliant casting decisions ever is you have McDonald, who is an African-American, and he becomes not necessarily the voice of humanity, but the voice of reason throughout this whole well, thing. Well, one of the most difficult things in the movie to watch in a real-world context is McDonald telling Caesar, as a former slave, yes, consider, consider this. Um... This has happened to my people as well. Do you think this is this violence is the answer? And it or makes him, can you see how history is repeating right now and it can repeat again? It makes him the perfect arbiter of this whole thing, too. Because he's lived on both sides. Yes. And it, there's that great scene where he's obviously... I wouldn't say he's on the ape's side. He's on Caesar's side. For a while, mm-hmm. but he's certainly more sympathetic to the apes, and that's probably why he knows his history because he's a smart man. The whole reason why Breck is the way he is is because he he has a suspicious feeling that Caesar is out there somewhere throughout the entire thing. It's one reason why ape security is the way it is, but right. because they know what the future is going to be, so therefore we need to crack down on anything the apes do immediately. Immediately, because history is repeating itself again. It's the whole circle, and of yet themes stopping in it. history, stopping what's going to happen, is only going to ensure that it happens. It, that it happens again. Yeah, yeah. It's you it's, can't fight uh, your destiny. It's so good. It's so good. But and Mc- something that is discussed at the end with, with this idea of you can't fight your destiny when Caesar says, "If God wills for man to be submissive to ape." then that's what will happen. The part where, where Breck orders, they find out that Caesar Caesar is that ape. Mm-hmm. Which is so genius that he was hiding right under their noses the whole time. That's so genius that he would hide there. You know, it, I, I love that. McDonald is, is giving Caesar over to be terminated, essentially, right? And he doesn't want to. 
And he looks down at Caesar, who can understand everything that McDonald says, but McDonald doesn't know it's him yet. Mm -hmm. He says to Caesar, like you would talk to a dog, you know, how we, we often talk to our dogs, where he just goes, I wish you could understand that I... And he cuts himself off, and he's full of emotion. But the camera lingers on Caesar. And you see in Caesar's eyes, again, this is why acting with eyes is important. It's almost hard to explain because it's so brilliant. The acting is so good in that. Caesar closes his eyes, takes in a deep breath, and says, I understand Mr. McDonald. And you realize in that moment the reason why Caesar looked so afraid, closed his eyes, and took in that deep inhale, that this is the biggest risk Caesar has ever taken in his life, is saying that line. I understand Mr. McDonald. And it's, I get chills. I get chills. I'm getting chills just recalling the scene in my head. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just a good line. The entire sequence is full of some amazing dialogue. The only means left to us, revolution. But it's doomed to failure, maybe. But it's doomed to failure. Caesar says, maybe. And then he was like, but you'll keep trying, and the next, and the next, and we'll keep trying. And then it, it ends with Caesar going, you of all people should understand that we cannot be free until we have power. Now we go back to cycle of violence. You'll keep trying. Mm. You'll keep trying. Yeah, it will. you'll fail this time, maybe, and the next, perhaps. But we'll keep trying. You of all people should understand that we cannot be free until we have power. That's the, that's the chain of lines. It's so, so good. <laughs> and so real world relevant. Yeah. This does not have to be a monkey. No, it doesn't need to be a monkey. <laughs> and, and, oh, uh, that whole sequence too, where Caesar is tortured. They, they well, that him. is that is chilling. That oh. is the most human that this character gets because we can all identify with pain. Yeah, physical pain. Well, uh, Caesar that is, is a difficult screaming. sequence. He is screaming bloody murder writhing. in that sequence, and he's writhing, and his entire back is arching off of the table. And I remember, I when I had this on, I was at home. Like the first day I watched this, or one day I was watching this, and my mother was on the computer, and I remember that scene played, and my mother said, "Adam, turn that off," because she this was just, too she much. couldn't. It was too much, and I'm like, "No, I want to keep watching. <laughs> I want to see what happens." And I love. I uh, it's 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 hard, and and again, unbelievably physically demanding on Roddy McDowell, and he pulls it off expertly. Oh, you can because you can totally buy that that person that ape. I should say, is going through excruciating pain. And I love how they don't try to make Caesar higher than thou in that sequence right. as well, because he does cave. He does, he right. says, have pity. It is a little ridiculous, though. I, I'm not going to lie, because this movie does have ridiculous moments in but it that make me go, huh? For, for all of the ridiculousness, we must remember that this is a franchise where gorillas... <laughs> take over the entire universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. And ride horses with guns. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and so we next... must accept the silliness to to understand the nuance. Right, right. McDonald saves Caesar, and Caesar realizes that he has because he, sh- he cuts off all the power to that mm-hmm. machine. And so Caesar pretends that he's being killed at the last second and that he dies. It is a little ridiculous that one... They didn't bother to check the dials on the machine to realize that they weren't going up. It's a little ridiculous <laughs> on, that, on that. Well, couldn't and then, that be an act of hubris, though? The other thing that drives me insane is they don't feel the ape's pulse to make sure he's dead. This goes back to Walter White getting found out because he left a book of poems that had his name Heisenberg in it in his bathroom for anyone well, to see thing- while still putting rice in it in an electrical outlet. This is hubris and thinking that the job is done. I don't. I don't think. I don't think so. I think this uh, that example in, in in Breaking Bad. I think is a genuine example of great writing. You know, very mm. 
very thoughtful, put together writing. While I think in Conquest for the Planet of the Apes, they just needed an escape. It's <laughs> they, this is just this is a plot, a, a plot device really quick, so that way they could get to the revolution. I love the relationship and how it evolves between Cornel- uh, Cornelius, uh, freaking um, Caesar and, and Lisa. I love how the whole rebellion starts. It happens too quickly in the movie. I, I will give the critics that. It's way too quick. This yeah. movie could have benefited from another 15 minutes of For just sure. building to the revolution. Especially because of the dark, tense place where it goes. Yes, yeah. The longer that you hold this in that, the more that that's going to hit. I love, I love Caesar gathering all of the apes, bringing to him all of the... The machine, him teaching them how to use a blowtorch, and I love, I love how they're handing him axes and they're handing him meat cleavers. And so, which first off, just the image of the meat cleaver is enough to, yep, ugh, make you go oh, chills. God. But it's 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 very effective. I love the the whole the montage where suddenly it'll be an ape doing something. The ape will look over, and the camera will like pan over, and you'll just see Caesar watching them, and that tells them, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do this little act of defiance. And it just mm-hmm. starts off with these little acts of defiances. I'm going to drop these books all over the place. Uh, you know what? I'm going to mess up this guy's shoe. <laughs> Instead of shining it, I'm going to make it all, I'm going to cover it, cover a sock and soot and everything. And eventually it leads to a restaurant being burned down. It's, a, it's an escalation of sure. the whole, of, of violence. And I, it, it, again, it's, it's, I love the editing. The editor in me loves the editing of that. I love it how it'll, it'll cut to a close-up of Caesar just watching them. And you see in his eyes, oh, the anger in his eyes. The, the act, the, what Roddy McDowell is able to do with just his eyes is phenomenal. <laughs> well, fact- in a way, that still goes back to that is the heart of this franchise, is that there are people behind that makeup feeling yeah. all of these emotions. Oh, yeah, yeah. If only that was about 15 minutes longer and we really got to see. I don't care if it was even like over the span of like two or three months mm-hmm. or so, you know. It Not- fails almost in the same way that a movie like The Dark Knight Rises has one Achilles heel, which is that we needed 15 more minutes of Batman trying to get out of this hole. We needed 15 more mm-hmm. minutes building up to this rebellion. Yes. Because then that that place where you get at the end, this... I don't want to call it an emotional catharsis, but in a lot of ways, that is what it is. Uh, you feel that. When the revolution begins, it is uh, almost, uh, and I said it at the beginning of this of this, this podcast, orgy-esque levels of violence. Yeah, awesome. exploited <laughs> levels of violence. <laughs> it is awesome. And I might add, remember the basis of this franchise is, isn't it cool when monkeys have guns? And you know what? Even when it is this serious and this violent, it is still cool when monkeys have guns. Well, there's there's a lot of... Uh, I love it because what'll happen... What happens early on within the violence is, is genius. And J. Lee Thompson is genius at doing this. He did this a lot in The Guns of Navarone. Where there'll suddenly be an explosion of violence. And then it'll go dead silent for a while. Yep. And that in that dead silence, there is a fuck ton of tension there. And uh, the the scene that comes to my mind is they sort of beat up some of the some of the riot control people and they call in the army, and you have the 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 pe- the army sort of lining up, right? And they line up in that street. And you go, they've got the riot gear ready to go and their guns are ready, and the camera just lingers on them listening. It's it, there's almost no sound coming from the speakers at all, and then the apes show up, and even when mm-hmm. the apes show up. It's dead quiet as the apes are slowly getting towards them. And all the only thing that you hear throughout the whole thing is a guy over the megaphone shouting, no. And I'm like, this repetitively. is repetitively. Yes. Yep. And I'm like, this is good. This is good. I love the fact that it's all dimly lit at night. You know, at the, when, a, when a gun fires, you see the muzzle flash and it'll yep. illuminate the apes for like a little bit. And and it just sort of adds to the chaos of the whole thing. You've got flares being shot, uh, gas canisters going off. You have apes being beaten up with with riot batons. You have apes being shot. You have uh, you have humans being shot in the whole thing. You have humans being beat to death uh, with bats and everything like that. You have them getting cut and sliced with knives and everything like that. 
And I'm like, this is an orgy of violence. This is what a revolution is. A revolution is not a, the American revolution was like an exception. <laughs> Revolutions <laughs> are like nasty. Vi- they, they are, are not act- carefully organized battles. They are. And this is, it's ironically from a communist, but Mao Zedong said a great thing. A revolution, uh, it isn't, <laughs> it isn't men sitting around in, in rooms discussing politics and discussing philosophy. A revolution is an act of violence. I can tell that's what this movie, that movie probably even took that quote and it was like, no, we're going to run with that. Even even in a theatrical cut, it's unbelievably, it's unbelievably violent. Uh, and it all leads to Caesar storming ape control as Caesar is using a blowtorch to, to open the, to open the doors. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I love how they're like, how does he lo- how does he know how to do this? <laughs> and everything. And and Breck says a line that I I, I generally like. Like it, it it's so over the top, but it works in the in the confines of the film. He goes, This will be the end. What happens here today will echo throughout the entire world. And those who are left will be the weakest humans of all. This will be the end of human civilization as we know it, and the world will belong to a planet of apes. Yep. And then, as soon as he finishes that, the door is kicked open, and Caesar comes running in to ape control with an M16 in his hand and shoots. It's monkey everybody. time, baby. That's it. <laughs> now in the you've had your cut, time. We're gonna hunt you for sport now. In the unrated cut, Oliver, in that scene, it's even. It's a lot worse. Uh, in 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 that scene, um, it happens in in the theatrical cut. I believe this happens. The apes within ape control start saying, "You know what? We're going to join them. We're going to start rebelling." And so they start rebelling. And Breck gives the order to shoot them, shoot them all, and he screams it. And they do. They get shot in the unrated version. They they don't just get shot, Oliver. You see them. You see one of them get shot in the head, and blood go everywhere. They are viscerally getting, murdered. They are murdered. And and at one point, one of them is just wounded. Breck takes a pistol, walks up to that ape, and shoots him right in the head. Which we must acknowledge is wild for a franchise of movies that is making most of its money mm-hmm. by selling toys. Yes. Yes. This is the only Apes film that did not have the same spread of toys. Many of the characters did not get their own figure. No <laughs> coloring books for this one. <laughs> yeah, I want I want the Conquest of the Planet of the Apes coloring book is what yeah, I, I want really that want. Apes head splattering. I want to be able to color the blood well, blue. I think I think this is a good time to actually really talk about the unrated cut because mm. it really comes out. It's the same movie essentially up until this point. When the when right. the when the revolution begins, it almost becomes a different movie. You can see an abrupt tonal shift at the end of the theatrical cut. Yes. Because it yep. is dour, it is depressing, it is violent, and then we end on this very uplifting speech almost within the next breath of Caesar's peak of villainy. During the test screenings of Conquest for the Planet of the Apes, it became rather apparent that they went a little too dark. For the record, Paul Dane and J. Lee Thompson and everyone in this film, I don't know how they thought this, but they genuinely did. They thought they were just making another G-rated movie. I don't think they realized until they were looking at the post-production of this film that, oh shit, we did a little bit too good of a job. (laughs) <laughs> and and uh be- because you know parents were taking their children out of the test out of the theaters because it was too violent and then just to add insult to injury the MPAA said we're giving this an X certificate which would have ultimately i think been better for the longevity of this film me too <laughs> but financially and commercially what a disaster it would be a total disaster and especially in 1972 20th century fox needed this money and so suddenly they're like, shit, shit. Well, we can't go back and reshoot anything. We don't have the money to go back and reshoot anything. So what they did was Paul Dane quickly said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll bring Roddy McDowell in to, sh- to record audio of a new speech, change the ending to make it a little more hopeful, a little more peaceful, 
and we'll go through the action portions of this movie and cut out some of the more violent elements of the film. And this cut, the theatrical cut, with the second speech of Caesar saying, and now we've seen the birth of the planet of the apes, which is a great line, that is the version I grew up on. That is the version that almost everybody grew up on. That was the theatrical cut of the movie. That's what was that what was readily was available. That was the movie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I understand the idea of that second speech because what it does is it sort of affirms that the apes will be better. We are going to make this different. This won't repeat itself. We are going to be better. It also lays the char- the groundwork for what the character becomes later. In because, battle, especially. Yeah. Yes. It ends the movie with Caesar being more of a, a just leader type mm-hmm. of figure. Less of a Che Guevara. Um, I don't want to say Jesus, but, you know. The, well, there's the messiah elements savior. to this. This, I mean, the, you sure. look at the character arc. It, it's a messiah character arc it's it's, there's stuff of that in there and uh it goes along with the religious aspects too that we saw throughout the other films and stuff as well but the original cut which is the unrated cut and i didn't know this thing existed but it was never released on vhs it was never released on anything but lo and behold oliver the 40th anniversary blu-rays come out i pop in the one for conquest and suddenly, mm-hmm. the first menu that pops up, it says, do you want to watch the unrated cut or the theatrical cut? Notice how the theatrical <laughs> cut is second. And I'm like, what is this? What is this? What a find. And I, I watched the unrated cut and was blown away how much more effective the unrated cut is. It just shows you how different the ending is. It, it, the big difference is the ending. And there's, a, there's more violence and bloodshed. Well, an ending of a arguably, film changes uh, what a film is. Arguably, a lot more bloodshed. <laughs> I didn't realize, Oliver, how much bloodshed was in that until I watched the theatrical cut of the movie and then watched the, the unrated cut just to kind of compare them back and forth. And I actually, I made notes here of that. But the big, if you listen to the music cues in the theatrical cut, they're quite bombastic. Uh, who did the music for this? Song? Well, I think the, the Tom score Scott. of all the Apes films is very good. Um, Tom Scott's is very good. His score for this is very good. Very minimalistic, very bombastic, a lot of heavy drum, use of drums and stuff like that, especially during the the revolution sequence. Very tribal almost. Yeah, yeah. And in the theatrical cut, that drum music is what plays a lot throughout the, the revolution. In the unrated cut, it's almost just like this unnerving drone that plays throughout the yeah. entire thing like it, it is unbelievably un- it's it's very unnerving i mentioned one of the ones before uh breck shooting one of the apes just point blank in the head and you seeing it and well, i mean i mean that is, i mean that is alarming for the time and uh, oliver i'm not kidding you see the ape's face on like a <laughs> with blood that's something that we can do on television now you couldn't do it back then in a and movie then- yeah, yeah. The other thing, too, is you, you see a lot more apes being shot. You, it's a lot more squibs of apes being mm-hmm. shot and stuff like that. You're seeing it. Uh, there's one that I, I really noticed where suddenly, like, a human gets thrown in the foreground and then a gun goes off and you blatantly see a guy get shot in the head and his blood go all over the wall in the background. Wow. In, in the background and so and it was just something in the background there's one where a human gets thrown through the glass and you just suddenly see him land and there's blood everywhere all over the glass all over him but there's two parts where I also noticed it a lot as well uh, before they storm ape control they build a fire the apes build this huge bonfire and are like throwing wood and and desks and chairs and anything they can find on this fire just to make it bigger in the theatrical cut, you see them stacking a couple of bodies once, maybe twice, and then it cuts to them just going to the bonfire, making it big before they start charging towards ape control. In the unrated cut, and this is very deliberate, it cross cuts back and forth. They'll throw a piece of wood on the bonfire, a dead body will be stacked on top of another. They'll throw another <laughs> pe- they'll they'll throw another thing onto the bonfire, more bodies getting tossed onto a pile oh, that's of dead beautiful. bodies. Beautiful. And I mean that first of all, what a testament to the editing of the movie. And it's not like they're just dead bond, just like the people playing dead. These guys are coated with fake blood. <laughs> they they have 
holes in their chests. Their right, the, the helmets that they have are like smashed in. One is completely covered in blood, implying that it was pushed into his. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I mean, it's tame. Don't get me wrong for today's standards. But sure. At the, but at the same time, it's shot and edited in this way that I think it's more effective than a lot of the shit that we see today. And well, I know, and I feel kind of bad, Oliver, because I know you haven't seen the unrated cut because as far as I know, the only way to watch it is with these 40th anniversary Blu-rays that I have mm. because the version that's on Hulu, which is what you watched is, is the theatrical cut. Right. The other one too, the other, the other very noticeable one is when they're dragging Breck outside, when they throw him down on the steps before Caesar, mm-hmm. you know, like an offering and they don't just show Breck <laughs> sort of not really groveling there, but just kind of being not knowing what the apes are going to do. They start stacking dead bodies around him. Woof. And he's forced to watch it. Uh, All of these dead guys (laughs) around him. Look what we did. seeing that is what triggers McDonald to call for Caesar and say, this isn't the way. Mm -hmm. This this isn't the way. That's what kicks off that whole dialogue in the unrated right. version is, is wow, McDonald's that, that is that. that is an incredibly different take because and I, I feel I prefer that because this is a movie about how violence begets more violence yeah it needs more violence yes that whole bit of dialogue exchange between Caesar and Breck is phenomenal it's the same in both versions and and you have Breck Breck looks up in a shock to see Caesar because he thinks Caesar is dead and I love how Caesar goes your servant your creature, your animal. And he just gets angrier and angrier as it goes along. And then Brett goes, I saw you die. And and Caesar goes, the king is dead. Long live the king. Long live the king. And then he asks Breck, why did you do this to us? Why have you done this to us? What did we do to you? And Breck gives a genuine chilling answer. When we repress you, we are repressing the dark side of ourselves. And he also introduces the the concept inside every human, there is still an ape curled up in there because yeah. we came from you. Mm-hmm. And that is also what this franchise is about, is that we started, started as apes, and now we're going back to being apes. Right. And I do love that bit, though, where Caesar starts shaking. He gets so angry. He starts shaking and he lifts his gun ready to just bash Breck's head in. And he stops. And almost, because if you watch the unrated cut, almost more sadistically, he's like, no, take him outside. So they do. They bring him outside. And the, the, that leads to the biggest difference of the unrated version versus the theatrical cut. Theatrical cut, we have that second speech. The, the uplifting unra- one. Yeah, the uplifting one. In the unrated version, Caesar gives that initial angry speech which is one of my favorite speeches of all time ever written. The shots linger on Caesar, right? And you have the fire burning behind him. And there's one shot where there's, it's, it's, this is why working with practical stuff is bet is great because you get little moments like this. Sure. The fire burns in front of Caesar really quick, revealing his face. And it's so horrifying. It is genuinely scary how angry Caesar is. And he is terrifying. To the point that it scares Lisa. You notice how Lisa is there watching Caesar and she turns her back to him because she's scared Mm -hmm. of what Caesar's turned into. And in the unrated cut, when Caesar points and says now, the apes then eviscerate Governor Breck. You don't see it, but you just know that they're now beating him to death with clubs and axes and knives and everything, and he's just gone. And that's the end of the movie. Woof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see why they would uh, change that. <laughs> I mean, no, do we is get, that is. Do we get is, the beat down on the cereal box? I mean, is it as bleak as Beneath? No. <laughs> no. Is it darker than Beneath? But Beneath I would is argue. dealing with nuclear holocaust <laughs> in the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. Period. 
this the the yeah the theatrical cut i mean it ends the same don't get me wrong you have that epic music that's playing from mm-hmm. the first film that was taken from the first film and the camera like pushes in on caesar who's just so angry it's uh, it's again one of the most angry films i have ever seen <laughs> is this film and that's how the movie ends and i'm like what is it with these movies and just shocking endings. <laughs> yeah. Just turning it on you at every turn. Well, that goes back to, again, this is not a... Maybe at this point they knew franchise we're doing another, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not Planet of the Apes Phase 1. It's not keep this going because we're bringing this audience back. Every one of these is supposed to be the end. Right. You know? Right. So what's the logical conclusion to this franchise? It's that. It's terrible violence making way for a new society that is not going to do much better. Mm -hmm. The unrated version really solidifies that. Really solidifies that. That violence isn't the answer. It's just going to lead to more violence. And how do they do that? By showing a lot of violence. And the, the theatrical cut waters that down. And certainly the Caesar from the theatrical cut, just from that end speech is the Caesar we get in the next movie. But it is quite clear that Paul Dane, actually even before this movie was finished, was already kind of working on the next movie, which mm-hmm. didn't happen before. That wasn't right. ha- they, they would just write that movie and say one and done. Wait and see. This movie, they yeah. already said, probably the next one's going to be the last movie because they had a feeling that the next film was going to be the last movie just because yeah. the, 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 the returns for these movies had been going down, right? Sure. They were still making a fuck ton of money, but they've been going down. So they're like, probably the next one's going to be the last. So Paul Dane was already kind of working on that. If you look at some of the original treatments for the next movie, it is quite clear that he was basing that off of the Caesar from the ending of the unrated version, not the one from the theatrical. A militant Caesar, a very not a savior Caesar, a very militant Caesar Oliver. <laughs> Oliver, God, I love these movies. I, I, you know, what? I'll say it. I'll say it. I almost like this one more than the original. I know or the original See, one is objectively the best movie. Of course. Well, the original is also the classic. I, you know what? That's interesting, too. I, I would call the original film a classic. No ifs, ands, or about it. I would call the sequels cult classics. Yes. The, the rest of the franchise is made up of cult classics. Yes. Yeah. But the original is the timeless, embedded in our pop culture, in mm-hmm. our cultural zeitgeist movie. Mm-hmm. I think this stands on its own equally if you take that away, though. Like, if you just measure them on their own merits, mm-hmm. this is just as good as that. This movie really... It's I, just perhaps yeah. more upsetting. Subjectively, in terms of the stuff that I like to see, the types of movies that I like to watch and everything mm-hmm. like that, this movie is it. This is this is the one that I like to watch the most. It's a lot so of it funny. having to do with just how good I find a lot of the dialogue in this movie and the performances of everyone in the film. For sure. And, and it's so funny how, like, the ape sequels took such a turn for the better when they came to our world. Like, when it be- mm-hmm. it's almost like, and I love Beneath, but it's almost like they said everything they needed to say in that original apes yes. movie. Yeah, And I am a big believer that a franchise can take a blatant right turn and fix things up. And that gives it so much more cultural significance, so much more like lasting relevance for it to be taking place somewhere that we recognize. Right. And perhaps that's why this is so upsetting. You want to know out of the, the audiences that watch this movie, which again, this movie had a 1.9, just about a $2 million budget. And it made $9 million back. So a healthy a healthy return. But the audience with this movie wasn't kids like the other film. No, this is an adult's film. The audience that went, for lack of a better term, ape shit over this movie? <laughs> African Americans. Of course. They were the biggest audience for this film. I get it. Yeah. Because what is this movie about? It is reflective of their cultural experience. I believe it was the actor that played Governor Breck said at one of the screenings that he went to in New York City. It was a largely African-American community. 
uh, watching or watching the film. You know, mm-hmm. it was a, uh, an audience watching the film, and he said during the revolution sequence they were going apoplectic. I'm sure they. It was because like watching how could a you watch it match. and not relate to it if that was your lot in life at that time. Exactly, exactly. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's interesting. But that was not the audience. That it 20th was century. For. Yes, that was not, and and that is not the audience 20th Century Fox wanted. Which is why we see that abrupt shift for the sequel and not to get ahead of ourselves but battle is a totally different thing a totally different thing as a result they they, through that cut they were the theatrical cut they were able to get it down to a pg which was still a big deal right pg pg back then did not mean the pg of today no there was still nudity in pg back then yeah there was still there was still a lot of stuff that you could do in pg that you yeah i love this movie me I too, love Adam. this movie. I fucking love this movie. I think this movie is genuinely fantastic. I love this movie. I love this franchise. This is one you could talk. We could sit here for five hours and talk about this, and we, we would could still li- be yeah. yielding new yeah. points. Caesar is real, and I feel him, Adam. <laughs> I feel Caesar. Um, I feel him in everything that I do. God hmm. bless our monkey overlord. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching this episode of Go Ape. We conclude Go Ape next week. Yes, we do. Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Oliver, why don't you pimp yourself out, my friend? Hey, everybody. Oliver the Ricketts here. uh, Societal sweetheart, internet menace. Um, You can find me over on my channel, Other Productions and Media, where I talk about all kinds of things under the sun. We're very into social experiments. Recently, I was baptized in a pool, and we did it to talk about atheism. Uh, So if that's the kind of thing that you like to see, check me out over there. Or if you want to see me talk about movies, uh, find me on Designing Hollywood talking about different movies from all different eras. And we're getting guests on there too that are somewhat involved with the movies that we'll be talking about. And links to both of those channels are in the description below. Of course, you can find all my social media also in the description below. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning into this episode of Go Ape. And we'll see you one more time next week. Take so there is something to this movie. There is something to be said to this I movie. I love the image of you probably in a basement somewhere. <laughs> You're elbow deep in a bag of chips, giggling. Well, that was As me. you watch a low-budget movie about monkeys shooting bald guys. Yeah, that was, that was me last Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the final episode of Go Ape, a podcast where we talk about all five of the original Planet of the Apes movies, and today, as I said earlier, is the final one, which means we are talking about battle for the Planet of the Apes. I am once again joined by my guest, or I guess I'm your guest in this case. I'm Oliver the Ricketts, uh, internet menace, mm. um, societal sweetheart, and I'm I'm so excited to talk about the worst apes movie. I know, is it? I think it's so fitting, knowing you and I, our sense of humor too. <laughs> that this is the one. This is the one where we actually get together. <laughs> I love. <laughs> A bad movie that is born of cynicism. I love just studios scrambling to make something work that just doesn't work. Yes. And I love especially studio bat not love like for entertainment, but I love to talk about because movie making is so fascinating. Um, it is so cool that we can actually see. 20th Century Fox panic because they made a good movie. Yes. And backtrack so hard that they make a bad movie. It's very similar to what happened with Star Wars, where Disney put out The Last Jedi. Yeah. And you know what? It was too real for people. I'll be the one to say it. And so they panicked, and then they tried to make a movie that everybody would like. And in doing so... Nobody liked that. They made something nobody will like. And I think that's kind of what happened here. It is 100% what happened here. The backlash that the studio got with parents and the executives with Conquest being too dark. I mean, the fact that it was rated PG was huge. Yeah. That, especially back then, that was huge. And I still find it baffling that the filmmakers 
and the writers were like, no, this is going to be a G movie. <laughs> the race riot at the end really screams G. <laughs> they did too good of a job. Despite the film still being making a good chunk of money, especially with its small budget, it had the wrong audience. Even though my mentality is it doesn't matter what audience is watching your movie money so long as you're watching money. your movie. Yeah. It is like a weird studio thing. So well, uh, I, time out for a second because I really want to emphasize this too. 20th Century Fox was on the verge of bankruptcy. So I, why would they care if who is who watching, watching their movie? And these movies were already born from that, well, from that need of making money. That is strange because what they did with apes every single time was they're like, it's guaranteed money. Yeah. Um, let's downscale the budget. Always, And every time. People will still come out and see this. Yes, um, and they did. So why, why, especially for this one? I mean, they made this for about $6. Um, it had, it, it had a <laughs> little, I think it had a little bit of the same budget. I think it had the same budget as Conquest if not a little more. Okay. It might have had a little bit more, but well, like, and I mean peanuts more. When you watch this versus Conquest, it is night and day. It is night and day. And it all comes down to the studio being like, no, this needs to be for kids. They fired Paul Dane. Which is a who's, travesty. Who's the main writer of the previous three, all the sequels. Mm. He's been the main writer. And it is a travesty because, well, his health was really declining at this time, too. Sure. He was, he was way overworked. He was writing scripts left and right. He was writing uh, music lyrics left and right. He was doing all sorts, writing books. He was all over the place. And... He was his health was really declining. I love the this idea time. of the guy writing music lyrics like be who should we get for our radio hit? How about the guy who did Monkey Movie? Dane got fired because he all right from the get go of the ending of Con Conquest, he was like, I'm pretty sure they're gonna make another one. Yeah. So this one's probably gonna be the last one. That seemed to be the overall consensus amongst everybody. Right. Is that this was gonna be the final apes movie. It had gotten to the point where they're like the the returns aren't gonna go up anymore. They're just going to keep going down. Therefore, the budget needs to keep going down. Therefore, we're going to have to give people less of what they want, which are the talking monkeys. And we don't want that. And it was even and, advertised as the final chapter. And if you see Conquest, it feels like the end. It's We talked about this last week. It's the logical conclusion. When we know that this world ends mm -hmm. with a giant bomb going off, yeah. a movie about the cycle of violence and it not mattering who's at the wheel, yeah. that's the end. Yeah. You know, this is almost to me, and I've used this term, I actually just used this term on um, the Film Fan Club show when we talked about Furiosa. Furiosa, and I think this movie too, it feels like movie DLC. This almost, it could be a TV series, man. Well, Battle, you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, because, be, and, and that's that's just it too, is is it's like Paul Dane gets, gets fired. And what they do is they hire on a, a husband-wife duo. Mm-hmm. That was making rounds in Hollywood at the time, and it wasn't like they were making crap. Right. They were making decent stuff. And I mentioned to you the reason why they got this job was because they made the Omega Man with Charlton Heston. Right. Uh, which is an adaptation of I Am Legend. It's a very 70s movie. It's very goofy because it's a 70s movie. Sure, yeah, yeah. And it's Charlton Heston running around with a Browning automatic rifle going absolutely crazy, and it's awesome. Huge hit. Right. Huge hit. So they brought them on to work on this, and they eagerly accepted Right. Well, of course, it's, I mean, it, it was a huge franchise. Yeah. But what a difference a writer can make. Because what Paul Dane's original vision of this was going to be was very much in, in line with what the original ending to Conquest was. Caesar was going to essentially be like Nero. Mm -hmm. And he was basing Caesar off of Nero in Rome. Yeah. Where he's kind of gone crazy. Right. He has multiple wives. Mm -hmm. And the big thing that they were really going to set up is that all the humans, none of them could talk because he had their vocal cords removed. That is dark. Well, I can see how that's not made for kids. Yes. I, I'm not going to say it was any darker than, it would have been darker than what Conquest ended up being. Mm -hmm. Just darker in a different way. Because what they were going to do was they were going to say, yes, history is just going to repeat itself. There's no changing here. Which the fingerprints of that are still, they're, they're still, they're still in this of movie. There. Yeah. Uh, and and I agree, it's it's a big thing about a shift in in writers because the the message of this is still humans and apes are just as bad as each other depending on the circumstance. Right. To me, it's fascinating because it does seem that that is somebody in the new series mm -hmm. 
went and looked at these and said, what are they trying to do? Rise of the Planet of the Apes is such a loose adaptation of Conquest. Yes. In, yeah. in many ways. You have Caesar rise up, ape superiority, let's go. What happens in Dawn? He learns that apes can be just as bad as humans, and he finds a human being who he feels is compassionate and yeah. a good person. Uh, Dawn and War kind of feel like a loose adaptation of battle. Yeah. Because there's elements in, bo- in battle that appear in both of them, specifically battle. Right. So they changed, they, they had to lighten it up. Arthur P. Jacobs is told, the main producer, he's told by, um, who was also very sick at this mm. time, Arthur P. Jacobs was exhausted and tired, not going to sure, put yeah, up a yeah. fight. He, he said, okay, we got to make this lighter. So they complete. They took Paul Dane's outline, uh-huh. the writers, and just lightened the tone. Right. A lot. They made Caesar a much softer character, which again fits more in line with the ending that we got in the theatrical cut of the previous film. They decided to instead of setting it in like a wasteland, they decided to set it in a Garden of Eden. That's <laughs> that's how they worded it: a Garden of Eden. And lawmakers reading the story to the kids. Start, and he's John Huston, the legendary John Huston in ape makeup. It's great. Uh, I live by several thrift stores which mm-hmm. are full of ape stuff because they're they're specifically like vintage type mm-hmm. stores if you go there there is usually an ape toy somewhere and it is usually lawmaker yeah. from this movie oh really okay yeah. cuz the one that i've seen the most is either urko from the tv series yep. who's the gorilla general or ursus yeah i see a lot of ursus a lot of ursus when this movie was also coming out too, they were also making deals with television mm-hmm. because what would come out of this would be the Planet of the Apes television series, which only ran for twenty four episodes. But what I do know that came out of this is Go Ape came out of this because when this movie was, as this movie was being released in theaters, it was almost simultaneously being released on television mm-hmm. with all five films being played. <laughs> That's how the television show I think got greenlit was because of how successful these movies were playing on television. We have people are now willing to watch Apes. On TV. Yeah. And, and, and it was huge. Yeah. It was huge. They were being exported all over the world. Everyone was going ape. Well, and I'll, I'll also say, as much as I dislike this movie, mm-hmm. I've made a point of talking about, I love a marketing blitz. I mm-hmm. love movie merchandising that is not chuggy. Like, I love, I love when movie marketing and movie merchandising add to the fun. And that's what happened here. Yeah. In a lot of ways, because they made a kid's movie, and the movie itself is not for me. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's the same way as when Spider-Man popped back up in the MCU and it's like suddenly there were Spider-Man toys and there yeah. was Spider-Man stuff. Yeah. And the current Spider-Man, not for me. Right. Right. But I love Spider-Man mm-hmm. and I love seeing it places. Makes sense. Yeah. One, they didn't use the same film process before. We talked about Todd AO 35 a bit. So the movie looks a little less colorful right. than the last movie, which is ironic because there's so much lack of color in the previous right. one. And, and this is the vibrant Green battle one. Yeah. war movie. Yeah, I cannot believe that this is basically the same crew right. from the previous movie. It is night and day different <laughs> in terms of the quality. This I, Here's how I like to word the at least visually and even pr- how it's presented. This movie legit feels like it is just a higher end made for TV movie from that era. I was literally just going to say that. And as it's being played on TV almost as it's coming out, mm-hmm. do you think there's a consensus as you're making it that this is a t- made for TV movie? I, it could have been. It very yeah. well, we don't know. Right. We don't know because Jay Lee Thompson doesn't really like to talk about this movie very much. He'll sure. talk he'll talk on end about Conquest. I think Jay Lee Thompson does have something to be proud of with this film. I really do. And that's the fact that he was ma- able to make it sure. as big as it was. Right. With such a small budget. And what's what's interesting is that you watch the battle sequence in this movie, and that's to me where the budget really fails the film. Right. Is the battle scene. As an editor, I can see they used every trick in the book right. to make it look bigger right. than what it really is, including using the same treehouse that explodes, <laughs> shooting it from like five different angles, yep. and then just cutting it into different places to make it look like more tree houses are exploding. Sure. I think if there's anything that you can take away from this movie, it is the fact that it, it looks as competent as it does, which is by far the least competent out of all the Apes movies. But when you learn about the behind the scenes story, mm-hmm. the total lack of care from 20th Century Fox in terms of putting money into the project and just how low the budget was for the film, I go, I get it. Well, and and then things like the school bus, mm-hmm. 
make a little bit more sense. Yes. It's certainly still big. <laughs> you know? Big, you know, in, yeah. in air quotes. I, I'll be honest, I fucking loved this movie as a kid. And, and that I totally get. I think there's a lot of things like blockbusters that come out where mm -hmm. it's like, as an adult... This doesn't work for me. I was Jurassic World's Fallen Kingdom was a big one for me. This movie was not uh, something that I fuck with in mm -hmm. any kind of way. But if I was five in a movie about oh, yeah. dinosaurs taking over New York City at the end, yeah, it would have blown my mind. Watching this as an adult, I'm losing a couple brain cells. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Watching this when I'm six. The monkeys have guns. Do you not understand? I don't. I don't think you guys know how much I love this movie almost solely because I'm getting to see all these monkeys running around with World War II, Korean War, of and Vietnam era guns. And I'm like, this is awesome. Shooting up a school bus full of mutants <laughs> with a M1928 Thompson submachine gun. I'm like, this is awesome. Seeing gorillas charge at the, at the mutants carrying Browning automatic rifles, M1 carbines, and the old M16s from the Vietnam War era. I'm like, oh. in, in a lot of ways, it's like <laughs> it's like when you watch Temple of Doom as a kid. Yeah. And then when you become an adult, yeah, it's like, yeah. well, Raiders and Last Crusade are so much more intelligent. But I love, I still love Temple of Doom. Oh, because oh, because I, ha I I just, Whenever I watch it, I still get that child sense of wonder. Of course. Watching the film. So there is something to this movie. There is something to be said to this I movie. I love the image of you... Probably in a basement somewhere. <laughs> You're elbow deep in a bag of chips, giggling. Well, that was as me. you watch a low budget movie about monkeys shooting bald guys. Yeah, that was that was me last Sunday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My notes for this. I have a lot of notes for this movie in terms of the story and how many holes are in it and all the problems that are in it. But the biggest one, it all comes down to budget and wow, what a difference a writing team. Yeah. Made. And we can go past it being made for kids mm -hmm. because I'm not here to be a Grinch. I'm not here to be like, nothing mm. should be made for children. You're talking to the guy that fucking loves Godzilla. Yeah. And I'm like, look, at, especially well, Showa era. I'm like, yeah. Again, <laughs> one of the other big things I talk about with movies is like, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with enjoying this movie or this movie even mm -hmm. having been made for kids inherently. Right. I do take issue with some of these story beats here That's, that were made yes. almost cynically, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, the main one being the character from Conquest, who is Caesar's, we'll say associate. Yeah. When you, when you can't get that actor back, mm -hmm. the move is not to make it his brother. Yes. The move is either recast or write him out. Personally, I would have gone for a recast. Because Caesar at least has history with that character. Yes. When you make it his brother, and for those who don't know, the movie features that McDonald's brother. McDonald's. Um, Burger King. Burger King. Yeah. <laughs> it's his brother in this film because the, that actor was not available. Yep. And I think you lose... If, if this is... McDonald in the movie. I think you gain a lot more subtext here because you have two characters who are have a history, like a profound history with each other in a violent situation, and their history pertains a lot to violence between their races. Yes, exactly. And and that was actually one of my one of my first notes here was the the casting of uh, having McDonald be his brother. That was a genuine mistake, and it would have made more sense to conti a continuation of their character mm -hmm. too. And that it would be interesting that McDonald is the voice of reason. What character do we have in there? What's his name? Winston. Or Watson. Paul Williams plays a plays a an orangutan in this movie, mm -hmm. who's always saying this long winded dialogue for no reason at all. It's like the writers thought that they were trying to sound intelligent, and it yeah. just comes off as long winded stupidity. Where I'm just sitting there like, if Paul Dane wrote this, it well, would have been it would have been a lot better. Which ultimately <laughs> was that was always the risk behind these movies was that it was going to start looking and feeling dumb because it was people right. in monkey suits. Apparently, the writers were inspired by the story of Cain and Abel. So they wanted to do the story of the first ape to kill ape. Which is, is part of the movie that is works. Is part of the movie that works, yes. Yeah. I, I agree completely. When, so that, to me, has a lot of the eeriness of Beneath. Yeah. When, when they start chanting, ape killed ape. Yeah. Right? That's also the only part of the score that works for me. I, think I was going to note so that, too. The score weak. It, it is. The other, I like the main title music. Yeah. Because I love, like, to me, that sets up, like, we're going to have a fight. Yeah. 
And I'm like, okay, this is like a rousing score. And then it suddenly gets like really whimsical almost <laughs> throughout the entire, for the rest of the film until that scene. Right. The, the music there is good. And you have that mixing with the ape has killed ape. Yep. That chanting. Yep. There is a director's cut, an extended cut to this movie. Not a director's cut, an extended cut to this movie that I have on my Blu-ray. Uh-huh. And the big difference is there's a couple of added scenes. There's no violence added back into the movie or anything. There's just a couple of added scenes to really establish that these mutants are the mutants from beneath. One, a character named Mendez, yep. who is also the name of the head guy. From right, beneath. right, right. And also, they blatantly establish that they have the Alpha and Omega bomb. And that <laughs> yes, should... Yes, yes. And, and that should Culp, who is the leader in this... Should he fail, who is, is from the previous film. Culp, mm -hmm. Culp was the head of ape security from the previous film, and he's still alive. And, now and he's received an, a promotion. But he orders that woman, if I don't come back and if this attack fails, blow up the bomb. Wild. And that's very dark for this movie. And that's very dark for the movie, but in, in the theatrical cut, none of that's in there. Right. And the scene at the end where Mendez goes, what are you doing? Don't mm. blow up the bomb. You're going to kill everyone. Culp was a fucking idiot. <laughs> what are you doing? And he talks her down from, from, from blowing up the bomb. Right. And so it hints in the director's cut that these mutants are not going to be the same mutants anymore that we saw in... There's been some kind of change. There's been a change. And the same with the apes. Right. Right. The, the ending. And even we have that the ending of the shot where, where the apes are all kind of... They're still kind of fighting here and there, mm. but like they're all sitting together being taught by the lawgiver and stuff like that. And I'm like, there's there's hints at this. And that's that's what they wanted to get across. But to me, I I hate that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I hate I, the idea that this movie is not cynical. Yeah. Um, this movie is the most, by far, the most optimistic out of all of them, purposefully so. Right. But to me, that that is disappointing because the best thing about Conquest and the best thing about Beneath... And really, when you boil it down, the best thing about Planet of the Apes is that, like, mean ending that they are mm -hmm. so good at, yes. you know? Because even what yeah. made us fall in love with apes is Heston seeing the Statue of Liberty. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't get meaner than that. Right. It, uh, there is something that I do like that's established very early on in this movie. You see that the humans have become basically slaves to the apes. Mm -hmm. And there's this one scene where you see, in the very opening of the movie, you see that a wheel has been broken. And all these guys are trying to lift that thing. And then comes General Aldo. Yep. And he just does it himself. <laughs> I like that. Because right. it to me, it establishes, yes, they are different from us. Gorillas are insanely strong for no reason at all. So we're chimps. Mm. Yes, they are. We need to be afraid of them. We Or we need to watch out for them. Especially for somebody like Aldo, who is just running around on a horse, calling himself General. Yeah. General Aldo. Oh, it total and right from the get go, you get a total change in visuals. Mm. It almost sounds like a muted color palette, despite the fact that it should have been vibrantly green, right? Because this is a Garden of Eden. Well, and that is such a strange thing to me because if you're gonna be lighter, you're going to be a kids' movie, then be that, yeah, you know, commit. You can tell that there's like hardly any lighting. Right. Because they, they had they didn't really have much of a choice. And again, that whole TV movie comes to vibe or comes to mind because. If you look at like how 70s television shows were being shot, mm -hmm. identical. Yeah. I just completely identical. The only difference being that this was shot with anamorphic widescreen while those right. are, are shot with just regular spherical lenses. But the same theory of filmmaking is happening. The same yeah. the same basic practices are yeah. going on in battle. And I'm like, already something's off. Yeah. This is you the know? rifleman. Yeah. Caesar's first scene. I feel like it was a mistake making his first scene with him talking to those two orangutans and yep. then they got to jump out of the way of of Aldo right, right through with his with his guerrilla army his guerrilla cavalry actually <laughs> I should say he has to get pushed out of the way to me it would have been far more effective if his first scene is when the teacher's getting chased which I actually genuinely like the the mm -hmm. school scene right him teaching the apes how to write yes and and how to read I'm fascinated with the progression of the ape society. Which I can't believe it's advanced this well, far. Well, that, that's the other question. When the hell does this take place? Yeah, I, I think it takes place like tw like maybe 20 years. So the official timeline, 
because I looked it up. I was actually okay, you, curious. you actually looked it up. I've never seen 15 the, years on the official it timeline. Was 15. Okay, so I wasn't totally wrong. That makes no sense. No. The fact that they are this advanced, they have all of these new outfits. I'm like, this is this is where the new films blow the old films out of yep. the water is the natural progression we see of the apes. Right. While in this, you just got to swallow the pill that they just evolutionary jumped thousands of years in 15. Yeah. We've moved 15 years forward. Mm -hmm. The whole landscape has changed. The apes are as fluent as they were in the first movie. As the first movie. You would think that this movie took place after the first film, Mm -hmm. before the second film. And I want to also confirm that I don't know if that was also the case in Paul Dane's original script. Right. I really don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if it was, just sure. because of the level of we don't care about continuity too much, right. But especially back then. Had that been Caesar's first scene, where the teacher is running to Caesar, basically yelling sanctuary, yeah. and Aldo is about to kill him, and suddenly you see Caesar appear, stop, and Caesar appears. Yep. To me, that would have been such a, a, a way better first scene for that man, because it establishes he's the leader. He's the one that the all the apes are looking up to for, for guidance. And I just, I'm like, why would you waste, have his first scene of him just casually walking? And they're talking about nonsense. It, in that in that sequence where he's talking with Watson, I think his name is a Watson. A nothing but, scene gets exchanged for something really yeah. palpable. And I'm like, it yeah. is a, it's, We keep talking about fucking Star Wars. It's the same mistake that is made in Rogue One. Vader shows up a few times to tell some jokes, right? But then at the end, he's a badass and he walks through. Imagine how, and I'm not, it's not the same thing as Vader's not the main character. Right. Right. But imagine how much more effective that moment is if you have not seen Vader for the entire movie. That the first time you see him is he cracks that lightsaber in the dark rather than try not to choke on your ambitions, General. Why does he know puns? Yeah. There is something in this film that I genuinely like. Genuinely like. Is I like the makeup on Caesar because he no longer looks like the youthful Caesar from the sure. previous movie. He's got more wrinkles on his face. He looks older. And at the same time, he also seems to be a more wiser character because of his age. He's got some mileage on him yeah. now. And I will say, as a sidebar, the makeup in this movie, I think, is the best. Uh, I think there's it's a lot cent. of improvement in the makeup here there's much less use of masks yes if much you notice less. that yes i guess that's technology and like understanding getting further and yeah. not the budget yeah i'm not i'm not sure the reason it is very true there is much less pullover masks yep. in this movie than there was in conquest and it is a little over the top to see him watering plants <laughs> and everything talking talking about about whimsical things and how he's a peaceful man. Who knew that ape Che Guevara was also a gardener? Was also a gardener. Well, uh, big uh, horticulturist. Yeah, yeah. We Caesar says something interesting, and he says to McDonald, mm. "We are not your masters." And then McDonald immediately goes, "We are not your equals." And I think that's a good exchange. Like that was a little bit there where I'm like, "That's got to be something for Paul Dane." Yeah, that's got to be left over straight from Paul Dane. Is is Caesar being like, "We're not your masters." We and and him and him being like, "We do not own slaves. We do not do this. Right. We are apes. We are better than humans," which in itself makes it go. Therefore, we're not equals. Yeah, because you're still better than us. Yes, that's so reminiscent of the end of the last, the last movie. film yeah and, and, and again, do you think apes will be better slightly slightly you yeah know. and which is i think is a great line too right it's like it's so clear that this caesar is not the caesar from the unrated versions the ending of the unrated version of the previous film this is blatantly going the theatrical version of the film is what's canon which if we go with that caesar from the ending of the theatrical cut it makes sense why this yes, caesar would course. be a lot more lighthearted because and caesar more... had a stroke at the end of that movie and suddenly believed a whole different <laughs> host of things i have an interesting note here lisa is not zira there's a scene where he's where they're talking to each other where caesar and and zira uh, you see caesar caesar and lisa are talking to each other yeah and i'm like i can tell they're trying to do a cornelius and zira and it's not working well that was a doomed idea from the start yeah because caesar and cornelius are not that similar no you know no they well they are and they aren't and that's why i think it works so good right is he has elements of cornelius in him Sure. But he's a lot more violent. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. Cornelius yeah. is a gentle ape, and yeah. that is the part of him that leans into, that's a loving husband. Yes. You know? Yeah. I don't see Caesar as that. No. 
it feels kind of forced, and I don't feel the chemistry between the two of them. Sure. That I even saw in the previous film. In the previous film, what I liked about it is that they didn't have any dialogue together. It was right. all it was all the visuals. She's a scaled back character yeah. almost in that yeah. previous film. And one. and I love how the ending of the unrated version, Lisa becomes horrified of Caesar because <laughs> of because of how violent it's gotten. It's not like they're in love in that version. Sure. He just has a connection with her because they were forced to to mate. Right. And therefore he kind of has like a care well, for her. Well to me her that is her more him. that's more of a grief connection than yeah. anything else. Yeah. Two people go through something very similar that are that's traumatic. Mm -hmm. You're bonded to that person. That doesn't mean that you're in love and you're soulmates. Right. You know. And 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 it is a good scene like like when she's been beaten in a control and suddenly Caesar comes in. He's all angry and violent. But yet when he sees her, he makes sure to go up to her and essentially go, are you all right? Right. And does it very gently, too. And I'm like, that's a night that kind of feels like Cornelius there. Mm. It just doesn't work in this because they they just don't have chemistry that that Roddy McDowell and Kim Hunter had. Sure. There's it's just not there. Right. And I'm like, ah, you can't do that. That being said, I think the scenes with Caesar and his son are quite touching. Yes. Um, and I think perhaps that comes down to Roddy McDowell having mm -hmm. played an ape father and an ape son already. Yeah. Old hat to him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, but it, do, it does work. And I think it would have worked even better if Caesar was more of that violent yes. version before. If all of a sudden he, in every scene that is with his son, he is suddenly really gentle, really kind, and very loving. Well, it comes down to a desire for, I want Caesar to be more complicated yeah. than he is in yeah. this movie. And and I guess that's me wanting the script to be more complicated because Caesar's our main character. Mm -hmm. But Caesar in Conquest is a really complicated character. Um, very with, complicated. With a lot he of is, yeah. different sides to him. And here he is reduced to much less than that. And that almost like... That that would have added a whole nother layer to him where he can be a peaceful ape if he's a father and, and something else is at stake here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I completely agree with that. Virgil was that monkey's name. The orangutan's name, not mm -hmm. Watson. Virgil. Dialogue not written by Paul Dane and it shows in the scene where Caesar and Party get their guns. <laughs> it is the most needlessly long-winded sequence in that film. And for the record, for context, they're trying to get these guns because Caesar actually has an interesting thing to his character. He wants to know who the hell his parents were. Right. He's he's heard of them from Armando. Right. He still clearly loves and has affection for. But he doesn't know them. He doesn't know them. Right. And I like that idea of, do you want to know what happened? We Because he's he's so concerned about, and this I think is genuine. He's like, what the hell's going to happen in the future? I It's almost like, I wish I had my parents here to kind of guide me. Sure. Or point me in a, in a right direction. And McDonald's like, well, we have all of their recordings from Dr. Hassline in one of the archives. We can go see if it's still there. And right. I like that idea. Oh, absolutely. And, and especially, I like the idea that that is something that keeps coming back. Yes, you know, I do too. Um, because in Conquest, that was a problem. Yeah. Um, and now here it is again. And even in Escape, those recordings are, are the death of them. Yes, it leads to all the decisions that happen in Conquest is because of those yep. recordings, and I like that they're coming back here. But it's just interrupted by that scene where they're getting their guns, and there's that old orangutan who is like, you put me in charge of the, <laughs> of, of the arsenal, and I'm like, God fucking damn. Well, he's a big piece of 70s cheese. Yes, you know. and it's clearly done for comedic effect, sure. too. It's hard, it's hard to explain how it doesn't work. It's just such a tonal whiplash right. between this and the previous film. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, it doesn't, doesn't go well together. Now, in the journey toward the city, mm -hmm. which is difference to be New York, but we don't really know because it wasn't really named. The city wasn't really named. Do we think that it's not New York because they considered that to be too dark? It might have been. Do you, because we know that the apocalypse hits New York City. Yeah, it might have. It might have been. I don't. I don't. I, I don't really think so. Mm -hmm. I just think they just went with generic. Okay. Word. And just and just went with universally uh, accessible. Right. Right. But what I I, I I have to question this. This they're doing this journey towards the city, and I noticed that they brought no food, no shelter. And no water for a three-day journey into a desert wasteland. They have fur. 
they're going to come out just fine. <laughs> it, why I bring that up is it's such a big point in the original plan of the Apes movie when they do the big escape. Right. They're like, we got to bring water. We got to bring food. We got to do all this because it's We're a trying to make it across the desert. wasteland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, these guys, eh. Detail eh. shmeet tales. <laughs> this is this is the most Adam note I think I could possibly take. There's some good split focus diopter shots in this film. <laughs> Particularly in the mutant underground. Yep. There's several shots in that movie where Culp will be in the foreground or a character will be in the foreground and stuff's going on in the background that's also in focus. It's, right. They've split the focus. It's a split focus diopter shot. Yep. And I'm like, it would work really good in an underground base like this where everything's really off kilter and slanted and yeah. broken. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's a good way of making it seem uneasy without really <laughs> making the it uneasy. The best Adam Noyce filmmaking note. In the beginning of The Mutants, Mendez, we've already kind of established him that these are supposed to be the mutants from beneath. This is the origins of them. I love the fact that this entire movie happens because Culp is bored. <laughs> We haven't had anything interesting. We haven't had anything. It literally opens with him being like, oh, we're just moving debris again. I'm just so bored. I'm so bored. Apes! We Shh, need to kill them. Kill. Shoot. And I love how literally everyone is like, Culp, don't do this. <laughs> we are sick. We are tired. We are old people. We are we are we are suffering from radiation Don't sickness. Don't you see how boring that is? <laughs> Why do you want to go on a, on the attack with the apes? Because I'm bored. I, nothing interesting has happened in a while. <laughs> <laughs> we go back to like, would you love this movie as a five year old? And the five year old and me would be like, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Caesar's shock. I think this is also very good. Caesar's anger when he realizes it was the apes who destroyed the planet. In 3955, yep. not the humans. Yeah. Which is, that's a big piece of his character because he truly believes that apes are superior. Better. Yes. I just wish this movie was more about that idea. Yes. You know? Yes, 100%. If the movie was more about that idea, I think it would be a much, I'm not saying a great film, but a much better film, a more rounded, solid movie. There's hints of that greatness throughout this that makes me go, yes, this is part of the Planet of the Apes franchise. But it's too little. Yeah, and, and it just, that's almost like why I wish that this was a TV series. Because it could be a show that had moments of greatness and then fun episodes, mm -hmm. you know? And something, a TV show almost feels more optional if you're a completionist watching movies. Because then you get to Conquest, it's like, well, that's the end. And then there's also this show mm -hmm. that I, you know, and I know that they did a TV show afterwards. I've never been compelled to watch it, but I might have been compelled to watch an ape show with those themes in it, even if it was mostly just fun. Right. That's kind of the show. Yeah. The Apes television series. That was kind of that in a nutshell. There is some creepy imagery down in the down in the sewer systems For that they're sure. walking through. Like there's one in particular that I genuinely go, ugh. It's when Caesar and his party, they're walking through the hallways and you just see them lined with sick <laughs> dying people. I love an apocalypse film that has moved sick people into the gutter. I yeah. always think about Cloverfield. Yeah. Um, when they're walking through, they have to walk through the sewers of New York to get to the hospital. Right. How fucking gross, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? But I thought that the images of that were really creepy. Like, some of them are reaching out to them, like they're reaching out for help. Yeah. And they can't give it. <laughs> and, like, they got these burns all over their faces and stuff like that. I'm like... Again, there's some hints of greatness here. We like it. Yeah, I like that. Violence, we like it. And then you see the mutant army, which is the funniest, most pathetic thing I have ever seen I, in a movie. I love the mutants, man. <laughs> I, I, they're so my sensibility. I love just a big stupid science fiction concept, especially right. one in an old movie that doesn't work. Uh, it's <laughs> They have a bus. They have a broken down Jeep with broken glass in it with an artillery piece welded onto it. And that's it. They're traveling on foot. Everyone else is traveling well, on got, foot. They got a little uh, redneck vibe going on they here. They do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like like Mad. And they're wearing all black, wool black, walking <laughs> through a desert. They're just hobbling along. So many are falling over dead because of the heat. 
And I'm like, this is the most pathetic looking thing I have ever fucking seen in my life. They're, in hor they're a horrifying army with cerebral powers, Adam. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. Don't Oliver. you understand? <laughs> these are the guys who end it all. <laughs> <laughs> they, because they try to present these guys as intimidating to the apes. Sure. And I'm like, no, the apes are going to kick these guys' ass it's, when they show up. It's a monkey versus a bald guy. Yeah. It's a... <laughs> yeah. It's a... Uh... <laughs> It's, it just doesn't, it does not work. There is a scene that's in between this that does, I think, work. And it's Aldo getting really pissed at Caesar because Caesar's gone. And Aldo sees an opportunity to seize power. Yeah. And he gets all of his guerrilla cavalry together. And, and he's saying the most Cornelius, Caesar's son, mm -hmm. overhears this because his pet squirrel got loose. And Aldo kills him. Yeah. Aldo, Aldo kills Cornelius. And I genuinely, I like the concept of that. Right. To keep his secret, he's willing to break the number one law of ape. Ape kill ape. Ape shall not kill ape, therefore, yep. but he had to kill an ape. And again, this kind of goes back to every scene with Caesar and his son. Caesar mourning his son is actually quite good. Mm -hmm. I love how all the apes have also have also gathered around Caesar's house, waiting to hear the news as, as Cornelius yeah, Caesar's died. out here sitting shiva. Yeah. <laughs> The scene reminded me of like sequences where like a monarch in like old Europe, their son was dying or like the heir was dying and like how all the people would kind of like gather around the well, palace to hear the news. Did, did the prince die? It's funny not to run back to communism, um, but see if Caesar is Che Guevara, uh, this is very reminiscent of Castro's final salute in Cuba. Yeah. Um, all the people coming out. I've actually been in that parking lot um, mm. literally a parking lot just to see, is he dead? What's going on? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, very similar to what you're describing, where it's the, the authority figure has died. All the people are here yeah. to see. And, and I also love how devastated Caesar is yeah. by the loss of his son. And I love how almost catatonic Lisa gets. Like, even all, like, all the explosions are going on mm -hmm. all around the, the treehouse and everything. I like how she's just stunned sitting there watching over her dead son. This could be a very intelligent, very poignant movie. Yes. <laughs> and that's what's frustrating, it, too. Right. It, again, if you want to be a kid's movie, there's nothing wrong with that. But then be a kid's movie, you know? Right. Or figure out a more intelligent way to handle these themes within a kid's movie so that we don't feel cheated that it could have been something greater. Yes. Yes. And then, and then the, that leads to... Aldo taking power. And I genuinely like this scene where the humans get brought to the council meeting mm. and that enrages several of the apes who are like, they should not be here. No humans allowed here. And I love the moment where Caesar, uh, where Aldo comes back and says, my men have been killed by the mutants. Mm. We're about to be invaded. So suddenly he seems right. Right. In everything that he said. So apes start siding with him because Caesar's gone. We need, we need a leader. Mm. And I love the moment where, where Virgil goes, you are not Caesar. And Aldo sits down in Caesar's chair and says, Caesar is not here. Yeah. I like that. Right. Again, hints of greatness. Where I'm like, if this was written by Paul Dane, if this had a more competent writing team behind it and they weren't too afraid of being dark, that would have been an excellent coup scene. Sure. Caesar is not here I am. It also sort of twists the idea because Aldo, remember, was originally the first ape to say no. And now Aldo is here. Aldo is now the villain. He's one of the antagonists. So right. it's, again, a twist on what we'd expect. We'd think he would be the good guy. It turns out he's the bad guy. Same with uh, Hasline in Escape. He was the guy that was sending out all those missions into space. You'd think he would be one of the pioneers of humanity. He would be a huge, he'd be pushing humanity forward and everything. But what is he in Escape? He becomes the villain. Right because of those ideals. It's so interesting that it's like, this is almost like echoes of things that we've seen in this franchise before in a lot of ways. Yes. Um, they're all kind of ideas that we've seen almost like they've been done better in other films. Because they have. Right. There's also potential to do them again better than last time here. They just don't take it. Yeah. And then, and then that goes into... Aldo officially taking power, he invades, he smashes open the doors to the arsenal, takes all the guns, arms all the apes, rounds up all the people, puts them in a corral, and threatens to shoot them all. 
And he says my favorite line in the movie. Aldo suddenly appears in front of the camera and goes, we want guns. Guns are power. <laughs> now we go and get guns. <laughs> <laughs> I'm what like, was that is, what was that you're saying about this movie having weak dialogue? Adam? Yeah. I'm sorry. And, I, and um, I'm sitting there and I watch that scene and I'm laughing like that's fun. <laughs> like that's fun. <laughs> this is Shakespeare. So I love how the mutants, instead of doing something smart, because they have limited numbers, limited equipment, fighting well entrenched apes. I fucking love movie logic sometimes. <laughs> Let's do a full mutant frontal assault in broad daylight with limited numbers and no cover. I go, what logic are, are the mutants using in attacking Ape City like they do? Like, I'm sitting there and, and I'm like, as a writer, I'm like, okay, we're angry at the apes because the apes caused all this horseshit. I, mm -hmm. Okay, let's go along with that. The writer in me is like, well, we can't do a large frontal scale assault because we're all sickly mutant people. <laughs> Let's find a way to infiltrate the city at night, or Ape City at night. Let's find a way to flank them. Let's find a way to be creative in trying to defeat the apes here. Nah, just full frontal assault. We're fine. <laughs> it's going to look, it's gonna look <laughs> sick. <laughs> I'm just like, Jesus <laughs> Christ. And I'm like, what chance do these guys have? Like, you've seen some of the wide shots. I'm like, there's only like 20 guys there in a school bus. <laughs> <laughs> the school bus that should have been on the damn poster of the movie. It should have been on the poster Because the when you ask people about this one, because you could ask almost all the other ones, people will remember something. Right. Right. First one, obviously, Statue of Liberty. Right. Second one, the bomb explodes the entire yeah, world. Right. Third one, the two ape lovers, they... They die, I would man. even argue the chimp going mama at the yeah. very end of the movie, a very prominent image. Fourth one, uh, that entire ending... <laughs> This one. Is that the one with the school That's bus? That's the one with the school bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that also leads to the other movie logic of the film. Is it like, right, you're seeing this mutant army just kind of sitting out there in the open. Yeah. How come none of the apes noticed them? <laughs> <laughs> they were looking the other way. They were, they were, they they were too other... wrapped up in whether or not to release the humans from the corral or not. They were thinking about other stuff. The other thing that I also noticed is why the fuck didn't Virgil just tell Caesar that he thought Aldo murdered his son. <laughs> because there's a fucking scene where, where Virgil basically says, I think I know who killed your son, Caesar. And Caesar's like, who, who, who? And Virgil literally goes, you'll find out in due time, I believe. Why? Why? Just fucking tell him. <laughs> like, I think that would also I be more dramatic. Be, I need to be mysterious. Wouldn't that be more dramatic, though, if, like, during the battle, right? Caesar knows Aldo has killed his son, but they have no choice but to work together for this. Right. To defend Ape City. We can kill each other later. Right. I think that would have been a way that's more incredible. dramatic. That's incredible. <laughs> that's, well, that's an intelligent movie. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. What an asshole. Now, and I've said this earlier, I give them props for, for the effort on the battle. The budget was just too low to create it properly. Right. And again, every editing book, ed every editing trick in the book is used in this battle scene to try to make it look more epic and bigger than what it really is. And I admire the effort. Yeah, it gets of an course. A for effort. It's just not conquest. It's <laughs> it's just not one of the best movies of the franchise. No, <laughs> it's so interesting how like the other movies. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Oh, man. <laughs> Ends with a whimper. General Aldo with an M1928 Thompson submachine gun riding on a black horse and, and, and surrounding no, that still No, that still goes hard. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I love it so much. I love seeing them with M1 Garands firing at everyone in this bus, slaughtering everybody inside this bus. And I'm like, this is wonderful. Still goes hard, baby. This is fun. Rewatching it, I'm like, yeah, I can see why five-year-old me was like obsessed with this movie. And, <laughs> and there's something special about that. So I will give it that. If you are a child and you watch this, it's so much fun. It, it is. It goes hard. Yeah, it's it's so much fun. It's just, you know, the problem with this movie is when you develop critical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Caesar does something. He has them fall back from the barricades, uh -huh. right? And so they, the mutants puncture the city, and he sees all these dead apes. Why didn't he bother to check 
if any of the wounded well because because i'm like Culp goes in there and he uh-huh. gives this like little speech about how man is is better than apes and stuff like that and then caesar yells now fight like apes which is another <laughs> line in the movie that's pretty famous now fight like apes those idiots. The, the humans are such idiots for just walking in the middle, surrounded by all these supposedly dead apes. You'd think they'd want to check. Or at least as they're going through them, machine gun the bodies. Right. Shoot the bodies. Right. To make sure that they're dead. So that way they don't do what they end up doing. Well, it, I mean, that's <laughs> what you see would happen in a real war. Yes. You know. Yes. And that's what you would see happen in Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Like Absolutely. Idea, because General Ursus wasn't an idiot. Total idiot. He did think he could shoot down an atomic bomb with a machine gun. <laughs> you mentioned this really early on when we were talking about this, the scene where Aldo fights Caesar yes. on the tree. Best scene in the film, in my opinion. A- absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. Caesar screaming, you murdered my son. Yep. And that slowly well, getting angrier and angrier Because and that's angrier. character catharsis yeah. that we're finally getting. There's finally a point in this movie where something is coming to a head and there's an intelligent... Intelligent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> conflict yes. that I actually legitimately care about and that is why that works yes and and it does work and the music's really creepy too the yep. music feels like th- this is the only time in the film where I think the music genuinely feels like it's something from the OG plan of the age sure films. it's it's weird yep but it works and I like how scared Aldo looks when Caesar gets really angry at him yeah he, he's you see him cry this this a this gorilla who's been nothing but talk suddenly is like, oh shit, I, I guess I gotta, this is my bed, I'm sleeping in it. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, okay, I like this. I like that. And I like the fact that he gets tossed off of the tree just like Cornelius did. Right. He gets tossed off a tree and dies that way. And I also like the line where McDonald, one of the humans is like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> and McDonald goes, I think they just joined the human race. Which is, again, that's what apes is about. Yeah. The violence between uh, in our species against each other and how violence begets more violence. Yes. And this movie should have been about that too. To, yes. And absolutely. so in the moments when it is about that, that's the best. Yes. That's the best. And in the director's cut, there's a there's a scene where she's about to blow up the Alpha and Omega bomb. Mm-hmm. And Mendes says, What the fuck are you doing? That's stupid. Right. Why are you doing this? Again, hinting that things will now change there's an understanding and i also i kind of like that yeah because ape still deals with a time loop and Mm -hmm. time travel so i like the idea that things could come out different it needs to be more than a throwaway line yes or or a deleted scene correct because that's not in the theatrical cut at all right so then it just focuses on the the apes in their point of view and then the movie ends with the lawgiver going full circle Saying, I don't know if man and ape are destined to work together. Only time will tell. And the camera zooms in to a statue of Caesar and the statue starts crying. A controversial shot, to be sure. Because there's two interpretations to that sequence. And a shot that was originally going to be removed from the movie. Yes, everyone hated that shot. Everyone hated that scene. But I'm so glad that it wasn't removed because I think it is one of the only things in this movie for you to chew on and think about. It is, even though I think I know my interpretation of this, but there's two interpretations of the scene. One, which fits more with in line with the other Planet of the Apes movie, is Caesar's crying because it's never going to work. The other interpretation is Caesar's crying, is weeping for joy because suddenly they're all together. And personally, I think that's that's my interpretation of the ending, knowing the theme of the film, yes. knowing knowing uh, the theme of integration in the movie, the, right. the, the, the lightheartedness of the film. And seeing the movie for what it is, I agree that that's what was intended. I would like it to be the other way. I would like it to be and the other in, way, too. So in yeah. my head canon, it is the other thing. But that's because, to me, Planet of the Apes is not optimistic. Planet of the Apes is mean. And mm-hmm. Planet of the Apes is pessimistic and about our tendency for violence towards each other. Yes. The last note should reflect that just as the last notes have reflected that in all of the other movies. Literally all the other movies to that point, yeah. And if you're going to have an optimistic ending, you earn it with a much more complex movie than this. Yes. Which is, again, where the new movies shine. Well, that was Battle. That was Go Eight. That was the, that, well, maybe we'll come back for Tim Burton in a few months. Maybe. 
Maybe. As of right now, we're just doing the five OG movies. <laughs> um, oh, it's been such a pleasure to go back to them. Yeah, um, it, it has for me too because it's been it's been eight years, I think, since I last seen them. Yeah, I was a I was a senior in high school yeah. um, when I watched them last time. Uh, other than Apes, like original Apes, mm-hmm. I've seen a few times over the years. Yeah. Um, so going back now, and especially. I was only just getting into film and filmmaking when I was in high school. Um, so now as an adult and like, that's my job, that's my vocation, right. you know, and knowing what I know about how to make a movie, these are so much fun. This yeah. is so cool that you can take a budget and stretch it like this and that you can make anything that has a legacy like this mm-hmm. coming from that mm-hmm. place. The fact that you have four very competent movies, mm-hmm. and at least you have one fun film. Sure. Because I would still well, argue I that... Well, I wouldn't say that Battle is bad. I, I, I would say it's dumb fun. Yeah. That's exactly what this is. And I think as a movie aimed towards children, it succeeded. And it also like will challenge a child, it for would. sure. It would. But as a movie aimed for children, I always say this about like films like Godzilla vs. Megalon, too, yeah. where I'm like, these aren't meant for adults. These are meant for children. And the fact that they are made for kids, it succeeds tremendously. Because I, like in the case of Godzilla vs. Megalon, I was a kid, and it mm. entertained the fuck out of me. Battle for the Planet of the Apes was the same way. It entertained the living fuck out of me. Of this course. Movie. I was obsessed with these movies because of battle. It's cool that it made you a fan. Because yeah. even in, in modern day pop culture and like things that I get really into, Spider-Man specifically, yeah. there can be installments that are not for me. Mm-hmm. You know, And that's so cool that it's so versatile that people younger and generations later after me are going to see it and take a totally different thing and say, no, that's the one that was that was for me. You see a lot of that. You see that with Godzilla all the time. Yeah. I agree. I do. I love this. I don't agree with the hate that the that the sequel movies get Absolutely so much. Absolutely not. I, particularly the first three, I adore them. I, I think we talked about a rating conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You have to put apes. That's the goat, right? The original? Yes. Yes. As I've said before, Objectively, I think the original Planet of the Apes movie is not just the best of the original movies. I think it will always be the best Apes movie. A hundred percent. I can totally see that. To me, it's Dawn. Yeah. But Apes, you're never going to get a more relevant outcome. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a timeless film that will always reflect who we are as a society. Yes. I almost put that on like a pedestal on its own. Correct. And then I put the other ones in a tier list. Yes. And I, th- I believe I've said this to you before, too. The original Planet of the Apes film is a classic in every way, shape, and form. A mm. genuine masterpiece and classic. Yes. The sequels are cult classics. Correct. That mentality I completely agree with. Yeah. And that's just another reason why I have a hard time putting them on the same, on the they're, same list. Well, they're also kind of a different sort of thing. Yeah. You know? They are. And I would say the only one that gets nearly as intelligent as that first one is conquest i was gonna say conquest because conquest subjectively mm. kind of like with you and beneath right conquest i almost subjectively like more than the original correct kind of the i movie. i can totally see that there's and it also it's relevant for our time and, and our it is funny how much how relevant it's become recently right now yeah yeah that's a movie that will generationally become more and less relevant yes. as time goes on yes because as a as a, a society our values and what we're going through changes as yeah, well. Right, exactly. It is interesting. Well, how would you rate these movies? I would include the original Planet of the Apes on the list, since this is Go Ape and so we're talking about all five. I have, I have two different ratings. Yeah. I've talked about how Beneath is my favorite sequel. Yes. I completely still feel that way. Yeah. It is, you can't beat that ending, man. Um, <laughs> Insane. If we're rating them on enjoyment, right, mm-hmm. we're going to go Apes, Beneath, Conquest, Escape, mm-hmm. Battle. If we're rating them on merit and just what is the objectively better made film and more thought out thing, mm-hmm. you have to go Apes, Conquest, Beneath, Escape, Battle. For me, mm-hmm. personally. Mm-hmm. I do think Conquest is so poignant and maybe like I'm just troubled by the direction that this country be. is going in. It and, could be. And, but Who knows? they're flipping. Because to me, to me, my, my order usually goes original, conquest, escape, beneath, mm-hmm. 
battle. Yes. And to me, escape and beneath constantly flip flop. Sure. Spot. And and that being said, just because escape is the second to last one doesn't mean I don't love escape. And I, we've got I was going to say it. you love escape. I love escape. Yeah. It's like conquest has an A minus, and escape has a B plus. Right. I would say beneath has a B plus for me, but that's because it is a B movie. Man. I fucking love and beneath. I love that about it. <laughs> I love beneath. And it depends on what mood. I was Absolutely. In. This most recent reviewing, that's what the order was, is the one that I just said. But had I not rewatched them and gone off of what I was thinking eight years ago, Escape and Beneath would have flipped. Sure. So it's always those two. That yeah, are constantly well, flipping be, for me. because they're both kind of the franchise in a state of flux in a way. Yeah, you know. Yeah, what are we going to do next, and what are we going to do for this? Um, and they're two totally different flavors. Totally different flavors that are movies. still logical continuations of what's yes. going on, which is so baffling if you think about it. The fact that they work, the fact together. that any of this held together yeah. past that first movie is it's incredible. Incredible, and I think a tremendous, a tremendous effort on the team of the writers. It's the whole thing is a testament to filmmaking being a collaboration yeah. and, and filmmaking and using what you have mm -hmm. and still trying to make something intelligent even when you're limited. It's inspiring. Absolutely. If you're a filmmaker and you watch these movies, I think it's an unbelievably inspiring tale of endurance. Even if you're not a filmmaker, if you're an artistic person in any sense of the word, yeah. the idea that you, you can finish the project, mm -hmm. you can make the thing, and it can still mean something. Right. You know, yeah. even, even with compromise, even with changes, it can still be really poignant and really important. I love these movies, Oliver. I fucking love these. Movies. I love them too. I love them too. <laughs> it has been a fucking treat rewatching these movies, revisiting these movies, getting to just talk about these movies. This was very cathartic for me. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Oliver, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's been a total blast. Why don't you pimp yourself out? Uh, All right. What, what you one, doing? One final time. Oliver the Ricketts, uh, you can find me. Uh, if you look up Oliver the Ricketts, I'll pop up. But you can also look up other productions and media right here on YouTube. We're doing a lot of cool stuff on there. We're talking about oddities. Um, we are, I just got adult baptized, even though I don't uh, believe in God. Um, <laughs> I'm crushing watermelons between my thighs. I'm doing a lot of social experiments um, in the form of 30-minute documentaries. Also rolling out a really cool trivia series there. You'll see it soon. You can also find me over on Designing Hollywood if you want to see me talking about movies and breaking down films. Um, I recently interviewed Marilyn Vance, the costume designer for Die Hard, in a movie about Die Hard, which was a really big thrill for me. And again, all of those two channels that he's named, they're in the description. The links are in the description below, so make sure you do go over there and subscribe. Uh, all my social media is also available in the description below, but this is my channel. I don't really need to pimp it out too much. So, uh, it's in the end, damn show. in the end, we've gone ape. We've gone ape, and we're never going back. We're never going back. Tainar, everybody. And then we explode. <laughs> <laughs> Countless billions of podcasts on YouTube. <laughs> Eliza Medium successful podcast.